Vice Chief. So it's locked off. Is that better? Yeah, okay. Right. I'll just repeat that. Just the, the short the short message is really: if you have any questions about the hearing process, please approach Ms. Um, O'Shea in, in the first instance. 
Um, what I'm going to do is, I'll first I'll introduce the panel and then I'll sort of run through um, procedure and protocols on how we're going to, to run the hearing. Um, before you are four independent commissioners. Um, to my left is Ms Sheena Tepany, Ms Gillian Ratt and Mr uh, Nigel Mark Brown and my name is Greg Hill and I'm going to be chairing the hearing. We've been appointed by the council um, as independent commissioners. We have no association with the council. Um, we are not the council, we're not part of the council. We're independent and our role is to hear the application, hear the submissions, hear the council officers and make a recommendation back to the council um, <clears throat> in due course once the hearing is finished and we've written our report. Can I just hand over to Ms Ratt just um, for now, just to make a, 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 a declaration. Push it down, yeah, push it down a little bit. Oh, we'll just get some technical assistance. Oh, you hold it down while you talk. Okay, cool. Yeah, let's see. Where's that? I'll hold it down. It's good. Kia ora koutou kata. Um, I'm Gillian Ratt, and as the local person on the hearings panel, I obviously do know a number of people around the room, both people in the applicants team and uh, people who are submitting. And I'd just like to make it clear that I have not discussed this um, plan change with anyone on any, um, with any views on any sides of this uh, plan hearing. Thanks, Greg. Thank you very much. <clears throat> as I said, our role as independent commissioners to hear this application and to make a recommendation back to the council. Um, the panel have done a site visit. We came down in April and spent most of the day on the site, so we're familiar with the surrounding area um, and the site. Um, obviously this is a private plan change, this is an applicant who is asking the council uh, to, uh, to approve their plan change and to amend the Nelson Resource Management Plan. Um, in that respect, and it was made clear for those of you who watched the procedural meeting at the beginning run by uh, Ms Oliver, is that the council's role to date has simply been to accept the plan change for processing. So right now, I just want to make it, the council per se does not have a view or a position on this plan change. That will come through in our recommendation. And in turn, we've got the council officers here, and I'll come to them in a minute, but I just want to make it clear that the views in the section 42A report that we've got, and that's just the section in the Act which allows council to prepare a report, the views expressed in that report are those of the professional um, experts. So we have Ms Sweetman here, I'll get her introduced in a minute. Um, the recommendations in that report are her recommendation to us, not the council's. So I think we just need to be clear on the sort of distinction between the roles. Right now, um, and it's, it's come through in, in some statements that Ms uh, Sweetman has not made an overall recommendation to us whether this plan change should be um, uh, accept, um, should be approved or rejected. Her position right now through the 42A report and there was an addendum to it is she is saying there, is, there was insufficient information. Through the process we will ask her whether that view is still the same or not. So just to make it clear that's her position. Um, I just want to run through, um, I know there's not a huge number of people here but I know this is on YouTube, just how these hearings run and procedures so that hopefully everyone feels comfortable with the process and understands it. Um, what happens is I'll do this introduction and cover those procedural issues, I'll then hand over to the applicant and the applicant has their legal counsel here, Mr Marson. Am I pronouncing your name correctly? Thank you. Um, and his team, um, they will get to present to us. All of the expert evidence has been circulated and is available to read, as well as rebuttal statements. There's a lot of material you would have, you would have seen. The panel can ask questions of the applicants, legal counsel and their witnesses. Submitters are not able to. Um, we may seek some clarification questions 
from to the council officers and ask them. Once the applicants have presented their case to us and, and the schedule is having them running over today, tomorrow, potentially uh, Thursday morning, and we'll just see how that, that runs, we then um, come to the submitters and exactly the same process applies where submitters will get to present to us. The panel can ask you questions. Um, the applicant cannot. There's no cross-examination. It's not like in a court situation. And again, we might seek some clarification from, from officers um, in relation to that. All of the expert evidence from the submitters has been filed. And again, I just want to generally thank everybody for um, essentially getting all the evidence and the legal submissions. Ms. Jeff is here, Mr. Marson, to getting those in. Um, we can't compel it, but we're really grateful that they've been um, provided ahead of time, um, as well as a number of the evidence and statement from submitters. So again, we're very grateful for that. We will hear from you and ask you questions. After that, we then we turn to the council officers. The council officers who have written that report have heard all of the evidence and uh, questions that we've been asked, and we'll ask them for their position and their view um, on the process. And at that point, we will, we will just take a pause and check in where we are, but the, the, the step after that is the applicant then has effectively a right to sum up or to reply to everything that's been presented in the hearing. They will have heard um, our questions to them, our questions to submitters, the submitters' concerns, councils, concerns, and they can do that re uh, reply. And again, when we get to that stage, we'll decide whether uh, Mr. Marson wants to do that verbally or in writing. Um, or a combination of both, and we'll just explore that um, towards the end of the process um, to see whether that where that gets us to. I'm just checking on covering off all the other things. My role as chair, again, just as part of the panel, is also to run the hearing really and to ensure efficiency and keeping to time. Um, as much as we can, and we will try and be as flexible as possible around timing. Um, uh, um, Ms O'Shea and the council have put out a, a schedule, um, which is online, and um, we may get some hard copies later on, and we'll attempt to keep to that as, as, as best as possible. Um, it's always a bit of an unknown exercise um, how long people will speak to you, but we generally ask submitters um, for 15 minutes um, or less, and again, I know there's been some contention about that, um, and again, we'll attempt to be flexible, um, but it was to fit everybody in who wanted to be heard within the time frame that we've got. Just before we go on any further, does anybody have any issues of clarification about the process, anything which is unclear or they'd like to understand a bit more about how we're gonna run the hearing? No, everyone sort of understands. Thank you for that. I will attempt to run the hearings informally as, impos as, as possible. I mean, as the hearing goes on, we might get sick of wearing our ties and we might, we might take those off and I'll invite anyone else who doesn't want to wear a tie, you don't have to wear a tie. Some people feel comfortable um, wearing them and some people don't. And I, I note the applicant team, some have and some haven't. So um, we, we might make it um, as informal as we go along the process. On that basis, we'll then get the hearing underway, unless there's anything else that the other commissioners need to cover off. Um, Mr. Mars and, and others, there are just a couple of procedural issues that we need to deal with first. Um, there were two late submissions um, that um, were filed, and I understand that they have not been formally dealt with. Um, they, and they were from um, Jesse O'Sullivan and Lindley Taylor. They were part of the, the, the pro forma type submissions, they were essentially a day or two late. The panel, we have no issue in accepting those, and I think we do, um, and I, I assume that's no issue for you, Mr. Marson. Um, so we'll ex formally accept those two late submissions on the basis that it hasn't held up the process. They were made available for further submissions, um, so we, we, there's, there's no sort of legal issue um, there. The other issue is we had filed um, some evidence from Mr. Bladen, um, uh, um, which Mr. Taylor was going to, to present, um, and Mr. Bladen wasn't. Mr. Bladen is an expert and has essentially provided a, a brief of evidence, expert, well, we think it's expert evidence in relation to noise issues. 
Um, we had asked that expert evidence in our direction was, was filed much earlier. Um, and I, so I think there are, there are two issues here, is that the evidence hasn't been provided at the right time. The applicant, um, other submitters and the council haven't had an opportunity to see it and respond to it. And also it's not going to be presented by Mr Bladen. So the position that, that we have taken into, is that we will not accept this um, brief of evidence. Um, Mr uh, Taylor, when he represent, he, he can simply refer to Mr Bladen's submission if he wishes and said he's concerned about noise, but we just won't be entering that into evidence. Mr Marston, no issue from you from that? No, thank you very much. Um, just the other issue I want to cover out, and Mr Marston might want to cover off, um, we understand that um, Mr Lyle, the planner, has provided us some hard copies of the documentation. I understand there's a set of, that was the notified version and then the latest version um, in the rebuttal. So thank you for that. We'll, we'll deal with that. Uh, no, it's not the latest version. It's oh. the, just two copies of the original notified version of the application and two sets of the applicant's evidence, including rebuttal evidence. Okay, that's fine, which reflects the late, that's the later position of the, I mean, what's in the evidence now and in the structure plan that you're proposing now is the latest position. I think that the council and Mr. Marson, I'm sure, will cover it. Again, I just want to make it clear to, to submitters and anybody watching, again, again, um, we feel, that, I know the council have fielded and half me, have asked me, there have been changes made to the notified version of the plan change and documentation. Um, I've responded to that and say that it, this is normal practice where the applicant attempts to address concerns raised by submitters, raised through expert conferencing and raised through the section 42A report. The critical issue for us is to ensure that the changes that are being requested are within scope of what was notified and generally that means something lesser and certainly not something more. Um, and I've, I've got a couple of questions of Mr. Marson on, on, on one particular issue in relation to scope, but the view that the panel has at this stage is the things like removing some of the zoning, certainly the, the rural, the higher intensity zoning, um, is certainly less development than um, was first to notify. And there are other changes which have been made, which you may all well be aware of about um, in some cases, more stricter planning controls around consent activity status, this, the vegetation overlay. There are a whole lot of other things which have been introduced which the applicants say um, address some of the concerns, and we will need to hear that and decide whether that's appropriate or not. Final comment for me is we will, in this hearing, be discussing the plan provisions which Mr Lyle has recommended to us. We need to do that because everything happens in this hearing. We don't have meetings behind the scene with any party about the provisions, so we need to be able to explore everything within the hearing. So if you hear us talking about um, the particular activity status or the particular zoning or the provisions that Mr Lyle has suggested, it is not, we're not saying that we have already made up our mind. We simply need to understand what, um, as Mr Marson refers to it, the plan machinery, i.e. will the provisions that they have recommended achieve what they say they will in terms of meeting the purpose of the Resource Management Act. So I just want to make that clear that we will be discussing those sorts of issues. Um, Mr Marston, at that I'll, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Kia ora koutou katoa um, and thank you for that introduction Mr Chair uh, and for that uh, mihi Commissioner Te Pania. Um, as you know, my name is John Marson, and uh, if you speak to Raya, you have no problem with that pronunciation. Uh, but English speakers sometimes do, so I thank the chairperson for checking that. Um, and um, I am the uh, representative, legal representative uh, for the applicant, and I have the pleasure to commence uh, presentation of this application. Uh, but before I do so, I'd just like to introduce our team. Um, so on my far left is Tony Milne, who is the landscape architect, um, and uh, he's going to be immediately after our um, applicant witnesses. Mr Lyle on my immediate left, who's the planner. Uh, on my right is Andrew Spittle, one of the uh, applicant representatives. Next to him is Richie Pollock, mm -hmm. and next to him is Hemi Toya. Mm -hmm. and Next to him is Ben Coman, 
and uh, finally Graham Virco. So that's the sort of applicant team. And um, I'll just now introduce uh, the witnesses that are here today. Um, first of all, Hugh Nicholson, who's on urban design. Uh, ben Robertson, terrestrial ecology. Gary Clark, transportation. Um, Neil Donaldson, who's a project manager, he hasn't given a brief. Uh, Morris Mills from Tonkin Taylor on stormwater and sensitive water design. Uh, Michael Parsonson on erosion and sediment control. Rob Greenaway, uh, recreation. Uh, Mark Foley, geotech. Um, behind them are Farnell of uh, Ngati Kawata, who I won't introduce individually. Um, and uh, that's actually quite a rather good lineup given the weather and uh, the sicknesses <laughs> around, but we have two people uh, who have uh, either sickness or family sickness who will come in by Zoom. That's Josh Markham, Freshwater Ecology, and Damien Villepulai, who is uh, Tonkin Taylor, uh, on flooding. So those two will be ported in. Right. Mr. So, Marsden, can I, sorry, can I just stop you? One thing I forgot to do was ask the council team to introduce themselves so, oh, and while okay. I was got caught up in, in uh, my kōrero. So um, if right. I just thought, I can, can I just ask the council team here to introduce themselves so that everyone knows who they are? Uh, kia ora koutou. Uh, my name is Maxine Day. I'm the Environmental Planning Manager at Nelson City Council. I'm responsible for uh, maintaining and developing the Nelson Resource Management Plan. Thank you. Morena Tato, my name's Gina Sweetman and I'm the reporting officer. Uh, kia ora koutou, my name is Greg Mason, I'm a planning consultant and I've been working with Gina on the Section 42A report. Kate Purton, um, Stormwater and Flood Risk. No. Thank you very much. Just before I hand back to Mr. Marson, um, I just acknowledge Ms. Jeb um, is here as well. Do you want to introduce yourself? Do you want me to introduce you? You can shout. <laughs> Thank you. And save the Mai Tai have essentially the day on Monday. Thank you. Um, Thank, you. Thank you, Mr. Marson. Thank you. Oh, I've got more team. Sorry. Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else before I hand back to no, Thank you very much, Mr. Marson. Thank you. Um, in a moment, I'll just ask the administrator to collect some documents that I want to take you through as part of my opening, uh, because I've decided you don't have enough documentation yet. <laughs> um, and so I'll do that at the appropriate time. I just wanted to check that. Um, you picked up the supplementary rebuttal from Mark Foley on the groundwater topic. Yes. And that you have the statements of Andrew Spittle and Hemi Toya. Yes. Um, for the representative. And um, Mark has mentioned that you have uh, copies of the application. Yes. Um, I mentioned in my legal submissions that I was intending to provide an electronic bundle. Um, I was actually in an environment court last week in New Plymouth on a difficult matter. Um, and that actually didn't get to you. Um, but um, uh, I have it available on, on the stick if you want it. That's how we organised it. You might find it useful, but I suspect what you've done is receive the material and organise it the way you'd like to do. Um, but it's there and available to you if you, you want it. You. Um, I just now want to um, uh, hand up some materials and uh, I'll just get the administrator to collect those and then I'll get you to mark them, and the way I'd like you to mark them is hand up X, hand up Y, hand up Z, okay, right. rather than use the term exhibit, which sounds terribly formal, I'll just call it the hand up, and the reason for that is that I am going to take you through these hand ups um, during the course of my opening. Thank you. Just while they've been handed up, are you okay or happy for us to ask you questions as we go through at each section, or do you prefer to present your legal submissions and then go to questions? Oh, I'm in your hands, okay, so I'm, I'm right. relaxed. I think we'll probably ask questions as we go because there are some clear different sections which there are some issues yeah. that we'd like yeah. to discuss. That's fine. And I'll, I'll tell you where I am in my legal submission. So 
I'm not going to read those out because the point of providing them was to, to uh, get you orientated as to the basic legal framework. But what I'm going to do is, is go through sections and highlight particular points and so forth. Um, so if we just wait while you get those distributed. And All right. Um, I think you now have everything. So if I could just give you the numbering. So the, the text of the uh, version three is called handout one. The graphics bundle, which is this, is handout two. Um, some annotated pages of that graphics bundle, uh, which I've made because I'm going to speak to them is hand up three, because it's going to be really hard otherwise without some annotations to explain what I'm talking about. Um, uh, no, it's um, <coughs> some, some plans from this that have got handwritten annotations on them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's three. Um, then some highlighted plan provisions from the administration section of the plan which is hand up four. Um, an extract from the planning maps with scheduling noted, which is hand up five. 
Just, I'm not sure we've got that one. Okay. Um, it should look like planning map 34. Uh, and this is all part of trying to explain how the plan NRMP works. Um, so if you haven't got that, we'll get another set. Um, but uh, Ms. Administrator, it's a, it's a map that looks like this. If you Keep going. It'll, it, come, it'll come to us as in due course. It we'll, might be that one there. We don't. Is it that one? We don't seem Sorry. to have a copy of that, Mr. Marsh. Okay. okay. Um, and then a supplementary statement from Mr. Spittle, um, which I'll deal with in submissions, and a statement uh, from Rod Dixon, which is hand up seven. Um, so I'm going to walk you through those uh, hand ups in due course. Uh, I've filed with the Council three pieces of work. The first was a, a re analysis of information requirements that came in with the 42B reports and legal submissions yeah. and then some supplementary legal submissions that I'm primarily going to focus this morning on uh, my 71 page opus um, and uh, um, just go through the sections. Um, I just note in my submissions uh, at page six, uh, a feature that I have noted about this plan change, uh, which is the extent of the iwi engagement uh, and mana whenua engagement that has incurred in the development of this private plan change. I often get asked at the last minute to appear on plan changes where a lot of that hasn't happened and a lot of that legwork um, has um, um, being done, uh, and Mr. Lyle has some associations with Iwi, so I think that he understands the importance of that. Um, and you'll also note that Te Atiawa has provided a letter mm -hmm. um, through um, um, Jamie Tuta, uh, who seems to be everywhere because he was at my other hearing last week, <laughs> which shows you the connections mm -hmm. of that Iwi um, through to Taranaki. Um, so uh, you've got that, and at paragraph 61, um, I tried to produce a synoptic statement of the part two credentials yeah. of this plan change, because it's quite a, a, a discipline that I apply to myself to evaluate plan changes, and I just wish to make one correction. In the last section, which talks about uh, the uh, way in which the provisions have been calibra calibrated and accounting for uh, tangata whenua considerations, I've omitted to put section 6E, which uh, is actually engaged very strongly uh, in this plan change application. Um, so uh, if I can then turn um, to uh, hand up Three, which relates to section four of my submissions, which is about how the plan change, how the NRMP works. And the reason I'm doing this, and I apologise if I'm telling you to suck eggs, but uh, there, there has been a lot of confusion through the conferencing process and so forth about exactly how this plan works. And it is an old plan, mm -hmm. uh, as I've explained in my submissions, uh, but it is important to understand how it's developed and how it works. So what I've handed up and uh, um, let me just check the hand up numbers is, is um, your hand up for the how the plan works. Yeah. So um, A B in this means about. Mm, that's about, the uh. that's what the section's about, and it tells you the first thing you do is check the planning maps and. Where a site is scheduled, it shows that it is a scheduled mm -hmm. site. And then it says, identify what zone and note the overlays and schedules and designations. And at Roman numeral four, it says, the schedule and rules applying to any overlays shown on the planning maps affecting your property are included 
in the rules in the zone chapters. So most of the schedules, because they relate to new areas of residential development, are scheduled in the residential zone. Um, and then it says, if there are any schedules, check the rule table in each zone, because that is the first place you look. And so mm -hmm. it's how, how it works together is, is explained in this about section. And then in page 3-27 at AD 11.4, um, it describes scheduled sites. Um, now, uh, they go from your standard out of zone mm -hmm. spot, spot site scheduling right through to the Marsden Valley type scheduling, mm -hmm. which is more in the precinctual type configuration. And that explains it. And AD 11.4 Roman numeral 3 mm -hmm. says, the rules that apply to the activity inside are stated in the relevant schedule. The schedules are located after the relevant zone. So I've explained that. And then you will note from my submissions yeah, yeah. that I go in to explain structure plans mm -hmm. as a specific method uh, to, to support scheduling. I'm not going to go through that. So when you get um, hand up five, you'll see an example from map 34 of how oh, yeah. the maps <coughs> okay. actually show the schedule. And so a lot of people through this process have said, how does this work? Um, and that's the sort of mechanism. And so I've explained in my submissions that Mr Lyle, who's very familiar with the NRMP, um, has modelled itself on the Marsden Valley as a more, mm -hmm. an example of, a, of an area of much more scope than just a simple uh, cadastral boundary site. Um, and how it was managed. But this is at a level of sophistication that is completely mm -hmm. beyond any other schedule in the plan. And the reason for that is A, its complexity, uh, and B, because um, <coughs> things have moved on mm -hmm. since this plan was notified and um, planning uh, has developed quite significantly. So um, uh, volume two uh, contains the residential zone and this schedule uh, will be at the end of that uh, mm -hmm. volume. <coughs> and the overlays uh, trigger, uh, speci I, I want to talk a little bit about other overlays. So um, there's a flooding overlay, there's a service overlay, mm -hmm. and there's a landscape overlay are some examples. And all of them trigger specific rules mm -hmm. across zones. What I want to do uh, shortly is explain to you how the landscape overlay works because uh, that has developed over time, that the thinking of the council has developed over time. But in terms of the service overlays and the uh, flood overlays, again, this is a point where some people have misunderstood the fact that Mr Lyle has assumed that the overlays will trigger the consenting pathways and he's supplemented that <coughs> by assessment criteria information requirements. He hasn't tried to recreate mm -hmm. the rule stream from which those overlays trigger. So that's um, important to understand. Um, now, in terms of the landscape overlay, overlay that runs across various sections yeah. of the site. And if I just um, ref uh, give you a reference, Um, if I give you a reference for, for later, you'll see um, the basic divisions of the landscape units yes. um, at page 29 of the Rough and Moan. I think that's quite a delightful name for a landscape <laughs> architect. Um, Which bit, the rough or the moan, or the both? Rough <laughs> Uh, rough and ready, but um, the which it's not, and and this is in this volume oh, yes. here, uh, at page twenty nine, and you have the landscape units. Yeah, they are on the bound versions on the floor that you have. I'm not asking you to pick them up, but you'll see the basic landscape units: are Karka Hill, uh, Karka Valley. So that's not the graphics 
unit. This yeah, is yeah. this big yeah. bundle exactly. that has yeah. the application. So the units are Melvin Hills, Botanical Hill, Karka Valley, and Karka Hill. And now the, the unit, uh, landscape unit divisions. Um, and strangely enough, mostly these overlays where they exist in the plan trigger rules across zones. Mm -hmm. So the zones aren't the principal method to deliver the landscape outcomes. Um, and I'll come to that because there's some significance about that. Um, now, that landscape overlay was done in 19... That landscape mm -hmm. analysis was done in 1997. It was a sort of Ministry mm -hmm. of the Works uh, landscape overlay. And it probably was done in the old way with mm -hmm. the overlay being the transparency Indeed. across the maps and then just very broad lines. And um, you'll be aware that Boffer Miskell has been commissioned to do a much more mm. uh, finely grained and sophisticated landscape analysis for the purpose of a future plan. And those planning analyses, sorry, those landscape analyses, mm. natural character and landscape analyses, have actually been adopted by the council. Mm -hmm. So their stream of work is 2014 to 2016. Mm. Um, and they did a 2014 natural character study and they did a landscape study between 2015 and 2016 which includes an absorption capacity and opportunities and constraints analysis. And in that work they used, I think it's called an ECTV methodology which is you're basically taking pictures at 50 metre mm -hmm. intervals to assess visibility because the critical thing about the NRMP is that it identifies the backdrops, the, the lines and the ridge lines and all of those as critical components of the sense of identity of Nelson. Um, and uh, that work has informed Tony Milne's work in terms of the development of the plan change, mm -hmm. which I'll explain. So um, Boffer Miskell contemplated that that landscape analysis would be implemented mm -hmm. by structure plans and plan provisions, and that's exactly how mm -hmm. we've, we've done that. Um, now, uh, there are very few outstanding landscapes, as I understand it, natural features, but an obvious one in this region is Boulder Bank, uh, which is a distinctive uh, natural feature on the coastline. Um, and um, Boffer Miskell identified that there was a bit of a gap in the Nelson uh, in part two where there were significant amenity landscapes that should be recognised um, and the Mai Tai River corridor was but not the Kaka Valley um, and, and the other components of the site. So as I say, um, Ruff and Milne built on this and now I just want to, um, because uh, S Save the Mai Tai, who I'll call STM, uh, the principal organised opponent of this plan change, I, I, and, and a significant amount of their opposition le le leverages off Miss Stevens' analysis, mm -hmm. um, I do want to dwell a little bit on the landscape point, but um, I'm re now referring to the plan uh, NRMP and you probably don't have it, but I want mm. to give you a reference. Okay. Um, the reference, first of all, is Appendix 9, mm -hmm. which contains uh, the landscape components and views mm -hmm. uh, appendix. Um, and uh, it identifies uh, the Botanical and Melvin Hills under AP 9.6 and Karka Hill, AP 9.7, but not the Karka Valley. And the interesting thing about those provisions uh, is that they identify for the Melvin and Botanical Hills at AP capitals 9.6 Roman numeral 5, this statement, because of their high visibility sloping facing the city centre, upper slopes facing inland and facing the sea, and also the ridges are most vulnerable to change. 
the forms and colours associated with development and the pattern and texture changes from changes in vegetation are most likely to alter the character and quality of this area. Um, so a similar statement mm. is made for Karka Hill, and those statements don't suggest and don't, the plan does not provide for no development. It is around patterns and textures. And so Tony Milne's evidence is going to be really critical to give you a sense of how the mm. provisions work uh, to respond to those matters. But another key component of that statement uh, is high visibility, um, particularly slopes facing the city centre. So in the Boffa Miskal mm. study, uh, they're looking at these main arteries like the State Highway or the city centre and saying what gives us the major, in the major areas of population and so forth, the highest visibility and sense of mm. place. And so I'm staying at the Quest Hotel, I'm on the fifth floor, and you look out and immediately see Botanical Hill, and that mm. is a critical ridgeline uh, which has been managed very carefully in this no. plan change. And then you go around State Highway 6 and so forth, and you have the Melbourne Hills and, and Botanical Hill, and then, of course, Karka Hill. My point is, when I come to Ms Stevens' evidence, she's created this notion of a gateway concept, uh, which I'll show you doesn't stand up in terms of spatial terms, uh, but it has no pedigree uh, in terms of the current plan provisions. Mm. And so I just uh, refer that to your attention. And the only other thing I wanted to say is, in the residential zone, there is um, a policy called RE 3.2, entitled View Shafts and Gateways. Mm -hmm. um, and this is very much about preserving windows from populated places to look out and identify features. It's not at all the way in which Ms Stevens has characterised a gateway landscape. Um, and the plan contemplates um, those being quite discreet because it talks about taking them as reserve contribution mm -hmm. or um, defining key views and planning maps in Appendix 9. So um, uh, quite a discreet concept and the reason I mention that is I do discuss at length in my submissions the gateway concept in the NRPS and how that has landed in terms of the NRMP is actually a quite a minor uh, treatment. Mm. So Mr Martin, just on that, I think that is an issue that we'll need to pick up with your witnesses, because again, I don't know if you've had an opportunity to read Ms Jepp's legal submissions, no, which, ca which, which came in, um, and, and thank her for that, because as, you, as you've quite rightly pointed, Ms Stevens makes quite a lot of this idea of, of the gateway, and Ms Jepp's legal submission clearly um, says that's an important and significant component, as well as this whole idea of, and I, I know there's a dif disagreement between Mr Mill and Mr Gerber and then Ms Stevens about the significance of the Kaka Valley as yes. opposed to the to the, the stream. And, and, and I think Ms Jepp kind of um, sets that out also in her legal submission. So I think we understand very clearly where the major issues and contention are from that landscape policy context. Thank you. Um, so, yes, I haven't had a chance to, to read that, and I, I will take the opportunity, but I uh, did work that out that that was a significant um, yes, yeah. plank of the analysis because of Ms Stevens' evidence. Uh, Ms Stevens' evidence. Um, so, in terms of the site and spatial elements, uh, uh, you know that it's 287 hectares approximately, and its frontage uh, to the Maitai River is about 275 mm -hmm. metres. Um, of a river system which is about 16 kilometres mm -hmm. long. Um, and I should mention the Karka stream probably could be characterised as ephemeral uh, in the sense that it does actually run dry in some summer months, mm -hmm. um, but is extremely low flow and may actually not directly discharge into the Mai Tai in summer but penetrate through the river gravels. Um, which assumes some significance uh, in my submission about the freshwater issue and how much during the, the low flow periods actually there will be flow if you maintain hydrological neutrality uh, in terms of the development. So those are some just key highlights. Um, now I've talked about my um, uh, 
the key components of the plan change in section five of my submissions. What I'd like to do now is to just walk you through um, um, the, the graphics volume. Um, I'll just try and lay my hands on that. No, it's not that one. Um, okay. So that's hand up uh, two. Um, and what I did was I put a table uh, in my submissions in section no. five, which identified the changes. Um, but I just wanted to land, land those in terms of this graphical bundle. So, uh, and you probably should also have up um, hand, the hand up with the annotations because I don't want to lean over your shoulder while I explain those. Um, so I'm looking at uh, the annotation to the proposed structure plan, which is page six of the hand up two also. And I want to land that, the, the changes in the table in a spatial sense. Mm -hmm. So um, the first thing is you'll see um, the small holdings number one. Mm -hmm. that, that describes quite a steep area in the Kaka Valley that was originally identified as small holdings. Um, I asked Mark why he thought that. He said, well, we didn't, think, didn't know what to do with it. <laughs> but anyway, it's gone back into rural. Cool, right. But it may have triggered a lot of the response in the first line of Section 42A reports about the sufficiency of information. And so that's gone into rural. Uh, similarly, um, the vegetated area identified as small holdings too mm -hmm. has gone back into rural. rural. Um, and an area which was uh, residential, which I've put residential three, uh, has also gone back into to rural. So these are very significant notionally reductions in the scale and intensity of development. Uh, but I say notionally because they actually weren't seriously contemplated as part of the development uh, concept. Mm -hmm. So um, those have gone um, and a small area, triangular area um, near Walters Bluff has been sold so I've right. just simply indicated that and um, you'll note that the realignment of the stream is downstream of the proposed road mm -hmm. and that's indicated in this diagram by uh, the dotted line, the blue dotted line, whereas um, north of that, above, upstream, you'll see the Karka stream is all one single line. Mm -hmm. So um, I just wanted to indicate those uh, things to you. Um, the next thing is um, the page seven of the... So Mr Marson, just we've got a question. Just. Can I just clarify, in what you've now said is the rural zone, yeah. that now has a re-vegetation overlay on it, is that Yes, correct? I'm going to come to that, yes. Okay, thanks. Yep. So, um, the next one is the structure plan at page seven, and um, the, is that pink? Purple. purple. The purple square, square which purple. is in the centre by the road, um, is the suburban commercial zone. Um, and actually, Mr. McIndoe and Mr. Nicholson agree that that should be at the crossroads. No, right. So um, we're going to, we've still got to update that, but okay. we don't want to do too many iterations um, no. immediately. So that, but that's intended, so that that is there. And we saw some of those diagrams earlier in, in, in our, with that commercial area on both sides of that road. And yeah. yeah. Okay, so now coming. Uh, to um, the overlays, um, <coughs> Commissioner Rat, um, we have on page eight, um, a couple of things that I wanted to mention. Um, 
it, it, sorry, this is the landscape overlays, the vegetation I'll come to. The, the botanical landscape is indicated uh, by an area, um, I'm not sure how to show this, but it's, it's in this section here. Yeah, yeah. And Mr. Gervin and Mr. Milne, um, this is where Walter's Bluff is, um, have agreed that this should attract an RD status, a restricted mm -hmm. discretionary status. And that rule is um, X.5, page 18 of handout one. So that was the one area of disagreement between, I think, the major area of disagreement, and that sort of moved to uh, using what I call the plan, plan machinery to sensor to get, to get the right mm -hmm. settings for the uh, visual issues there. Um, and then um, through this plan, you see that the the hatching, which runs sort of diagonally along the Melbourne Hills <coughs> and further, is the skyline. And then the backdrop is the dotted area. And those trigger the rules in X5. And so the idea is, to, if, if you can get below the skyline, mm, yeah. you're controlled as to the style and, and so forth and the vegetation with the idea that you run that 20% standard. Uh, but if you're above the skyline, you drop into a different activity class. Um, and in terms of that critical landscape, which is the uh, botanical hills, that's going into open space. But I should mention that there is no specific revegetation rule that triggers the requirement for the developer to revegetate okay. that area. That's intended to be vested in the council, uh, and then they'll decide how to administer that best. But that critical ridgeline um, is protected. Um, and finally, uh, below Karka Hill, you have mapped uh, both the skyline and the backdrop area. Now, that's subject to um, a rural 15 hectare minimum. Um, <clears throat> and you may have picked up that that land has been gifted to Ngāti Kawata. Uh, and we have not proposed uh, a level of protection that would preclude structures of any type in that location because our understanding is that Ngāti Kawata may uh, want to have some structures uh, uh, for cultural purposes, and I think it's appropriate mm -hmm. that um, they have the opportunity to do so through a consent pathway. Uh, and part of that may be um, to assist uh, Mokopuno in terms of experientially and all of those sorts of things. Uh, we haven't discussed in detail the cultural practices, but we do have an X6 rule uh, which talks about structures. So it isn't a complete protection paradigm and that is not what we understand Nati Kawata asked for. Can I, at this point, I need to raise a legal issue with you yeah. in relation to that. And I understand that, that that land is to be gifted or has been gifted back to Nati Kawata, and we have no difficulty with that. It's not, it's not an issue for us. But um, to say that, as the plan was notified, mm. the plan change was notified, buildings within that area, the backdrop and the skyline, were prohibited. Mm -hmm. And I note through the expert, the joint witness statement um, of the planners, there is, is only a couple of paragraphs and it implies that there was not a policy, objective policy base for the prohibition. And then somehow it suddenly jumped to non-complying and then a policy base was applied. Mm -hmm. The question I have for you in terms of the scope, yes. do we have scope? to change the activity status from something much more restrictive, i.e. prohibited, to non-complying. I couldn't find any submissions asking for it, so I, I'm, I'm raising the issue that I don't think there is scope, but I'll leave that with you if you okay. and talk to Mr Lyle to come back to yep. us with. I, I, think, I think I'll deal with it um, uh, after thinking about that. Um, yeah, thank you. 
But I understand the status quo, which is what some submitters seek, actually doesn't have a prohibition. Well, and I mean, that's where the legal issue comes in, because yeah. again, just, I mean, again, I'll just round that out, because when, when I first looked at the plan change, and I looked at the very directive provisions about landscape and protecting the backdrop in the regional policy statement, yeah. which it says avoid these things, and yeah. it was very clear, and to me, the prohibited activity, I could see how that fitted, and hence I'm just raising the question now whether sure. the, prohib the, the non-complying firstly is within scope and then yeah. whether it's appropriate. Yeah, my, my view is it is, but I, I, I'll, yeah. need to, I'll need to formulate it. Thank um, you. And Ms Jepsy, I mean, she might want to think about that from... Yeah. Mm. So um, turning to um, the vegetation overlay plan, which is page nine uh, of the graphics bundle, um, you've got... Uh, As uh, Commissioner Rat pointed out, um, that area that's now rural, in combination with the area that is residential, so in the legend you'll see um, a darker dotted area called residential green overlay, and then a lighter dotted area called revegetation overlay in the rural zone. Those are now um, subject to provisions that direct mm. in the, through development the revegetation of those areas through the mechanism of a management plan, and that's Rule X16. Mm. So those have now been picked up uh, to to improve those areas. And when you do a second site visit, you may remember this: these faces have largely been in production uh, and relatively mm. unvegetated. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you've got the um, corridor, which triggers is in green, and it, that tri is, triggers the Esplanade rule, uh, which is X7, which is a minimum of 40 metres mm -hmm. um, through that corridor. But uh, as you get to the Mai Tai, it's a lot wider than that. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and then you've got the open space. So that's how that works. Um, and... Uh, I just wanted to pick up a couple of things. Um, on plan 12 is the uh, conceptual Dennis Hole interface plan. And I just signal it now because when I return to talk about Ms. Stephen report, uh, Stephen's report about the visibility from the cricket ground, mm -hmm. um, uh, there will be uh, quite a, there is a lot of vegetation now, and there will be a lot more vegetation, uh, and that comes to the to the visibility of development concept. Um, I think that's all I wanted mm -hmm. to uh, address you at this point. I, I might do this just now while you've got it open, uh, and return to it. Um, so, Plan 19. Um, has some viewing points that were used by Tony Milne for his extensive analysis. Mm. And I just want to indicate that um, my understanding is that Ms. Stevens' viewing points, uh, one is above, just above 3A, one's between 3B and 3C, One's about a meet, uh, centimetre north of one, mm -hmm. and the other one is Charland Hill, which is actually the feature about south east of one by about three centimetres. You can mm -hmm. see a conical shaped mm -hmm. hill. And the point about that is um, Mr. Gervin and Mr. Milne are uh, talking about significance in terms of visibility from major elements of the mm. city. Uh, and Miss Stephen has taken quite mm. elevated positions in those locations to assess her significance analysis, mm. and I'll come to that in due course. So that's just to orientate you, you in terms of the plans. Um, I, in my legal submissions, have uh, addressed higher order policy and those are dealt with in um, sections, I 
think. Sections uh, 7, 8 and 9 and um, we've had this decision of Judge Newhook on Eden Epsom which I've addressed you on and I've read um, uh, some submissions by my friend uh, Douglas Allen <laughs> Uh, on other changes in Auckland, uh, so I do acknowledge um, reading his work to penetrate what was a relatively short decision by Judge Newhook. Um, I understand that there may be further amendments to the MPSUD that I have not picked up. Um, can we just? You, can I just cut in here now? Because Miss Jeeps covered this in her legal submissions, and, and it was a point that I hadn't quite realised. And I might ask you the question: Where um, I'm wondering whether. In terms, Ms. Jeff, in terms of the Eden Ebsen, are you you're not pursuing that as an argument now, given the change to the definition of planning decision? I'm just wondering where you can put all this aside now, or are you still running the argument that 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 the Eden Ebsen decision in your submission, our consideration is limited to those things which are planning decisions? As I said, now that planning decisions include private plan changes. Not sure if I'm saying yes or no. Right. Question. Right. So, so are you are you running that Eden Ebbs? No, you're not running. Right. Right. And so the effect of that is that um, there is no question that the MPSUD now applies to um, to private plan changes. There's obviously still issues as to weight and so on, but, right. but there's no, no question that it now applies. Right. Thank okay. You. All right, well, I won't deal with that. But, no, um, and I just, want, I just want to thank Mr. Jeff there because <laughs> I hadn't picked up that either. I mean, there were clearly changes that have been made to the policy three from memory, but because through that Housing Supply Act, changes were made which were not notified and which Ms. Jeff's picked up, I hadn't. Um, so it's clear the definition has changed. Yes, yeah. and I, I picked that up. Uh, oh. Uh, oh, well done. Not, I not didn't. from reading Ms. Jeff's submissions, <laughs> no. but uh, um, through other. Uh, Research right. from, or avenues, and um, um, but you know it's a fast-changing game in this place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, that, that's how it goes. Um, and um, I, I deal with uh, the national policy for freshwater management um, somewhat diffidently um, because of its complexity. But um, I, I, I've. I really want to talk to you a little bit about policy 3.24 because that bites in terms of the modifications to the um, Kaka stream. Um, and it's just to update you with where I think the law is on the avoidance direction. Um, so I've had to penetrate that issue quite deeply through a case I was involved in the Supreme Court called Port Otago. Um, and what, I've, um, uh, what I'm saying to you now I'll do it in two tranches. I'll say what the argument I put was, and secondly, where I think the law sits, mm -hmm. irrespective of whether that argument succeeds or not. Mm -hmm. um, the argument I put uh, is that these policy directions um, carry significant constraining force, but the intent of the Act is through the instruments of the RPS and the mm -hmm. regional right. plans refinements as to where um, strict avoidance as opposed to a slightly more relaxed approach apply um, still needs to be worked out so that there is a legitimate circle of choice, is how I put it, uh, that would not offend the implementation obligation in particular areas. And, and I guess what uh, my client was resisting strongly in the context of an argument about a ports policy is the idea that you read the in, uh, national yeah. policy as regulation. Um, I don't yeah, think the yeah. document is ever intended to operate that way. Mm -hmm. um, and the argument is that that's the view that's best fits with the judgment of King Salmon. So we were not seeking to overturn King Salmon. We were seeking to say that the regulatory interpretation the absolutist approach was not correct. Mm -hmm. 
Um, irrespective of those arguments, which the court will deal with, and it'll be very interesting to see where they get to, mm. um, and I have some confidence that they'll regard the port's policy as equally directive as the avoidance policy. Um, there are pas there are, there's a passage in the judgment of Justice Arnold that says that avoid does not, that the implication is avoid does not mean do not touch. It means that the outcome can be better and you can still achieve the avoidance policy. Um, so um, if you modify something but the overall outcome is beneficial uh, in terms of the values that are being preserved, then you're not offending the avoidance policy. Right. This is another Supreme Court decision, isn't it? Is that that's the King Port Otago? Salmon. Oh, that's King Salmon. Yes. I thought you were referring to the Port Otago one, which is in this avoid, because avoid in King Salmon was, it, was absolute, wasn't it? Avoid, no. don't do. No, you, so, you, so no. In, and I think it's paragraph 143 of the judgment. Um, I'll need to just check that reference, but it's in my submissions. Justice mm. Arnold says that if you actually enhance, but deal with the resource, Wars. that is that right, is okay. that meets the policy, and the significance that sort of makes common sense because the underlying objective of these instruments is not to sustain degraded environments; it's to enhance them, mm -hmm. if possible. Um, and so you'll be aware that all of the experts agree that the solutions that are contemplated for this section of Kaka Valley are positive. And you've simply got a planning legal invitation to say, well, it's a very strict direction. Mm -hmm. uh, avoid means avoid. Mm -hmm. And that is, in my submission, not true on King Salmon. I suspect it'll be even less true after Port Otago, but I'm not so presumptuous as to <laughs> predict the decision. Um, I think Ms. Jepps says in her submission she thinks you might be. Anyway, <laughs> you'll, you'll, you'll get there when you read it. Yeah, oh, but um, I'm not going to do that. So, mm -hmm. uh, um, but there we are. Um, she is right to this extent. My predictions at the High Court and the Court of Appeal were completely wrong, um, and we failed. Um, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. But I'm relying on King Salmon. Uh, but I also took comfort in the Port Otago decision uh, argument from very high authority in the House of Lords, or now the Supreme Court in England, where national policy was applied. And in one case that I've cited to you, there was a very strong national policy direction around heritage. And in the judgment, the Supreme Court actually said, if the actual project touches the heritage, changes it, but either of all enhances it, that is consistent with the, overall, the underlying direction, the purpose of the direction. And so what I resist very strongly uh, is reading policy as black letter law as opposed to the underlying purpose for which the policy mm -hmm. is designed. Because um, I think that better respects the structure of part five uh, and and so forth. So that's, that's I say what I'm submitting to you is the current law. Um, uh, and and Ms. Jepp's right, I'm making uh, some offhand mm -hmm. predictions about that, but you don't need to give that okay. anyway. Mr. Martin, just on that issue, just to, to bring it down there, so in terms of the, the potential realignment of the Kaka stream, mm. The structure plan which is proposed clearly shows that realignment and it shows the riparian and the green open space around it. Yeah. But going back to your earlier discussion about how the plan works, as I understand it, to realign the stream currently in the um, Nelson Resource Management Plan is at least a discretionary activity. Um, so if this plan change were approved and it comes to an application, I just, let's, say, let's say it's discretionary, a discretionary application would still need to be brought within terms of the operative provisions and the additional provisions which are proposed in the structure plan or, or, or the schedule. That's how, and, and 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 hence, some of the experts talk about, you know, you could get the values by it being in situ, and you could get these other values Correct. by it being moved. So I just want to be clear. So your client is taking the punt, I'll say, um, that this is. 
where it's preferred. This will enable more efficient urban development if it is moved and there are some advantages, particularly the urban designers tell us advantages, the ecologists say there are some advantages. But it's at your, it's your view that that is appropriate, but it still needs that discretionary consent. And so the question I've got for you really is, is it your argument or your case to us that um, your, we should prefer your witnesses in the sense that the, some of the objectives and policies clearly talk about the encouragement or the, the benefits of that move as opposed to just talking about restore and um, protect and restore. Does that make sense to you? I'm not sure I got a handle on that question well, exactly. I well, I, let, I, mean, I just ask it directly, is should, if, if we agree with your witnesses, mm. Therefore, is the objective and policy framework in the schedule the appropriate one because it implies it's appropriate to move it subject to getting a resource consent? Yes. As opposed to being more neutral and just talking about what you said before about protect, enhance, restore, and then in an application it might be bought, what is the most appropriate location? Our view is that the um, provisions are the most appropriate provisions, and they would work the way you describe. Okay, right. But a more clear. neutral approach wouldn't wouldn't uh, be the end of the world. Um, so if you didn't think it was needed to be as heavily encouraged, then that that would be another approach. Um, uh, we're comfortable <coughs> that um, based. So uh, one of the examples that was cited in the materials is Groom Creek, mm -hmm. which is a council initiated, it, and you see the level of information and the nature of those enhancements, they can be very positive. And I take a much more optimistic view about uh, human <coughs> interventions in these types of situations to get a better outcome than one that simply says the natural, and of course this is highly modified anyway, mm -hmm. um, the natural uh, is the best. So an answer to your question is um, we, we want to continue a policy framework that reflects NPSFM and enhances the freshwater body, whether that means we can get every piece of the alignment successfully over the line in a resource consent is something we are taking okay. the risk on. Right. Thank you. That's clear. And again, partly the reason for asking the question is because I know just from reading some of the submissions and comments that have come through is that we are to determine whether the, the, the stream gets shifted. And I'm really just making it clear we are addressing this in sort of Section 32 terms, which you make, um, you know, you cover off. And we're not dealing with a resource consent here to move the stream. That's correct. Um, now, um, so that section about policy 3.24 in the case law I referred to is 112. Um, and I also deal with my submissions with the NRPS um, at section um, section 9, yes. And uh, I don't want to go through that. It's a fairly dated instrument. It's kind of interesting um, because it's a sort of... Um, Simon Upton piece, you know, it's got the private property rights and the things and then this, so it's kind of interesting as an historical blast from the past, um, but uh, it doesn't really in my submission support um, in any way. You couldn't read that instrument as providing a protection paradigm for the resources that we're dealing with here, and it's never been applied in that way. Um, I also deal in section 10 with the Nelson Tasman Future Development Strategy uh, and um, we've had some supplementary submissions on that. Ms Anderson and I are, uh, have a common view that the strategy is the strategy um, and the Ombudsman was, I thought, pretty clear about that. Um, STM has from time to time made noises about <laughs> judicially reviewing that, but that never came to anything. <laughs> and um, I say that's the policy. Uh, and the new one is interesting in the sense that it's in gestation. I'm not putting great weight on it, but it, it's interesting it continues the, the theme that there has to be a mix of greenfield and, um, and intensification. And on that, um, uh, there's evidence from various people in submissions, and, and Mr Harley 
who I mentioned in my submissions right. waxes lyrical on this, but um, we do have skepti we are sceptical about how much intensification is going to get runs on the yeah, board yeah. for this market. Um, it's a provincial market. We know what provincial preferences are, um, and a lot of people, um, a lot of aggregation would have to occur uh, to get anywhere near the sort of numbers. And you may have picked up that um, Nelson has been quite a laggard, so you have quite a dimorphic mm -hmm. uh, housing intensification arrangement in the total Nelson-Tasman region. You've got Tasman uh, welcoming and doing huge numbers of plan changes, and their numbers are mm -hmm. stratospheric. And then you've got Nelson, uh, which and, and yet both have to pull their weight. Um, and um, there is definitely a cohort that want to enjoy what Nelson City has to offer, which is a different thing than Rach Richmond. And um, so one of the attractions is that this is relatively close. So that's what I, all I want to say about that, but... Um, Can uh, I ask you a couple of questions on that again, in terms of a sort of the legal position that, that you're taking, in terms of that future development strategy, FDS 2019, hmm. What weight do you think we should be giving that vis-a-vis, -vis, well, the question is really how determinative do you think it is when we've got a national policy statement on urban development and a more, a more recent one, um, the 2019 version, put a, I mean, I understand the Ombudsman decision and, and, and clearly that decision ha hasn't determined that the council process wasn't valid. It's sort of, I would almost say a sort of a, a slap across the wrist. Um, but the position, the position is, the council's position is, formal position right now, is that the Kaka Valley is, is a site strategically which is appropriate for urbanisation. But how much are you relying on that vis-a-vis -vis the actual national policy statement on urban development? Well, um, I don't like to make submissions on weight too much um, because I think in the end you have to evaluate that yourself. Right. Um, but what I would say is this, um, a lot of people in the freshwater context are talking about Te Mana o te wai mm -hmm. as if it's only come up in 2020. But actually if you follow the statements from 2011, 2014, 2017, 2020, there's been an evolution, not a revolution. Mm -hmm. And as far back as the 2011 Tangata Whenua interests in fresh water are mentioned uh, and provided for. And similarly with the MPS, I think this strategy was developed with the previous MPS in mind <clears throat> and the recognition of the council that it was now going to be directed to start planning for urban growth and it had to deal with that. And, and my submission is uh, that there are significant differences between the two MPSs, but it is significant that this strategy responds in a way... Where in the 2006 strategy it was like, ooh, we won't go there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> By 2019 they're saying, we have to confront these issues. Um, and so Kaka Valley is on the, on, on, the, on the tab as one of the runners that should be run. Um, and so we say, that's right. Um, we do accept that for a section of the community, this is a controversial plan change. Mm -hmm. um, and it is a paradigm shift in terms of how Nelson conceives itself. And that is why we decided to run it, because we actually think it required a lot of intestinal fortitude to actually get on and do it. And that's, mm -hmm. so I, we are relying on it, but I think the policy, the NPS, is our biggest tailwind, um, mm -hmm. and and I think it it you are obliged to implement it. So that's the that's the biggest thing that I think is there for you. Thank you. I mean, because I mean, again, Ms. Jeep runs an argument, and you'll read it when you read her legal submissions about it. But it, but notwithstanding, in terms of Section seventy five, you know, we can have regard to these other documents. What's your view? I think you have a different view of Ms. Anderson, though, in terms of the twenty twenty two version. Um, of the, the FDS, which is running right now, and I understand the council will adopt it in whatever form 
Ms. Ms. Day might be able to in August sometime. Yeah. And the, uh, I think Ms. Anderson and who says that we might need to take that into account, even though the hearing might be over. Mm. And I think in your supplementary legal submissions, you say, you know, we should be dealing only with the documents which are ticked off, for want of a better word. Is that your view? I mean, should we have to be having no regard to the 2022 vision if it gets adopted prior to us releasing our recommendation or prior to the council releasing its decision? Um, it just struck me, uh, and we've dealt with this in terms of, like I had the, um, uh, ran the one plan for Horizons Regional Council and um, the, I think the NPSFM 2011 came before or after the process or something. And, and, and I was concerned, I think the court said we had to be careful that not to try and apply instruments mm -hmm. to things that were never developed with those instruments in mind. And I have a justice concern about that. Um, I don't think there's ever been any decided case on that point. What I would say is, um, STM has worked at a political level, um, and we've always said we want to deal with it on legal and expert level. Yeah, yeah. And so whatever the council's political wing decide, our, our argument to you is that this is the correct planning solution in light of the policy direction. So um, I'm not going to be black and white about it, no. but I, I, just, I have some reservations <coughs> about uh, dealing with an instrument that comes in after the hearing. Right. Just to round that off, so he, he, really the question about how determinative you think the yeah, FDS think is, it's... I mean, it might not matter to you, um, no, whichever way it goes. But the other question I want to put to you, and I'll put to Ms Jepp, and, and we haven't got the council solicitor here, but might, is a remedy, I mean, if we thought we did want to understand it, that we would, if our recommendation report wasn't completed before the, the August date, that we might invite legal submissions from the parties on, on it. Um, so well, that, that's one way to deal with mm. the prejudice point. I accept yeah, yeah. that. Um, I guess my more fundamental point is um, is that instrument um, that instrument is about uh, it's not really, I think I make this point in my final part of the supplementary legal submissions, that actually that policy, even if it was produced finally, has a particular role in terms of councils thinking about their strategic planning for land infrastructure. It doesn't purport to be a case where the political wing can wag the dog. Oh, right. And so I don't think a strategy can override or undermine the intent of the national policy because the reason the national policy has required is because uh, the broken markets arise through political decisions that the central government do not accept. So Auckland's situation has arisen because of political decisions that central government has now attempted to trump through national policy, and I would say it would be a very odd result if the same thing happened in Nelson. So I guess my more fundamental position is, we've always stated, and we said it when Ms Oliver started a conferencing process, we're not interested in Nelson politics. No. We just want an RMA solution. Yeah. Well, let's just see how it goes. I, mean, I do note that Mr Spittle, I think, in his statement has, has talked about the, the subcommittee process and the public deliberations and, and, and what was being decided there. It clearly is not a council policy. Um, anyway, no, I'll, I'll leave that there again because I'll, I'll probably ask Ms Jepp her view on that as well. Yeah. So um, in section 11 I deal with the key unresolved issues with NCC's experts. Um, and um, look, this process of conferencing has been enormously productive mm -hmm. because I don't think um, we would be in any shape to deal with this matter. <laughs> Uh, if there wasn't the learning between experts. And I think that's a credit to the process that the panel has, has run, that it's got that heavy lifting done through those processes, because otherwise, as a country, we're not going to get through these sorts of instruments in, in an efficient way. Um, 
And so in terms of the unresolved issues with NCC's experts, they're actually comparatively narrow. Uh, and they largely fall on the freshwater uh, erosion sediment control type issues. Um, and then a strange little side issue about a woolshed. Um, and uh, on the erosion and sediment control, there's quite a stark contrast between Mr. Parsonson's evidence and Mr. Ridley's evidence. And I'm not going to go into that. I'll let the panel explore that. But um, we're in a position where we're backing our horse. Uh, we're not saying we're not giving you any information, but we question its utility. I'm pleased you're backing your horse because we'd be in a different position if you weren't. <laughs> <laughs> so um, he, can, he, can, he can take off and run his, uh, his run. But um, uh, on the wool shed issue, um, I really think the panel needs to go out there. Uh, we and, have, and we have been through it. Oh, okay. You Tentatively. Survived. You survived. <laughs> um, uh, uh, and, and Mr Miller um, talks about this, but I understand, um, I read a funny thing yesterday, and it was something that Mr Harley sent to me, and he said that he it's remembered... It's a statement. Yeah, it's 50 years ago, <laughs> working on it as a student with the farm manager, and he's slightly slightly flattered at the fact that this is now assumed an important status. <laughs> um, but um, we, we think, we think it, it, it's just um, odd, but um, we'll leave it for you to, to deal with it. I have a legal question though for you um, on, on, on that. Um, Dr. Mc, is it Dr. McEwen, is that how, is it? Mc, um, ascribes more value to it than, than Mr Miller and, and Ms Sweetman agrees with um, the council and have recommended that it be scheduled. Mm. The question I've got for you is, the schedule is, is effectively a plan change. You haven't asked for it. Do we have scope to schedule it if we thought it, if we thought it was appropriate? I don't think we do, is my position. Mm. You might yeah, want to think I, about I don't that. think there is scope, um, but I haven't, I didn't actually think about that issue, which is odd for me because I'm known as the scope king. <laughs> but um, you're probably right. Uh, but I think it was the more fundamental point I made. Well, look, these people could have pulled it down before this hearing. Now, they didn't do that because that's not their style, but it's sort of got an artificiality about it that someone like Dr McEwen sort of piggybacks on our plan change to achieve a resource outcome that we really weren't seeking. Do you want my question would it be, in terms of scope, it would more be whether or not we've even got jurisdiction. Mm. That's what I mean, yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, I think that's yeah, a valid yeah, point. So you might want to come back to that because, I mean, if, I mean, if, we, if we do not have jurisdiction to schedule it, and, and my, our, the panel's position right now is that we don't because, as I said, that would be a plan change in itself, um, and that would, and, and you haven't asked for it to be scheduled. Um, it hasn't gone out for a submission like basis. You haven't had an opportunity to lodge any, say, further submissions to opposing that if you did. I do, I note that your, your substantive argument that it doesn't warrant it anyway. Um, but anyway, we'll, we'll need to cover that off because depending on which evidence we prefer in the end is what happens to it. Mm. Um, if we agreed with the council position more that it had a greater status or greater heritage value than your witness, it might mean, what, a different activity status? I mean, if we agree with you, as I said, you're, you're recommending to us a controlled activity status, um, but I think you're quite right. Right now, it has no protection at all. Correct. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so in terms of that uh, process that, we fought, that was followed with the experts, um, it's pretty clear that the applicants experts have engaged and learnt some things and adjusted things through that process. And I think um, a plan change has to have the flexibility to say, oh, OK, I think I've learned something there. These adjustments need to be made. Um, and that's what's happened. Um, and we've been very clear that we didn't say we had all the answers, but, but we think that what we have can be burnished as necessary to optimise and, and get, get a good result for Nelson. So um, is that a convenient time to have a break? Uh, How or, much more have you got to go? Oh, uh, quarter of an hour maximum? I, I think, I'd think i prefer you to okay. complete the legal submissions and we'll yep. take the break then. Okay. So um, 
Uh, I deal with STM at section 12 when there are a number of housekeeping matters. Um, the first is, uh, hand up six is a statement from an supplementary statement from Andrew Spittle. And it attaches uh, a letter from Ms Jepp to me uh, asking me to justify the proposition that I advanced at paragraph 173 of my submission that the stated objectives of Save the Maitai are to prevent any residential development and then acquire the land. And uh, in the short time I had available because I was heavily occupied last week, um, this supplementary statement uh, attaches as attachment A that letter um, and then attachment B is the constitution of Save the Mai Tai, which is um, that. And at page, um, page, is it that? Is that um, under the heading purposes at page four of the attachments, it says, the primary purpose of the society are to prevent residential subdivision in Kaka and Maitai Valleys and to promote the acquisition of the Kaka Valley as a public reserve, including education, lobbying, court proceedings, and any other actions that may be required to achieve the purpose of the society. So that's why I justified that statement. Its stated purposes are very clear. Um, and then there's some additional material including a Facebook page from Mr Haddon, who lives at the end of Ralphine Way, that says we're not negotiators or compromisers. So it is what it is. That's who they are. That's what their job is. Um, and um, the next thing is Rod Dixon, who's a, a medalist runner, uh, contacted my team on yesterday and said, He's, there's a statement on the website from him that he's never seen or didn't authorise. Mm. Um, and so I said to him, well, you've got two options. You can email Sally Jepp and ask her to remove it because it's got her details on it, uh, and or you can make a statement. And so he's chosen to make a statement, which is this statement, to explain to you that he's never authorised it. And his position was that um, initially he was concerned about the plan change because of the information that he received about it, but then he found out a lot of that was misinformation, um, and so he was quite content for the process. So he's asked me to bring to the panel's attention that that statement should be taken off the website because it is not authorised by him. He's never seen it. He didn't sign it. Thank you for that. I mean, Ms. Jepp can cover that off when she covers it, but that he, he was, because we were told that there would be eight witnesses and there was nine, and I saw Mr. Dixon's there and I assumed that he had come on board. Yeah. So you have that there. You. Um, so now I want to just deal with the Stevens Gateway analysis. Mm -hmm. um, and to do that, um, I want to walk you through uh, the plan that. Uh, is in the graphics bundle. Um, Tony, what's the best graphic to go through the, the valley? To show through the drive through the valley. What's the best graphic for that? Oh, I prefer a map plan. So I make graphic 19 and handout 2, um, and you'll see the Mai Tai River in the lower right-hand quadrant, and you see the Kaka Valley, and, and um, 
roughly where... Mr. Marson, can, can, can you just tell us, is it page 19, which one are you Page 19 of handout two. Right, the, the one you handed up? Just, yeah, viewpoint oh, location plan. Great, thank you. Yes, got it. So you've got the Maitai River, and you've got the Kaka Valley, and you can see the site in the Melbourne Hills. Now, under 3C, you'll see a, a, an unvegetated area that's sort of like driving down a boulevard. It's, mm -hmm. it's very treed. Um, and you only get to the cricket ground where roughly number one is after you've crossed Jenkins Bridge. Mm -hmm. And all the way through there, um, I think it's called Bradford Hill, is it? Brad, Brad, Branford Park, Park. Um, sort of obscures, it's a dominating thing, obscures your view uh, to the north, um, and it's only when you get to the cricket ground that you actually have views <laughs> into Karka Valley, and the distance in a car travelling between Jenkins Bridge and, say, Ralphine Way is probably only a minute. Mm -hmm. And on the edge of... Uh, the cricket ground is all this vegetation which currently is quite deciduous it's sort of thing but when it's full you, you don't really look mm -hmm. into that area and so um, I've also pointed out that there is a proposal to revegetate the margin so um, it's if you're in the park if you're driving it's a very limited mm -hmm. lateral view and if you're playing in the ground, in the cricket ground, the experience is more that of being in a river margin <laughs> than being in a valley. Um, and that is what Graphic 12 from Tony Milnes is really trying to achieve, is that experientially a sense of the river corridor uh, rather than uh, distant visible views um, of the Kaka Valley. And I think that's why Miss Stephen really does pick these viewing points that are highly elevated, oh, yeah. because it isn't a gateway. Um, I mean, if you thought it was a gateway, you would be taking very public uh, viewing points. And so when you're on Charlotte Hill, well, what are you doing? You're either biking, or you're walking, or you're running. And um, in all of those lo viewing locations that Ms. Stevens use, the panoramas that you've got are just unbelievable. I mean, up at some of those higher viewing points, you're looking out to Tasman Bay, mm -hmm. and the idea that you're sort of focusing down on um, the Takaka Valley uh, is, according to Mr Milne, somewhat unreal. And I think you need to just get a sense Maybe. of that yourself uh, when you go through. Um, I do deal in my submissions at 190 to 191 about the gateway concept in the national regional, sorry, the Nelson Regional Policy Statement. Um, but I, and I've also mentioned the gateway concept in a very limited sense in the Resource Management Plan, which was policy RE 3.2. Um, so effectively, um, you have a landscape architect that sort of come in <laughs> and sort of claimed herself the right to produce to you a completely different paradigm for landscape management. And the critique that I make at 192 of the submissions is that it's not systematic in terms of the major values that, that leverage that assessment, which is associational uh, and experiential values. But a more significant critique I make is that it doesn't at all engage with or claim to have considered mana whenua. And so um, uh, Hemi Toya, who's explained it very eloquently for Ngāti Kawata in his statement, is talking about this desire to have kāinga in this location so that they can look at the uh, manga and all of those sorts of things, and it's meaningful. And so you have this situation where a landscape architect comes in, <laughs> says, my opinion uh, privileges a particular group that I'm representing and is not a systematic, associational, experiential. And what I would say, submit to you, 
is that a landscape architect cannot say that associational, associational and experiential values are intrinsically exclusionary or protectionary. Mm -hmm. An experiential and a social value can actually have a value that values the ability to engage with and live in that mm -hmm. landscape. And that is what I understand Nati Kawata are saying to you. And so I express the concern in my submissions that there's a sort of imperial flavour to Ms Stevens' um, analysis that is not um, community-based. So all I would say additionally is uh, landscape is only one part of the RMA puzzle. Uh, it isn't described as a part two protection resource, so it's not a um, section six resource. And the only other thing I would mention again to you is the statement in policy 6B of the MPSUD, which is about amenity. And one person's amenity is another person's non-amenity. And what Nati Kawata have conveyed, as one example, I, I, they're important of course, but it, it would be true of anyone who actually goes to live in this location, they enjoy, they're going to enjoy the amenity. And one of the things that um, I think Tony Milne emphasises is with all of these tracks and all of these uh, uh, recreational facilities that Mr Rob Greenaway talks about, actually, in terms of summing the hedonic value of landscape, the population of Nelson is going to have a mm. far better outcome than anything about retaining it as a working farm. So um, I, I put that in context. And then finally, if I could address you, uh, and I do need to go to the bathroom, so I'd like to close <laughs> off on this as a good incentive. <laughs> Um, is that uh, Ms McCabe mm. really undertakes what I think is a basic planning fallacy, which is, if I can criticise this, then the status quo is the better result. And in my submission, that doesn't follow as a matter of logic. And if you look at the Long Bay Akura process, which the Environment Court followed, which uh, is the one that I think you should, which is your job is to optimise the plan provisions within scope to achieve the purpose <coughs> of the Act. Mm -hmm. It's not to just find fault and then say, oh, bad luck, you didn't achieve, <laughs> you didn't mm -hmm. achieve whatever standard we have. Yeah. Um, it's actually a more constructive process. And it did slightly disturb me that um, we were in this sort of ankle-tapping planning analysis as opposed to a more constructive process because um, I think the gentleman here, uh, while they're liking to make a profit from these things, is genuinely concerned that people can't afford to live in Nelson mm -hmm. and they want to actually do something about it. Um, and Andrew will talk to you a little bit about how good it's been working with Nadi Kawada because probably disproportionately those people are experiencing these hardships. So. Um, I won't say any more about that, um, other than just say I haven't had a chance to read Sally's submission, so I'll need to take time to do that. Um, but thank you for your time. You're welcome. Could you want to take a question, yep. George? Oh. Yep. Are there questions for any further questions for any further questions? No. You do, sorry? No. Uh, kia ora, Mr Marson. Thank you for those submissions. Um, I'm not going to leap into the question yet because, as you've indicated, you haven't had a chance to read Ms um, Gipp's submissions. Uh, but she does refer to a case, um, an environment course case, 2018, called Lee and Auckland Council. And I wonder if you... Uh, I'm going to ask you a question about that or just turn your mind to a uh, finding okay. by the court in terms of that. So if over the break you could potentially have a look at... Uh, her submissions, or, or you can deal with it in reply. I'll just put the question to you. Thank you. That's all. That's just only what was that case about? Uh, <laughs> it's 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 about sediment. Oh, Mr. Mr. Parsonson's got it. Yes. Oh, sediment. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We'll try and deal yeah. with that. And just just one just one final legal que um, question to me, and it's to do with a couple of case law decisions. Um, Ms. McCabe refers to this is the four wheel decision. 
um, which I don't think you've referenced Ms. And when you read Ms. Jeeps, I don't, if I remember correctly, she hasn't referred to it, but she has talked about bad resource management decisions um, around infrastructure provisions. And I know we got um, that case put to us in, a, in another case in Auckland um, where it was a Napier, I don't know whether you know it, but it's a Napier case. And I, as I understand it, put in me, the, the whole approach in that decision was about it wasn't. It was about bad resource management, but it was about unmeetable expectations around, in this case, infrastructure. And I think Ms. McKay draws the view around transport that this is resort, bad resource management to do this in the absence of funding already being agreed through the long-term plan, etc. And I just wonder whether you might want to make a comment on that later yeah, on. Yeah, I will. But yeah. um, Mr. Spittle is also a person who can answer that question. The truth of the matter is, Tonkin and Taylor are the consultants principally for infrastructure for Nelson City. They, they're currently working for the applicant. Um, extensive reports and work has been done on supporting infrastructure for this site, mm -hmm. extensive work, which is why the Section 42A reports don't really challenge the capability. Because it's a political issue, a decision was made not to put it in the LTP because that would then yeah, engender yeah, that process. Yeah. But. Um, uh, my, my, my view is, the Council's view as I understood it was, let's test the merits of the plan change from an RMA perspective, and if it gets on, uh, then we'll program it um, according to our statutory responsibilities. So um, my view is that it would not be consistent with the direction for responsive planning to say that every time an LTP doesn't have these things in there, it's not the right answer. Um, and, but I would go further than that and say, I believe the council has a high level of confidence that this can be engineered. Um, and if they, how that all plays out in terms of the financing mm -hmm. will need to be worked through through its own process. Mm -hmm. But you. it's not a case of bad, I mean, I don't know whether the Napier case was the one about plan change up in the hills. <laughs> Um, but this is only a very short distance mm -hmm. from town. Mm -hmm. it's, and the other thing is, um, I would say, is the city has an infrastructural problem and the Greenfield's intensification component need to work together. So there is some virtue in understanding where the landscape is both intensification and, the, and other sites, Greenfield, to size your infrastructure. And so they we're in this position where upsizing for this desirably occurs alongside whatever intensification sizing needs, is required. So it's, it's a, it is a, a hand in glove thing. Exactly. Yeah. And we're looking Thank you for that. I think what we, we will do is take the break. I mean, uh, and cl clearly when we're addressing your witnesses, if we have any other legal questions, we'll just ask Absolutely. you direct and come back. So um, thank you, everybody. We'll take a break. Um, 15 minutes and all we'll come back. Thank you.
If anything that's been produced which hasn't already been provided electronically, could it be emailed to um, Ms McShay and it just at that standard administration at ncc.gov.nz. But we can, we can clarify that. But it's really just a plea. Anyone who's providing anything, now can they pr also provide it electronically so we can put it up on the website? Thank you. Certainly. Um, I, I will... Um, uh, Commissioner Tapania slightly threw me with the name of that case. Okay. It's actually the Long Bay case, um, which I also cited in my supplementary. And it is true that there was quite a lot of consideration of erosion sediment control in that case. Um, Mr Parsonson was also involved in that case, and I think uh, his position is that at that time modelling was introduced as an innovation at that time, but that was at a period when um, the consenting framework for these types of things was not as robust as we now say as present practice. And in his view, he's got to the point where um, the value of that modelling, given all the assumptions in it, relative to the robustness of the consenting processes <coughs> and, the, and the quality of the standards that are now applied to that, um, that his view is that modelling lacks any, uh, is not justified. So he's aware of that case, and you are right that that case does mention that I was aware of that. My question probably was less around that, uh, more oh. around the sufficiency of our, uh, information argument there's, that Ms Jett raises, her point being that there is no one-size-fits-all approach to sufficiency of information. I agree with that. Um, so, yeah, and it was in, and you'll read her submissions and, and mm. where she takes that. But I think for me the point is about we, the whole point around your arguments and Ms Jepps around sufficiency of information falls to the scale and significance. And for me it's about um, the need for the panel to understand the potential effects of this development mm. so that we can compare whether or not the rigour of assessment that is required by the potential provisions um, of the proposed provisions is appropriate to give effect to the purpose of the Act. Mm. Um, rather than the existing provision, provisions of the plan. Mm. So it, 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 it's, it really does fall to the scale and significance. Yes, and I think that's exactly right, and I think that's how Mr Parsonson does it. And I think in my supplementary submission I described them as temporary, but um, significant, potentially high impactful. Um, and <clears throat> uh, when I say temporary, I'm not saying very short term, but, but they will uh, not be long and long lasting, and um, he's factored that assessment, I think, into his his opinion. Um, so you are right that, that there isn't one size fits all, and it's very much about scale and significance. Thank you. So, um, Mr. Spittle um, is briefly going to extemporise and then um, answer any questions. Thanks. He's covering two, three topics: the walk with Iwi. Mm -hmm. um, the enablement of the team <coughs> and the infrastructure question. Morena. Morena, welcome. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. It's been a, a long process. <laughs> uh, back in um, 2000, early 2019, we were approached by the Bayview people asking if we were interested in buying part, part of this land. We did our due diligence and we um, decided go through with the purchase and sales agreement. The, um, the who we are is, um, we've got Mr Birko down there, he's the older gentleman. <laughs> then we've got Mr Coleman, who's the younger gentleman. Mr Hemi, who, you know, he's just Hemi. And we've got Richie here from the Bayview Group. Um, we formed a great team right from the start. Um, and, and the why we took this land on is that there was a housing crisis has already had started in 2019. The land had been identified for growth. Um, some of the stuff in 1977, this is the development plan for that land that we brought. So oh, that was already done in 1977. So we did our due diligence, it's needed, and we, we proceeded with our um, purchase and started working through it. Um, so to us, it was, just, it was needed. Um, I'll just touch at the end of it about the iwi involvement. But it's, it's you know, Nelson, Nelson City, we went and met with the Nelson City Council after the, the election in 2019. It was received very well. They needed the land, they wanted to know how fast we could do it. 
and they re strongly recommended us to go straight to a resource consent, which we thought was a bit risky on stuff, so we, we wanted to follow the due process, and we had Mr Musum come in and, and inform what that due process was, and as you always do, you do what your lawyer, lawyer tells you. Um, so we carried on with that. We ended up putting together such a good team. You know, you, I, I cannot speak so highly of the team that we've got, and the bulk of them are local, without the towns where we needed it. And we challenged the team to challenge us. You know, we're not here to tell you what your job. You are here to tell us how we can deliver this land in the new way of the future. You know, we, we talk about the fresh water standards, we talk about a whole lot of stuff that's changed. I've been digging ditches in Nelson for 30 plus years and I've seen the changes. I did the work on Ralph Way mm -hmm. in 1980, I think, when it was first cut off. You know, I dug the ditches up there. We, what we do now in, 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 in the industry of construction is completely and utterly different than what we've done and it will be different in 10 years' time, in 15 or even 5 years. You know, we have to learn to adapt and be a forward of the game. So our team here is just brilliant. You just, they, they challenge us. We, we've actually had a couple of our team most likely were hesitant to accept the role and because of the uh, political feed that, that was going on against this development. They're on board now and they're hugely on board and they see what this group wants to achieve and it's something pretty special. So they're empowered and they're challenged to question how we can do things better. So you'll see that through the amount of paperwork and stuff that we've done. The other one is the expert caucusing. That was brilliant, you know, to get people in a room that could talk through things without being sitting in, this room, sitting in an open thing like that has been brilliant, you know, and we've learnt a lot and we've, we've taken stuff on and we've worked. And I, I thank you for that, that decision, it, it was great. Um, so, infrastructure. Yeah, we, we were asked by North City Council in early 2020 to do the LTP planning for infrastructure because they had nobody to do it. They were constrained by time pressures and personnel. We undertook to do their job for them. We paid our consultants to do that work. And we came up with the infrastructure and the costing that was required to service this land. That was put in, it was negotiated, talked about. When we understood that the, this wasn't going to be a plan change soon, it was decided to pull that out of the LTP. But all the work's there. There's a lot of work being done sewer upgrades, stormwater upgrades, water, all the um, requirements for high level reservoirs. There's reservoirs not just to service us but service the Greater Nelson. But one of the big parts was the work that we were going to do would have allowed the intensification of a big part of Nelson because at the moment that infrastructure is undersized. So it was a very good fit. What else was I allowed to talk about? Mm -hmm. Oh, you know that. I thought it was something else. Um, so we brought Iwi on board because they are the biggest landowner up in, 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 in the Maito area. It also was the right thing to do, and we gave them an opportunity. Um, Kawata haven't really got you know, a great experience in property development or building, which our team has got. We're, we're, we're very experienced in that. Um, I just got some information this morning. We did uh, 250 titles in the last 18 months for new housing, and the bulk of those are built on. So we, we deliver a reasonable amount of supply to this region. But I think what we got out of it, the, the, the Ben, Graham and myself, is it was the right thing to do, but we've, we've grown. It's, it's the, the vision and the stewardship of the iwi of looking at, you know, they're just guardians of the land. Yes, we own this land at the moment, and we're only the third owner in the 150 years since the European of this land, but we've got an opportunity and obligation to build something here for the future. And I do get a bit annoyed when I, you know, I, I want to put something for my grandchildren and children as well. We need to think of the future, not the past. And a lot of the stuff we're talking about is the past, what's happened in the past. You know, we're going to have e-bikes, e-cars, we're going to have car share, we're going to have lots of different things that this world is going to see in the next five to ten years. So we should be looking, how can we develop this for the new generation? How can we get young families and people living in town? How can we have people living in town for their last house? So we've challenged our team, how can we do this? And then with the iwi involvement, it just focuses it. So, you know, so I mean, you know if, if we were just a dirty developer, like we get tagged by some certain group that you will most likely heard, you know, 
would have we put, you know, we put um, two k's of stock fencing of carcass stream in. We've um, poisoned over 130 hectares of widening pines. We've ribbed 500 goats off the site. We've cleared over 90 hectares of gorse and bracken and noxious weeds and put back. You know, those are the things you don't do if you're in it for a quick buck. You know, that's where we sit. But I'll pass you over to Hemi next if that's all right. But the iwi and what we're doing, I just yeah. don't think we've been recognised anywhere near enough by the submitters or the council. Is, is paramount, you know, for so the CCKD group, and we spent two and a half million dollars buying Kaka Hill to gift 112 of hectares of it to Kawata. You know, that, that's not what you do if you haven't got a commitment for the future, because we know that these people will look after it and guard it. Nelson City Council don't want it; they've told us that. You know, so it's the best thing happening. So, thank you. And thank you. Ask for any Just before we hand over to Mr. Toy, I was a few questions <coughs> of Mr. Spittle. <coughs> Mr. Just, I've just got just a couple, really. Just going going to your to your statement, um, <clears throat> and I'd really just like you to make a comment. Uh, and I don't want this to sound pejorative to you or to, to the other submitters, but I've been reading a lot of the Save the Mai Tai and other submitters who talk about, <clears throat> I mean, because you're a local, I'm asking you as a local, who say if this development goes ahead, the sort of the tranquil valley, and it will be destroyed. But the photos we're getting are of Denny's Hole and the walkways and all of those sorts of things. So as not somebody living here, I'm, what I don't understand is, and, I, and we'll talk to them, what, what they're actually talking about. And, and again, Mr. Marson talked about the additional planting. What's, and, and again, we've got this the petition which you talk about, and we've got a lot of the submitters talking about the community don't want this, and there are clearly elements of the community that don't. But within all of that, given that you're part of the community and you, you reference your concern about young people not being able to afford houses, what's your position in terms of that bundle of issues? Yeah, I think that's a very good question because, again, we're not touching Banford Park, we're not touching that side of it. We're, we're building up in the Kaka and we're adding, you know, so the walkway from central New Zealand through to Bayview is, is a was private land, people used it, it's been closed because of health and safety. That will be public, you know. The, all the recreational benefits that we are offering on this land, you know, so if you do intensification and we put, you know, what, say 600 houses, more houses in Nelson, where's the extra area for recreation going to come from that? Um, I just can't understand, I, yeah, I struggle with it too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, there will be more cars on um, Mito Valley Road, and down Nile Street, we can't not say that won't happen. Is it going to be the number that they say, or the number we say we don't know what the future's going to be, but hopefully people will commute. Uh, Nelson have got out the new active mode strategy at the moment, which is funded. That's what we're people looking for. We don't want more cars on the road, we want less. So, yeah, I, I, I do. I struggle with what, what we're taking away in recreational values or tranquil up there. Thank you, that, and we'll pick this up with your recreational expert, Mr. Yeah. Greenaway, and, and council. Thank you for that. That's helpful. Right, right. 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 Thank you, Mel. Ngāti Kuata Komato for your mihi greeting and opening for this hearing in Hui. Greetings to the panel of Commissioners Hill, Tapania, Rat and Mark Brown. My name is Hemi Toya and I work for Ngāti Kuata as the Chief Executive for the Commercial Arm, Kuata Limited. I also represent Ngāti Kuata as a Director on the Maitahi entity, CCKV, making this private plan change application with our neighbouring landowner, the Bayview entity. Uh, to be clear, this presentation is not a technical presentation. Uh, that will be left to our very capable experts. It is my whakaro or thoughts presented through the lens of uh, Ngāti Kuata. For the past five and a half years, I've had the pleasure and joy of working for Te Iwi or Ngāti Kuata in my role as Chief Executive of Ngāti Kuata's commercial and economic arm, Kuata Limited. This is a role I previously enjoyed for Te Rarua in Te Hiku Kaitaia. The responsibility and expectation of such a role is not lost on me, and my personal conviction and determination is to do all that I can to advance the economic well-being of Māori iwi with the belief that sustainable economic development helps to support the cultural, social and environmental well-being 
of our people, our communities, and our home, Aotearoa. To borrow a phrase coined by John Elkington, a world authority on corporate responsibility and sustainable capitalism, the three Ps, planet, people, profit. It is my view that Māori long understood the sustainable connectivity and priority well before Mr Elkington. Just a side note, the Elkington whānau are of Ngāti Kuata descent, but Mr John Elkington is clearly not. <laughs> Otherwise, he would have turned his 3P phrase from a triple bottom line sustainable measure into the iwi Māori quadruple bottom line sustainable measure, which includes cultural as well as social, environmental and economic. It is my view and Ngāti Kuata's view that this private plan change 28 being considered by yourselves is an opportunity for Ngāti Kuata, along with its partners, to effectively and magnificently demonstrate sustainable and beneficial taonga, tangata, taiao, oha oha, cultural, social, environmental, economic development, not just for Ngāti Kuata whānau, not just for iwi Māori, but for our whole community of Nelson Whakatū. Over the past two and a half years, going through this whole plan change application and submission process, Ngāti Kuata have been on the receiving end of some comments, both spoken and written, that have been less than complimentary, and at times bordering on patronising and even race-biased. Ngāti Kuata have remained silent, but out of respect to the people of Ngāti Kuata and to iwi Māori in general, I do feel compelled to respond, albeit briefly, as follows. Ngāti Kuata are not part of this partnership just to provide a Māori voice that our partners can hide behind. We are part of this because we bring something unique and special that makes this whole proposal even better. This opportunity will, will, bring significant benefits to Fano, and yes, we are well qualified to know the needs and opportunities that are suitable for iwi Fano. It is okay for iwi Māori to be engaged in commercial activities that create profit. That is okay. And Ngāti Kuata fully understand the value and meaning of sustainable cultural, social, environmental, economic development. And as Tangata Whenua, Ngāti Kuata do have a legal and moral right to support this proposal. Kaka Hill. Kaka Hill is culturally significant for Tatauhu Iwi and especially for the relationship between Ngāti Kuata and Ngāti Kuia. The proposed and gifting of Kaka Hill that was uh, celebrated last week to Ngāti Kuata by the Private chain, Plan Change 28 Maitahi applicants is a positive outcome for this project and provides our people and especially Ngāti Kuia with more opportunity to undertake kaitiakitanga, specifically in regards to Ngāti Kuia Wahitapu and Urupā. The cultural restoration of Kaka Hill will be significant to all of us here in Whakatū. Ngāti Kuata acknowledge and thank our Maitahi partners for this generous and significant gift. On a broader issue, comments have been made that this land, privately owned land, at the front and to the side of the Maitahi Valley should be retained for the recreational and well-being benefit of the wider community. Ngāti Kuata wished to inform these opponents and the public in general of the numerous ways in which Ngāti Kuata have already sacrificed for the wider community good. For example, access to circa 700 hectares of Ngāti Kuata owned whenua in the heart of the Maitai Valley. So think Codgers, Fringed Hill, Sharlands and Maitai Face are already extensively used by the wider community for many recreational purposes, including walking, running and biking. Access to Ngāti Kuata own land for important telecommunications infrastructure for the benefit of the wider community has also been made available. Under the unauspicious threat of applying the Public Works Act to acquire land that was part of the very recent treaty settlement negotiations, land was exchanged for a water treatment plant for the benefit of the wider community of Nelson. And it is anticipated that the wider community will have and enjoy access to the cultural, environmental and recreational value 
of this whole development with Maitahi and Bayview, including Kaka Hill, when this housing development and Kaka Hill restoration are completed. Something that has not been available for the many decades the said land has been in private ownership. So please excuse me if I do not wilt under the claim for the benefit of the whole community, this plan change cannot proceed. I do, however, as Andrew has also intimated, wish to thank all those who have submitted and even those who have opposed. Uh, your comments have challenged us, in fact forced us to be even better than we had set out to be. Our experts in weighing the responses and arriving at joint witness statements with your experts have ensured a better outcome for all. I thank our experts for their efforts, expertise, enthusiasm and response in doing things better. Namihi nui ki a so what is Ngāti Kuata's aspiration for the development of this land, this whenua? To answer that, we need some important historical context. In 1840, several Ngāti Kuata chiefs signed to Treaty o Waitangi on Rangitoto ki te Tonga, known as Durbal Island. On the 21st of December 2012, Ngāti Kuata signed a deal of settlement with the Crown. This deal of settlement included the following apology. The Crown apologises to Ngāti Kuata for its acts and omissions which have breached the Crown's obligations under the Treaty of Waitangi. These include the Crown's failure to adequately protect the interests of Ngāti Kuata during the process by which land was granted to the New Zealand Company, the failure to adequately protect Ngāti Kuata interests during Crown purchases between 1853 and 1856, the operation and impact of the native land laws on Ngāti Kuata land. The failure to effectively implement the landless natives reserve scheme. And the failure to ensure Ngāti Kuata retain sufficient land for their future needs. Interesting closing comment that, isn't it? The failure to ensure Ngāti Kuata retain sufficient land for their future needs. This important historical context, this real and tangible lost opportunity <coughs> for Ngāti Kuata Fano and the descendants who are with us today, fuels the aspiration, the inspiration, the determination Ngāti Kuata have for this whenua and its development should this private plan change be approved. Tōtātū Kāinga, our home, will be a Kuata-led housing project that will, along with our partners' expertise, provide Fano with healthy homes, a secure <coughs> home base for Fano development, and a real opportunity to meet the home ownership needs of Fano. But no plan change, the historic failure continues. Kaora te tangata, kaora te whenua. When the people are well, the land is well. Ngāti Kuata's taiao strategic responsibility and intent is to maintain, strengthen and develop the kaitiakitanga in relationship with their environment. Ngāti Kuata prides itself on maintaining a strong commitment to the environment within its rohe and beyond. In fact, Ngāti Kuata are already involved in the restoration of native species in the lower reaches of Charlins Creek, which is neighbouring land to the PPC 28 site, with the first year of the Peniamane restoration project. Ngāti Kuata whānau are invested in this work, and the site has high cultural significance for Ngāti Kuata. Another environmental restoration project underway is the Teka Teka project, the restoration and expansion of significant native Nahere remnants on the northeast face of Kaka Hill, again land owned by Ngāti Kuata. This project aims to restore a site of high cultural and ecological value with the primary focus on restoring and protecting an old growth forest remnant which historically has provided habitat for Kaka, Kiwi, Kakariki and still supports Kakaruwai, Mirumiro, Kereru, and Koremako. This, along with restoration work on Kaka Hill within the PPC 28 site, would provide a halo effect for species present and reintroduced within the nearby Brook Waimarama Sanctuary. A housing development and restoration of the biodiversity in the Kaka Valley would restore and strengthen ancestral ties to the Awa and Whenua, contribute to the kaitiakitanga of these taonga enable more access to the taiao and its matauranga, and therefore strengthen the cultural base and identity for Ngāti Kuata Fano, as well as the health of the whenua and the awa. Ka ora te tangata, ka ora te whenua.
When the people are well, the land is well. In closing, my moi moia, or dream or vision for Ngāti Kuata and the various family names associated with this private plan change is to create a development that current and future generations will be proud of. That perspective, the perspective of attaching one's family and iwi name to a development, to the creation of something this significant, is sobering and full of great responsibility. A responsibility not lost on those involved in shaping this moimuya, in making this vision a reality. With my heart and my mind, I see this a vibrant community that connects with and enhances its natural environment and setting. I see a vibrant community that connects with each other, people connecting with people. A place people, whānau, can call home, our home, Totato Kain. A place whānau families can buy their first home, their next home, their last home. A place people can connect with tangata whenua, socially, culturally and environmentally. <clears throat> a place where Ngāti Kuata Fano and Māori can heal and re-establish their place, their future, with stability, with confidence and with opportunity. It is my view and Ngāti Kuata's view that this private plan change 28 being considered by yourselves is an opportunity for Ngāti Kuata, along with its partners, to effectively and magnificently demonstrate sustainable and beneficial taonga, tangata, taiao, oha oha, cultural, social, environmental economic development, not just for Ngāti Kuata Whānau, not just for iwi Māori, but for our whole community of Nelson Whakatū. Nō reira, tēnā tātou katoa. Kia ora. Uh, kia ora, Mr Toya. And before I um, ask you some questions, I should just, for your benefit and the benefit of Ngāti Kuata in the room, um, introduce myself properly here, Uri no Ngāpuhi, ngā Ngāti Kahuki Whāngaroa, um, ko Waihapa Tuku Marae. So just for those who don't understand the real, uh, noting my connection, my people hail from the north, from a tribe called Ngāti Kahu, we're based in Whāngaroa, so te hiku te ika, so mihi atu ki Mr Toya, your evidence clearly outlines the history and significance of Kaka Hill. I just had a couple of questions around that. Given that history, are you able to highlight what you consider are some of the key values, I guess, that associate, um, or that Ngāti Kuata in particular, but also Ngāti Kuia associate with Kaka Hill? Yeah, it's, uh, it was a tuku whenua for, uh, for Kuia through to Kuata that established the, the, the basis for peace, peaceful relationships and the ability to, to live together, to be together, to intermarry and to consolidate it and solidify that. But it's been in private ownership for so long now, even Ngāti Kuia do not have access to it. Uh, Ngāti Kuia are not able to celebrate their own history and connection with Kākahil and nor are Ngāti Kuata. So this significant cultural gift for Ngāti Kuata enables that. I've already, and Ngāti Kuata have commenced conversations with Ngāti Kuia, and that is something with regards to how they give effect to that will be some very good uh, kōrero between the two komatoa groups for Kuia and uh, Kuata. Okay. And in terms of that, and uh, following on from that, I guess, is just I need confirmation around what the aspirations are. Uh, that's obviously, from what you've said, a kōrero still to come. But what are the aspirations of Tangata Whenua, I guess, for Kaka Hill? Yeah, for Kaka Hill, there's, it could be summarised in three, I suppose, for all those four quadruple bottom lines. Culturally, how do we represent and remember and that significance culturally for Ngāti Kuia, Ngāti Kuata, particularly with regards uh, to uh, a chief that was buried there and maybe others yet to be confirmed and identified, Te Whero. So that is of cultural significance for those iwi and also for our, our, our region. Environmentally, we do see Kaka Hill being restored. We see it being restored to permanent forestry. Uh, on the east side of Kaka Hill, as I've mentioned, there are remnants of native nahere and bush, and the advice from the experts that we're given is that the ability to expand those native existing remnants and to then bring it over the hill into Kaka Hill is probably the most effective way over time of restoring uh, the environmental backdrop for Kaka Hill. 
So environmentally being involved in that and involving the community in doing that and involving and inviting the community, the resident community as well as Māori and the broader community to be engaged in that activity will connect them with Kākāhul environmentally but also culturally. And then so then you've got the social interaction that takes place as, a, as part of that. But I also see the opportunity with regards to the economic po, is that uh, this could be a place that visitors could uh, experience and visit from a cultural perspective, from an environmental perspective. If uh, the whole rejuvenation is going to take decades, people can be involved in that as part of the experiential interaction with Kaka Hill and with uh, Tangata Whenua. But also it has the opportunity to bring in recreational activities. And so I see an economic opportunity as well, which is all complementary as part of their quadruple measure for sustainable development, and that's just Kaka Hill. Okay. What I've been trying to understand is how the protection of Kaka Hill aligns with the types of aspirations that you've talked about. That, that's where it's very important for us to understand what those mechanisms are and to ensure that whatever mechanisms are put in place enable that. So that was, I was very clear when talking with Mark, I said, look, we've got to be clear that we need to have a broad approach to here. Do we put a kawanata over it? Does that enable that to do things in stages? For me, it's more around whatever is involved in any kind of covenant arrangement doesn't preclude iwi from pursuing the opportunities that uh, present themselves both environmentally, culturally, socially and economically. And I think just listening to you, I guess that's where the whole um the policy around Te Noranga Tiratanga comes into, it's about the determination of the iwi to define right. how, what, what works for them. Um, having said that, and looking at, I'll put it to you, and I'm, ha I'm happy for you to say if that's not fair, um, looking at the policy as currently worded talks about enabling Te Noranga Tiratanga. I have some difficulty with those words. Te Noranga Tiratanga is not enabled, you, you hold enable it, it full you stop. You have it. You have it. You have it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's less about enabling it and more around what what do you do to provide for it. It's, it falls into the six E, recognise and provide for. So what, uh, how should the policy, I, in my view, needs to be reframed. So it's less about enabling tanoranga tiratanga and more around capturing your aspirations, capturing the moi moi that the iwi has, um, ensuring it doesn't preclude it, but basically falls to you to determine that future. Um, so. We would wholeheartedly agree. Okay, goodbye. <laughs> so when I play with the words, it's your fault. Um, and in terms, moving on to the next topic is the, is the cultural impact assessment. The consul, consultation summary sets out some key matters that were discussed at the hui, which I see from the minutes you fas largely facilitated, um, between the various iwi reps, and talks about a CIA to come. My read of it is that that will be part of the resource consent process. It'll, it looks like the iwi are supportive of an integrated CIA. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, what was really important in this process, as uh, many would understand, from an iwi perspective, often here we are consulted at the very end of a planning process or resource consent process. Because Ngāti Kawata were part of the applicant, we saw this as a, an opportunity for us to shift that and to say actually we need to recognise Iwi's involvement at the front end. How do we do that? So I was able to facilitate uh, numerous hui with all eight to tau Iwi to enable that. And, it, and they were uh, a little bit suspicious of us, like this doesn't normally happen, but once they engaged they realised how powerful and empowering that is to be involved at the front end, not at the end as a last minute, oh, we haven't done our CIA, we're going to go get one. So that was quite empowering. It created a few challenges in understanding, well, what is it that we're asking and how much of it is part of a private plan change application process, not a resource consent process. And the commitment that we have given and demonstrated is that uh, iwi would be part of the process from the beginning all the way through, including resource consent. I think that's really important because that speaks to the ability, therefore, of mana whenua to have shaped the design and the out, you know, the design of the project as a whole. But when you look at the rules, it talks about the need to have a, a CIA provided with every application. And it seems to me that there will be times when iwi will determine that a CIA is not required. Um, I think what's probably more important is the rules enable or require a CIA to be provided or um, if we determine when that it's appropriate, appropriate right. um, but doesn't say it must be provided uh, with every application. Yeah. So I think there needs to be more words around um, should we decide 
not to provide one, that there's a statement of reasons from the relevant iwi as to why it won't be provided or why it's not needed. I'm sure Mr Lyle is making good note of that right now. Thank and, you. Good. And Mr Lyle, I'm thinking along the lines of the COVID Fast Track Act and the wording there around iwi management plan and whether or not it um, is required, what then happens. So that type of wording is probably more appropriate. Thank you. Um, and just to clarify, because I'm not from here, certainly in Tamaki Makoto, when we refer to iwi, we refer to mana whenua, mana whenua, capital M, capital W, is defined in the AUP um, when referring to mana whenua as a whole, small m, small w. It's pedantic, but I want to clarify because I want to get the decision right down. Here it feels to me like it's more around tangata whenua, less about mana whenua, more around tangata whenua. Is that correct, or can you help me? Uh, I don't know the answer to that at this point in time. Yeah, I'm not sure on the answer. Unless someone else in the team could answer that. Kapai, I've been picking, trying to fall to fall back on the Nelson Resource Management Plan, which right. actually refers to Tangata Whenua when, when talking about Te Tau Ihu Iwi. Um, so I'm just, we'll, we'll pick up that as we move through. That's Thank fine. You. In terms of um, culverts and fish passage, I just wanted to clarify, was there a view that came through the hui that you attended around culverts and the use of culverts? I'm going to defer that to Mark. Can you recall anything specific on that? I'll ask him when he gives evidence. When he comes back, where is he? He's, he's deferred himself. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. Thank I'll, you. I'll ask him when he gives evidence and you can um, twist his ear if it's not correct. Kia ora. Thank you very much. Kia ora. Kia ora. Mr Mark Brown, questions from you? Kia ora, Mr Toya. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I have a question to you regarding the, um, you were saying how you're really pleased that the um, proposed residential land is going to provide opportunities for um, iwi and whanau and other Maori people to perhaps buy a section and get housing and how important that is. My question is, did you have any involvement in, with the planners in working out the different residential zones. So if, as you're probably aware, there's the, the, de the, the higher density and the less density, with the higher density down on the flat. And was there any consideration um, in terms of any other zoning that might assist um, Māori such as Papakainga? Yes, I was involved in the zoning conversations and discussions and the, you know, the volume or the, the yield in each zoning. Yes, we did have some discussion around potential papakainga. My view of that was that that wasn't necessary. The mechanisms and the way that we will be approaching this as Ngāti Kuata through Tōtātou Kainga will still enable home ownership without papakainga. And for me, there are other economic realities and benefits of retaining it in general title. So the sort of, if you like, the, the sort of standard layout and lot sizes you think is is going to be fine for, for that. Yes, that, that will work well for our purposes and how we wish to approach it with our partners. And around, again, around how we can assist Fano into home ownership, we have uh, some very clever financial mechanisms that enable that. And so retaining general title does not inhibit it. But also we could go for, if we're talking about permanent housing, you know, you could also go for lar larger lot sizes. So all that finer detail is up for negotiation. Uh, with our partners as to what, what is going to work for Kuata and for Kuata led housing response. Thanks very much. Kia ora. Um, thank you, Mr. Toy. Uh, the question, I, I, I don't really have questions for you, I think they've been answered, but I just want to direct them back to Mr. Lyle and, and by reference to Ms. Sweetman in terms of the way that the, the uh, provisions that Ms. Tierpany has outlined. In terms of, you know, we've already signalled that there might need to be some further tweaking and, and expert conferencing bet between the planners, and I think Mr Lyle in his rebuttal statements clearly talks about these things needed to be um, refined even further. So I think what would be quite good in terms of a conversation between you and Mr Lyle about what Ms Tiepany says about how do we cast that policy in terms of your aspirations, as opposed to there are some sort of methods in there, and Ms Sweetman and her Addendum 42A identify some of those issues, that they're not really written as policies as we would understand them in RMA context, but they're sort of more statements or their, or their methods. So, so I'd encourage that discussion, how do we get the outcomes or the, the, the aspirations in that, in that policy? Could, could I ask uh, Commissioner Tapania to just restate some of that, since All Mr right. Lyle is, is he back in the office? Oh, he's not even back in the office, where is he? Oh, he's sitting there, sorry Mark, I'm sitting there. Were you here for that? Um, 
Fantastic. Thank you. Right. I looked down there and I didn't see him at the table, so I was thinking, where's he gone? Kia ora. Good. Just, just policy writing, I think, is one of the hardest things to do, actually, um, and to get it right. Um, the other question I've got, and it's really come back to Mr Lila, I'm just thinking about, I mean, it was interesting, I had been thinking about this whole issue of papakaianga, and, and clearly it's for you to decide how you might want to advance that. But as I read the plan provisions currently with the, the appendix and the comprehensive housing provision, Mr Lila, would that preclude an assessment of a papakaianga? If that's what the application was bought? I mean, is there already sufficient scope within the operative plan which would enable that anyway? Well, not enable it, but allow it to be considered. What we have brought forward is the comprehensive housing provisions which would enable that format um, through um, the process um, because it doesn't have the density rule. So you, you still need a resource consent, You're right, yeah. but it's a design process. Right. So I don't, I don't think it would preclude it at all. Right, so that, that was it. It's not precluded. It could be included. And clearly it's over to how you decide you might want to run that. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Just so I'm clear, um, in terms of designing that policy that's related to uh, tino ranga tiatanga, um, it might be useful for um, some of that to be both in te reo and in English uh, and expressing that. So. That's a bit of homework that I think Nati Kawata and Mr Lyle will need to follow through. It's fine. Thank you very much. Kia ora. All right, so now we're moving to uh, Tony Mill, who's the landscape architect. Mm -hmm. Now, Mr. Mill, we, I mean, I think we've got plenty of time, so I'll, I'll hand over to you to how you want to run this. But I, and I think you've already indicated, you know, you know, certainly between you and Mr. Um, Gubin, the, a lot of things have been resolved. Or, or the, the clear issues are in contention are between Ms. Stevens' evidence, and we sort of touched on some of those through legal submissions. So, I kind of within that frame, I think um, having been to the site and, and we think understanding the context and the landscape context. Um, I'll just let you take it from there. <coughs> sure. Thank you very much, sir. Um, I have the, a graphics package right. on the screen here, and it might be useful to, and it's part of the um, graphics bundle that uh, Mr. Marson passed around. It's not the, the complete bundle, but it's the graphic attachment to my evidence in chief. And I thought it would be useful to, to work through that package and just explain some of the things on those pages. Right. Um, as well as that, um, I've got a Google Earth model with the um, structure plan and the indicative master plan draped over that. Um, and if my Google Earth licence uh, allows me to do such, I can fly in and around it if that's going to be helpful. So we'll That would be see. great, because that was one that I couldn't open in mine because I don't have the licence to do it, so it would be great. No, I've just got my licence yesterday, so I'm <laughs> still, uh, I, I need a learner plate, I think. <laughs> um, in saying that, I have prepared a, a short three or four page I suppose it's an introduction, just to talk about landscape effects, um, values of the site, and where I see uh, the plan change ending. So if I can read that statement sure. for a start. That would be great. Now, is this something additional? And that's the one, could you please provide that to, um, to the administrator when you're Fish, at certainly some can. It's, it's handwritten notes at the, sm oh. uh, at the moment, but I can certainly provide that Thank you very as, much. as um, type text. Um, I start by saying I'll keep this um, relatively uh, succinct because as I believe, and as, as you've just pointed out, the issues uh, relating to landscape between me and, and Mr. Mr. Gervin uh, uh, are relatively settled, and he is in the room at the back here at the moment. Can I just ask Mr. Gervin, can Mr. Gervin come up? Because we may have questions for you at the same time. So. I think the key point is that the proposed plan change 28 will change the landscape character. There's, there's no doubt about that. Um, and in doing so, it changes the attributes of the site that combine to, to create landscape character. It will change in parts of the site more than other parts of the site. And in other parts of the site, it actually won't change at all. However, change itself is not an effect when we think about change in the, in the landscape. Landscapes are always changing. Values resulting from changes to landscape attributes. 
And as those values are given to the landscape, we need to understand how they originate and that combination of attributes that form those values that we're seeking um, through statutory provisions to retain, to maintain, to enhance, to protect. And they're all words that appear in the uh, RPS and, and the NRMP when it comes to, to landscape. Whatever or whether effects on the landscape values are appropriate will therefore depend on the nature and magnitude of effects on the existing landscape values and what is anticipated, as I mentioned, by the statutory provisions. Similarly, seeing something in the landscape is not itself an adverse effect. It is not the change in view that is an effect, but what changes are in terms of landscape values. So I just wanted to make that, that quite clear. I, you probably will understand that. Therefore, in regard to the change in effects is how the landscape values are being managed through the proposed plan change 28. From the outset, the design and the management of, those, um, of the landscape has been through a design and assessment process running in tandem. Just thought it useful to, to outline how that process has gone. And it's been, a, as, you've, as you can see by the team here, it's been a multidisciplinary process um, with experts feeding in from the start. The key landscape values of the plan, proposed plan change site are associated with the ridgeline and skyline of Kaka Hill, Botanical Hill, and the Malvern Hills. These values are primarily derived from landform, from the geographical location of these, and the role they play in both the physical and visual backdrop to Nelson City. Within Kaka Valley, and the Matahi, Mahitahi Valley landscape units of the site, key values are essentially associated with the Matahi River. But also the identified wetlands within the Kaka Valley, the Kaka Stream, although that is somewhat denuded in value, um, and the visually enclosed nature of the valley. And I think you mentioned before about the, some of the tranquility or, or peaceful aspects of that. Given the visually enclosed nature of the valley, it means that the, your visual, the views into it, are relatively limited as well. So that's a, that's a quality we need to be thinking or a value that we need to be um, considering when we consider the effects on the valley itself. Through the iterative design process, and I mentioned before that, um, or it has been alluded to, that um, Mr. Gervin and myself um, have had um, discussion not only through the joint witness uh, expert conferencing process, but also offline through meetings, um, whether they be in person or on Zoom, to work through the various issues that arose from the, uh, from the original structure plan and provisions. And I think we've worked through those pretty well. And what we have done is that I believe the proposed plan change can sympathetically or sympathetically respond to the key landscape features and values of the site. Yes, in parts, the composition of the backdrop will change. However, from a landscape perspective, it will not compromise, in my opinion, the sense of place of Nelson City as a whole. And I think it's important to consider that context as a whole. When one considers the plan change framework and the downstream planning and consenting requirements for subdivision development, the plan change provides I believe a comforting level of control relating to landscape and visual matters. I think, and I believe as commissioners, you can take a great deal of heart that the changes, and I call them changes and tweaks to the structure plan and the provisions through the process um, have resulted in, and sorry, I'm just repeating myself, in general agreement between myself uh, and Mr. Gervin that significant landscape, natural character, and visual effects can be avoided in the extent that enables the successful subdivision development within the context of Kaka Valley and the Bayview Ridgeline. And further to that, and just to conclude in this, this opening, um, this introduction, I believe also the indicative master plan um, that Mr. Nicholson will talk to shortly 
um, as it's appended to his rebuttal, um, gives a clearer picture of the overall vision for the proposed development enabled by Plan Change 28. It is a development where built form is enclosed and framed by the extensive green space of Kaka Hill, Botanical Hill and the Melvin Hills. Further to that, it also gives a gradation of urban density within the least sensitive areas on the site, the valley floor, through to a lower residential density on the more highly sensitive areas of the site. And once again, that will be set within a vegetated backdrop as well. To wrap up, when one considers the statutory provisions relating to landscape and visual matters, like Green Belt, Gateway, the Urban Rural Interface, Backdrop, Visual Amenity, and Nelson's unique sense of place, I believe the plan change provides a considered and comprehensive development opportunity that responds to the context of the landscape setting. So that was my wee introduction, okay. just sort of framing up uh, where I've got to in the, uh, since writing my rebuttal um, over my breakfast this morning. Um, I do have um, the graphic uh, attachment, attachment to my evidence on screen. I thought I'd just run through two or three key things on that, if that would just help. That would understand. help, and the other thing would be help, and I think Mr um, Marston has covered it, is when we do get to that, that area above um, Walter's Bluff where this idea of this restricted discretionary activity would be quite good to point that out. For sure. Yeah. Um, and I'm just hopefully looking for something that's going to allow me to... Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, look, just briefly, the site context. So it's showing the site in the context of of the, um, of the backdrop to Nelson City and its physical location. These are the landscape units that Mr. Marson was referring to before. Um, the site comprises, and these are landscape units as defined through the a suite of landscape, Nelson landscape studies undertaken by Boffer Miskell, 2015-2016. Mm -hmm. um, there are five units that our site, uh, or that lies within the site or touches the site. So Bot Botanical Hill, Melvin Hills, Kaka Valley, Kaka Hill, and the Maitahi, Mahitahi Valley. And that just touches um, the plan change site where the plan change touches the river, if that makes sense. Um, I think that's a really helpful uh, visual there to get that understanding of the landscape units. Um, and coming back, uh, sir, to your question about Walter's Bluff, and I'll get onto that in a, uh, in a photograph shortly, but the black line Oopsie-daisy. That black line there um, identifies the primary ridge line um, sitting above Walters Bluff, and that sits within the uh, Botanical Hill landscape unit. Thank you. I won't dwell on this for too long. However, a, um, a baseline context of what could happen under the, uh, or one possible outcome under the existing zoning. Now, the amended or, or updated, um, as I said earlier, the tweaked structure plan um, is laid over a uh, aerial photograph, which I think is really helpful for, mm -hmm. for understanding the lie of the land and why some of these areas are zoned different densities to, to others. Shall I take a minute just to walk through sure. this? Because I think it's, it's, it's really helpful. And Mr. Marston mentioned before about the area of residential that no longer uh, is here and it is now rural. That's on one of the knobbly knees, I think, Miss Stevens refers to in her landscape description of, of Kaka Hill. Um, there was an area of small holdings here that is now rural, and the residential, or the edge of that rural, rural zoning and the edge of the residential zoning has been refined following the work of, uh, or further field work of Mr. Robinson, terrestrial ecology, um, that has been refined to follow the edge of the existing um, vegetation pattern on site. So essentially the, the zoned, residential zoned areas here are on the, on the pasture land you can see on, on the site. Higher density obviously, and this hasn't changed <coughs> down on the flats and the less sensitive, a 400 square metre density here. And then as we move into the slightly more convoluted hill form of the east facing Melbourne Hills, and the backside of 
the Botanical Hill Landscape Unit. And just to, to be clear, the Botanical Hill Landscape Unit is all encompassing of this area, whereas you'll see or, or, or hear people offering, referring to Botanical Hill, which it is, is just where the centre of New Zealand is. Mm -hmm. But as a landscape unit, it, through the Nelson Landscape Studies, um, has picked up that, that hillside there. The, this end, the lower density residential on the hillside, that wraps and folds its way over a series of, of spurs mm -hmm. and, and gullies. It is not as steep in places as the upper reaches of the, of the Kaka Valley itself. So one of the reasons for having this in rural um, is, is through well, the steepness of the topography, but also ge geotechnical constraints as well. And from the uh, structure plan that was uh, submitted as part of the application, you'll note that the top end of this rural zoning and conversely the interface it has with the residential zoning, the lower density residential, is a lot more convoluted in its shape or in or its alignment. And once again, that is picking up on um, geotechnical uh, constraints. The key backdrop to, um, to Nelson City of the Botanical Hills protected in the, in the uh, open space recreation zone, as is one of the highest spots on the site on the Malvern Hill um, ridgeline. And then we have a series, oh, and then we have the lower density backdrop and skyline zone wrapping along here. And just to make it clear and to point out that that lower density alignment uh, and layout corresponds to the backdrop um, overlay from the Nelson Landscape Studies. There was a wee bit of confusion saying, well, we, we thought we made it easier. We were, from a landscape point of view, we were following that as a boundary, but then it became hard for people to decipher, decipher where that backdrop was. And obviously sitting within that backdrop is this subset of the skyline. So essentially where you have the road going along uh, south to north, that's on the, predominantly on the ridge line? That is predominantly on the ridge line, yes. And on site, um, and the series of photographs that have been um, included in, in all of the information to date, that ridge line is, is, quite, is quite broad mm -hmm. uh, in, in places as well, quite deceivingly broad when you view it from down, uh, down on the from the State Highway. What we have added, and what wasn't it part of the application structure plan, is a series of um, green overlays within the residential zone. And those green overlays correspond to the ge geotechnically constrained right. ground. Um, there are further ones that aren't shown on here, but further ones that have um, come up through further discussion with the geotechnical engineers. Um, I'm sure during the course of the hearing and post-hearing, um, they can be added if that is deemed the right thing to be done. These green overlay areas will sit over top of the residential overlay. They do not sit in open space recreation zone. Um, so therefore, they will be o these will be overlaid on, on people's properties. Um, they sit within Schedule X, um, X16, uh, along with the revegetation overlay on the rural land. The intention is, and this is in Schedule X as well, is that they will be 100% um, or species planted in there will be 100% native and they are from the planting pallets that are included in the schedule mm -hmm. at four, five and seven already. Right. The other amendments to the structure plan from the one that was um, submitted as part of the application is, the, is a secondary road connection coming from the Ridgeline Road down. It would run through what is current private property at the moment, but um, hook in with Davies Drive and a secondary road connection shown further up into Kaka Valley. So they've been added as part of the, um, part of the revisions. There have been some minor tweaks in terms of the alignment of the open space zone alongside the Karka stream um, in relation to the conferencing through the, um, the stormwater conferencing and the ecological conferencing. Um, I think 
in terms of changes or explaining the changes uh, to the structure plan that probably covers off most things. But can you identify the piece of land? I think I know the one which has now been sold. Yes, correct. That is this triangle just here. So if we take this line here, we take a straight line through there, that triangle of land is no longer part of the plan change site. Can I just clarify with Mr. Marson, is that now withdrawn from in terms of this plan change or is it yeah, still in? Yes, yeah. Because it's, it's kind of gone, partly it's going to this idea of what is the coastal environment as well, but you might, you might want to clarify that later. I know it's been sold, and is it no longer part and it's taken out? It's out. It's out. out. Okay, so the, the boundaries will get redrawn in, the, in, a, in a final yep. structure plan. Great, thank you. That is the proposed structure plan. I won't talk to that without, uh, without the um, aerial underlay. Uh, the proposed structure plan landscape overlay the change to this plan um, is primarily the addition of the identifying the primary ridge line above Walters Bluff. I won't dwell on the pros, proposed zone plans. I think they are self-evident or self-explanatory. What I'd like to just talk to briefly is the indicative Denny's Hole interface plan. A question arose about that before. Um, Denny's Hole, in this plan, uh, we prepared working with the ecology team and Mr. Rob Greenaway in terms of recreation trails and so forth. Um, and what it shows and this is Denny's Hole here, which can be accessed on the true uh, right bank or the true left bank. There is a, a couple of seats sitting here, tranquil swimming hole. Um, the res residential area is shown here in red, and you can see the offsets of 80 to 66, um, or sorry, 66 to 80 metres through this stretch here. That has since further been pushed back following um, further input from uh, in terms of flooding requirements and I think this now sits at around about 120 metres setback but the point being is there's quite a, a big setback between the interface of the Maitahi River and Denny's Hole um, and the res residential zone of the, of the plan change and between that setback is the proposed open space recreation corridor uh, that includes the realigned carcass stream and the realigned carcass stream. Mm. And Where does the carcass stream currently go? Yeah, for sure. So the carcass stream currently. Yeah, let's get. Sorry. Runs approximately through here and down back along into here. Probably picked up best on an aerial, but. It's quite straight in, in blue, blue, fact. Blue keep going, keep going, keep going there. Yeah, sorry. There, yeah. And then... Yep, yeah, sorry. Just through here and then back up. And then it pretty much runs straight down across through into here. And the proposed realignment is tucked along the, the bottom or the toe of the existing bank here mm -hmm. on the site. Mm -hmm. And that toe... Um, or the existing bank, let's call it a bank, um, has quite a semi to mature cover of, of, of native bush. There's some exotic in there as well, um, which will provide um, immediate benefit in terms of um, shading and so forth to that, that real life stream. And it would still flow to Maitai and it's, and, it's, and it meets the Maitai exactly, exactly, the exactly in the same place in the corner there. Mm -hmm. Mr. Marson uh, mentioned before about the opportunity for planting through in, in this zone here, um, and there's certainly, as indicated on this plan, um, the provision for, for planting through here. That will not only provide ecological benefit, but will provide a visual, um, I suppose, backdrop or a visual interface, planted visual interface between the, the cricket ground, the river, and the plan change site. This plan here, moving on, um, uh, just shows the cross-section locations, and I won't um, 
expand too much further on that. However, I think it's fairly obvious that these locations, these lines through here, indicate where the following uh, cross sections have been taken. And these are indicative cross sections. Mm -hmm. They were prepared once again to help inform those assessing the plan change. But indicative cross sections working with the ecology team and with the uh, infrastructure team in terms of, in terms of flooding um, and stormwater best practice, stormwater management, and the sections show the riparian margin, the open space, open space zone relative to the residential zone, and in time, what a vegetated outcome would look like following the plant pellets that are included in the schedule. We start to explain them. Section A starts at the upper end of the Kaka stream. And as we go through the numbers, we get down to the interface with the Mai Tahi River. I imagine there are tui flying uh, underneath the wetland there on section eight, eight change. The, these are the cross sections that were appended to my graphic attachment. Um, these cross sections have been updated and appended to my rebuttal evidence. Um, <coughs> that was following comments from Mr. Gervin. Um, and the main changes have been the addition of or, or stretching these two cross sections to include the residential zone in the high density area, just to give that a, a full understanding of what the, uh, that distance or that space was in relation to the level of the um, residential zone. And those cross sections are included, the graphic attachment to my rebuttal, but oh. also in the graphic uh, bundle as supplied by Mr. Marson. Through the joint witness mm -hmm. conferencing uh, and in my evidence, I have covered off um, earthworks or earthworks from a landscape perspective, um, what one might expect earthworks over time. This is an indicative earthworks plan prepared for the uh, indicative collector road. Um, it is a, a first cut. It is by no means uh, a finished version. In fact, the road may not quite be aligned when it goes through a full engineering process, mm -hmm. um, as the alignment shown here, but <coughs> it demonstrated the extent at a very conservative, a one to two grade batters, the extent of some of those earthworks that could be expected with the, uh, with the road. Um, I suggest that to understand earthworks better, um, a visit to the Bayview site, currently under construction, mm -hmm. um, and viewing some of those batters there, which, uh, as I understand it, uh, 1.5 to 1 or 2 to 1, so the complete opposite to this, um, have been successfully completed, undertaken, uh, revegetated through grass um, hydro seeding. I understand a lot of the hydro seeding was done by helicopter, and there is obviously, uh, not obviously, but there is native uh, revegetation in places on those slopes as well. plan showing in uh, photo viewpoints. And what we have done, and that was the same plan that was included in the original yeah. information um, as part of the plan change request. What we have done, what we have done on the following photo viewpoints, um, which doesn't include all of the photo viewpoints in the original landscape and visual assessment, is try to depict from these locations where some of the zoning will be on that, just to help the understanding the zoning on the, on the landform from those, from those photo viewpoints. Um, this was done through uh, overlaying it on a 3D model on the computer. Um, and you'll note that some of the colours don't appear as the same on the, on the structure plan because when we've overlaid a green overlay colour, they come up different on a residential colour as compared to a rural colour or something similar. But I believe the following photos um, and I won't go through all of them, but the following photos give a, a pretty good representation of just the different zones that will be visible from those photo, photo viewpoints. If we move to
Just above, or just right behind that 50k zone sign is what we're referring to as the Walter, as Walters Bluff mm -hmm. and, and the, and the uh, residential development associated with Walters Bluff. <coughs> and the primary ridge line that's now being identified is this ridge line that is running down, down here. Um, and the photo below it is this part of that botanical, oh, gosh, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, It is that part of the um, botanical hill landscape form there. So that's the area um, where I have agreed, or recently agreed with Mr. Gervin, that uh, res re restricted discretionary activity mm -hmm. um, within the backdrop and skyline area um, is, is appropriate to manage potential effects on that on that skyline. <coughs> Um, that was my explanation of the of the of the graphic attachment. Thank you. Hopefully, that's that's helpful. Assisted. Or no, it's clarified. very helpful. As I said, we went on a com on a comprehensive site visit, and, and um, so all those areas that you're showing us are quite familiar. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I am happy to Good. answer any Appreciate. questions okay. you right. have of my evidence. Mr. Bell. Um, the indicative earthworks plan you said was based on a conservative one on two slope? Yes. So it's conservative in the views of, um, of who? It isn't conservative in the views of, um, of myself in viewing the, um, the earthworks uh, under, being undertaken at the moment at, at Bayview, but also I undertook that site visit to Bayview with. Um, with Mr. Foley, right. from, so, from Tonga so and Taylor, Mr. So Foley through, agrees with that through one discussions. As well. yeah. yeah, through yeah. discussions with with, yeah. with Mr. Foley, that is, um, yeah, and, and in my opinion, do you know? I mean, there has been some um, discussion in the in the evidence about that the the top soil or the or the soil fine grain soil is relatively shallow over the rock. Have you can you make any comment on that in terms of your, your assumptions that were used in that graphic? No, I, I uh, yes, I understand those, and I've been part of those discussions, or I've been told about shallow rock and so forth. Mm. The graf that graphic wasn't prepared by, mys by myself. Um, right. That, that graphic was prepared by um, engineers. Right. Which so, I've included. So who, who did prepare it, do you know? Um, yes, um, land dimensions. Um, but but it, it was, so it was based on Information that you gave them. It was yep. Yeah, so they've 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 prepared it in, yeah. in part of their brief to look at the indicative to, to make sure that that road that collector road can work yeah. from the valley floor to the ridge line. With input from you and Mr. Foley regarding the no that the slope. no sorry that no. input hasn't hap that in further input hasn't happened. That was the plan that they have prepared. It is yet to go through rigorous further input and the like. It was purely to, to inform a position at the but, moment. But one of the criteria that they were given on making the plan was the one on two slope. That is, is the, that right? That, that is the better that they chose. They chose? Yes. Based on discussion with you? No, not with me, no. No, no, I've, no, no. So they made the plan based on, where did they get the one on two from? Uh, that is, that is a conservative estimate they've used or a conservative batter they've used. Can I just step in here? Is there another technical witness here who can answer that question? Because, I mean, this is a let, excepting Mr. Foley right, might, might be better if Mr. Foley comes forward and if he can answer those questions. I mean, I accept you're a landscape architect. Yes. Um, I understand the question, but we, um, but we'll, does Mr. Foley want to make a comment now or do we? Now, so could you just repeat the question? I wasn't able to hear very clearly from the back. So my question is the um, indicative earthworks plan. Mr Milne said that that was based on a conservative batter of one on two. And my question is who said that was conservative? And then he, he firstly said, well, that was, he 
worked that out. My understanding of what he said was he worked that out um, with, with you and him looking at other sites. And then I'm a bit confused, and I don't mean to be pedantic here, but I'm just trying to find out what went into the, what the assumptions were for this plan. And then he said that the people who did the mapping used the one on two. So can you shed uh, some light okay, on that, please? OK. Um, <clears throat> I think the development of the Earthworks plan to date has been um, conceptual at an early stage because the things, are, things are moving and fluid. Um, I have worked with uh, Land Dimensions a number of months ago when we gave them some indications of, of the kind of range of slopes that they could consider. We haven't, I haven't gone back and specifically reviewed that plan. However, I did take uh, Mr Milne up to one of the subdivisions in Nelson um, to help inform him on the what we do here. And a one and two slope is a, is a relatively conservative slope with regards to stability. And we apply that in a lot of Nelson slopes where the ground is actually quite weak, a lot weaker than the ground is up there. It's the softer, more younger rocks. And a one and two slope allows topsoil to go back on it. I also um, showed Mr Milne some slopes where we had engineered slopes at a one and a half to one angle, um, which had been able to be merged into the existing ground profile so that they would not um, be visually obvious as, as a slope, and they can be grassed as well. Um, and I note that in the Kaka Valley, where we've got very hard rock, the natural slopes up there are typically above 30 degrees to 35 degrees, and, and it's, it's quite feasible to engineer slopes to those angles, or more conservatively, to flatter angles. Thanks very much. And wh while you're here, um, I also had a question um, regarding uh, the, the expected thickness of fine-grained soil over the rock, and that, I understand from your evidence is relatively thin. <clears throat> it, it, it varies, and when we talk about relatively fine grain, there, there's quite a continuum there. Um, the soils are a mixture of gravels and sands and silts, and probably not so much clay in, in the case up there, but a small amount in places. Um, the cover of that soil varies on the steeper slopes perhaps from half a metre and it might go up to two metres in, in many cases. It's not much greater than that at all. OK, thanks very much. Mr Milne, it's back to me. Um, a couple of sort of higher level questions um, and it's really in relation to Ms Stevens' evidence. Ms Stevens and her evidence essentially says your starting point was wrong where you had started with the idea that this land was tagged for urban development and therefore your whole assessment is framed in that context. Do you want to make a comment on that? Yes indeed. Um, I don't think, uh, I don't agree with that. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that there was a study done um, assessing the capacity of the valley um, was one item that we considered uh, in, our, in our assessment. So it certainly was not the starting point. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. That's, that's helpful again, because we'll need to put that question back to Ms Stevens. Um, there's this, uh, the other question, have you, have you managed to have any other, you know, you were talking with, you've been talking to Mr Gervin in the expert conferencing and offline. Have you had any further conversations with Ms Stevens? No, I, no, I haven't, had, right, okay. uh, haven't had any conversations. So the whole Stephen. issue of um, the coastal environment, do you just want to step us through? I think Mr. you and Mr. Gervin essentially agree, and Miss Stephen doesn't. Um, so your view about, in terms of this landscape context, about whether it is within the coastal environment or not, from a landscape perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, look, I've been guided. Look, when, when we started the project, um, helpfully, I believe, um, there were a number of landscape studies that have been recently done. Um, so that was our starting point. Um, the Boffa Miskel, um, natural character mm. assessment of the coast. Uh, it's 165 odd pages, I think. It's very comprehensive. Um, I read that. Um, I read it, not every single page, but <laughs> I read a, a good part of it. Um, and particularly the area that, um, or the, the area of coastline um, that was assessed relative to the site. Um, having read their methodology, having um, read the position they got to, uh, reviewed the line of what they term the coastal character line, um, which 
runs below our site, apart from, or below the plan change site, I was to say, apart from that corner, which we've now established isn't part of the site. Um, I was, from a landscape professional point of view, um, comfortable with where that line was. Interestingly enough, that line was further back from where it mm. was previously. Um, and in their conclusions, they were essentially saying that this was an area of transition in terms of landscape. Uh, natural character uh, wasn't high, you know, wasn't wasn't high enough beyond beyond the site. Um, however, one of the key reasons for for the location of that line was the fact that a lot of the the key coastal processes were happening on the other side of the boulder bank. Um, yes, mm -hmm. we then have the haven as well. But when we think about coastal processes, tide um, tide moving in waves, so forth. Yes, tide comes into the haven, but when you think about wave action and so forth. So it was dislocating, um, and that was one of the reasons um, driving their alignment. Right. Um, in the cross section, they have, then have a, uh, an area C, which they call coastal context. And so it's outside of that coastal environment, but it still has a coastal context. Um, and entirely comfortable with that. They are C facing hill slopes. Um, and and so they, they sit in that coastal con. Thank you, that's fine. That, re that reflects your evidence. Mr. Do you have, you have no disagreement with that, do you, or do you? Um, yeah, no, I wasn't the author of that study, yes. but I agree with that line. I guess just to add to that, one of the, it was um, in accordance with NZCPS policy one, and one C talks about influences, processes, mm. or qualities being significant. And give, in that context, we've got, um, residential development that sits beyond Nelson Haven, so there's a, there's a um, justification for why the influences, processes, qualities are reduced there, and beyond that it's still part of the coastal context, but there's a, there's a point where those, where, what Mr Milne was saying, that those qualities um, reduce. Thank you, that's helpful. So, I mean, there's, just, there's clearly just a difference of opinion. Mm -hmm. If we determined that part of the site was within the coastal environment, from your perspective, what difference does it make? in the sense of, of a landscape assessment, and I'm, I'm really reflecting on what the NZCPS says, which is about preserving natural character from inappropriate subdivision use and development. Also looking at you know section six matters, which talks about outstanding, and I think all the experts agree that there is no outstanding natural yeah. landscape or natural region. So if we determined part of that site was within the coastal environment, would it make any substantial difference to your assessment? I think I would, um, depending on what parts of that site, I would need to um, assess that again because right. I haven't I haven't assessed it in, in that context. Right. So your view is it's not. So you have, not. Mr. Gibbon, do you have a position on or view um, on that? I, I guess the other thing that study does is look at the level of natural character within mm -hmm. that context, yeah. and that study defines that part of Nelson having a low to moderate level of Nelson, uh, natural character. So I guess in terms of the outcomes, it would be looking at maintaining that level of natural character. So what we're talking about is a level of development with some vegetation. So I think you would, if it was considered to be part of the coastal environment, that's the level of natural character you'd be looking to maintain. Okay. And I have considered that mm. and I'm comfortable with where that would fall in terms of what you would describe as low, moderate natural character. Thank you for that. that that's helpful. Thank you very much. Turning to this issue again, I think where there's just a disagreement between you and Ms Stevens and, and I think a disagreement with Mr Gervin around <coughs> this significant landscape and the Karka Valley versus the stream. And, and, and I think you both characterise Ms Stevens as misinterpreting the study that had been done. Do you just want to step us through that and, 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 and what I'm saying to you, and I think Mr Marston covered, is correct. You, you, you say it, what is significant is the the uh, Mai Tai and the Kaka stream, not the Kaka stream, the, the, you tell me. Yeah, yeah, so the, so the significant, from my interpretation and then my own assessment, it is this, the uh, Mai Tai, Mai Tahi River is the significant okay. feature. Um, as you go through the Boffa School landscape studies, um, they, and when I say studies in plural, because there were three, um, well, um, one was a finalisation of the, of the previous draft and, and one was a uh, more of a visual amenity study. Um, when you go through the, uh, the Boffa Miscal Landscape Studies, they identify uh, identifies um, five outstanding natural landscapes. Um, then there was a discussion around about 
whether there should be a category called significant landscape or significant features. Um, and these don't qualify through their methodology in terms of being outstanding. However, they are somewhat more than just a character area. Um, bearing in mind that we have the landscape overlays on the site in terms of the backdrop and the skyline being areas identified as having higher value than the rest of the site. Um, and there were three significant landscape or landscape features identified in those studies, in those sweeter studies. One was the uh, Maitahi River, one was Tahunanui Beach, and the other was Nelson Haven. Um, we've been through, um, as part of work following on from the expert conferencing, undertaken a, a, a natural character assessment um, of both the part of the Maitahi River where it touches um, because it does go into the PPC 28 site at one point through erosion um, and in the Kaka stream. So coming back to the, to the significant landscape feature, that is my understanding of it through my review of the, of the Boffer Miskal studies. Mm -hmm. Mr. Gubin, you disagree? Yeah, I yeah, completely right. agree. Okay. I, yeah, I, the only thing I'd add to that, we, the, the first part of the study was a landscape, there were, there were three parts yeah, to it. Yeah. The first part was a landscape character yeah. area assessment and that identifies there was 32 landscape character areas across yeah. the region. Having understood that we then looked inside those character areas to see where the important landscapes were and it's through that process um, that the outstanding natural landscapes were identified and the significant landscapes and they were subsequently mapped in terms of where they fell. Yeah. Um, so the, it was the Mai Tai River that was mapped which sits within the Mai Tai landscape <coughs> character area. So I think that's an important thing is landscape right, character yeah. areas and they mm. define the character of the entire region. Within those, there's the important landscapes, and the Maito River landscape was one of them. This might be an unfair question, and, and, and don't answer it. I mean, I'm just thinking, if both of you have come to that view, what, d is it unclear that, that Miss Stevens would interpret it that way, you know, or is it open to interpretation? I don't want to put words in her mouth, but I'll ask you the question. Is it just that she has read it differently than the way that both of you have? Look, she possibly just has, has read it differently, yeah. Okay, so I'll ask... I'll, I'll yeah, you'll ask me. Yeah. Um, just two other issues. Just turning to the issue of gateway, again, because Ms. Jeff and her legal submissions has, has addressed that in some detail, and, and clearly Ms. Stevens has covered the gateway issue and, and clearly sees that as a, a, a really significant issue here. Mr. Marson's covered it, in it, and your evidence has covered it. Is there anything else you want to add in terms of gateway? I, I think the issue that you said is that essentially the viewing audience, certainly at ground level, at road level, is very limited and therefore it doesn't form a gateway or there is no defined gateway. Do you want to make a comment on your view of gateway? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to make a comment and, <laughs> and, and I might um, go off on a tangent um, because I'm quite interested in gateways, um, as you probably picked up on my rebuttal evidence. Um, and as landscape architects, I think we're very interested in that transition between edges and along edges and spaces and interfaces. Um, as a child, I thought the gateway to Nelson was the top of the Spooner Range. You might have read my rebuttal evidence. Um, and I probably still do. I still get excited when I go over there. Coming back to the site, um, and, and gateway is, it's an interesting one. Um, one, you've got a really defined edge to a city and and, and often a, a, a defined edge can be through, a, let's say, a major river or, or, or a very significant landform, and, and you, you get that feeling of entrance um, and passing through. Um, I can understand, and, and certainly there is some um, objective and policy direction in the RPS and in RMP, where gateways mentioned a couple of times, but also just that urban rural interface or that, or that city edge. Um, and particularly leading into, into Green Belt without wanting to confuse things too much more. But when one rounds the, the edge of Botanical Hill there, um, and I suppose the throat of the Mai Tai River with Shaland on the other side, and this is where uh, Miss Stephen is, is pitching the, the gateway. Um, I still get, from, from a landscape experience point of view, there are still elements of a city further in to the valley. It's not a clear-cut gateway as far as I'm concerned. Um, you've got a finger um, of, of urban along Mill Street reaching out to Denby Park. Mm -hmm. 
Um, we've got recreation facilities that often associated with within a city and, and uh, in a city form as well. When we get to Rolfine Way and we get to Karka Hill, with Karka Hill being a lot higher than Botanical and the Malvern Hills, um, to my mind, and, and we've got, there's a cluster of seven, seven houses um, or so there, so we've still got these wee hangers on to the edge of the city. Um, I think a clearer gateway, and, and this is something like the plan change Post plan change from that probably does, is it actually resets that gateway to the toe of Karka um, and appropriately it sets it from a landform context where we're, all of a sudden we're up, we've got higher landform either side. We, we narrow at that point again in the valley before you then go around the bend, Charlins okay. Bridge, and, and, the, and the valley gets a lot narrow, narrower. Um, so, in terms of gateway, I believe there's not a clear defined gateway. I understand the direction from a statutory provisions point of view about that clear edge. And in some ways, and I did cover this in, in my rebuttal mm -hmm. as well, is that that idea that we can also um, water down that edge experience between urban and rural. And, 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 I, and, and in my opinion, the, the small holdings does, does that a little bit on the site because it, it's neither urban or completely rural, so it was somewhere in between. Um, so edges are really interesting. Um, I told you it might have been a relatively long answer to your short question no, about that, gateways. That's helpful. Thing. And again, just Mr Gurman, do you have any disagreement or do you have a different view? I, I, I essentially have got no disagreement, um, I guess in terms of the gateway issue. I think probably the other thing I'd add there is, the, the and we looked at this with the capacity of the site study which no. I was involved with, is how how, how contained the valley is, um, which comes into that kind of gateway consideration. So, kind of the prominence from the road is one of the things to take into account. And I and I do agree that there is there is a level of containment from the road that assists, kind of I guess the separation, if you like, from a from a gateway experience. So um, I think. Can I just further add to that to sort of round off? I think the, the last part of your question, sir, was. Um, Gateways, I think, are experienced on the ground, you know, at, at ground level. Uh, hard to experience a gateway from an elevated point of view because you get a much wider, um, unless you're looking down on a structure that sings out that that is a gateway. Um, so when you um, take an elevated view to a gateway and say in this location, all of a sudden you're taking a, a, a lot more landscape uh, in, into that view. Um, yeah, thank you. The final question I've got, um, relates to Karka Hill and the d discussion we're having earlier about the regional policy statement which clearly talks about avoiding development on those ridge lines and the backdrop and all those sort of things and this whole idea, the way the plan change was notified, be prohibited activities, the, the planners I think, or certainly Ms Sweetman and um, Mr Lyle have talked about non-complying activity with a, a policy basis and I don't expect you to get into the planning argument but what, and we've taught, heard Mr Toya talk about what the aspirations are for Ngāti Kuata. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's the sort of the absorption capacity in your, and I'll come to Mr Goodman the same question, on Kaka Hill? I mean, could, could, could it absorb some, and I'll just use the word sensitive development? What, what's your view on that? Um, yes, I believe it can absorb some sensitive development, and that would be down near the, um, let's say, down near the toe of it. Right. Um, uh, I think the key area for Karka Hill is obviously the um, the backdrop overlay in the skyline overlay area, and that. So they are the most sensitive parts of Kar Karka Hill. Um, there is, yeah, the ability for the hill outside of those areas to absorb some right. development. Thank you, mm -hmm. Mr. Gervin. Yeah, I, I guess I'm, I'd, I'd fall in a similar place for that. Definitely the most sensitive parts are the skyline and the backdrop, and they've been mapped accordingly. Right. Um, in terms of yeah, anything that would occur within that, it would need to be sensitive, and um, yeah, the gearing would need to reflect that. But it's not, it's, yeah, there's a, it's, there, there would be care required and considerable care to ensure that was, the, that was appropriate. Thank you for that. Thank you very much. Well, that was, do you have any follow up questions for? Uh, not really, but um, I guess that last conversation really um, reflects 
the appendix to the resource management plan, which talks about Karkahill being part of a prominent coastal ridge line, so hence the need for that sensitivity. So, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Milne. Thank Thank you very you. much. Um, Mr. Marston, I mean, it's 10 to 1, and I'm wondering if we should take the lunch break now. I think we're actually ahead of the schedule, aren't we? Um, yeah. I think we are. So um, if we take the lunch break now, well, then we, we come back with Mr. Nicholson, Urban Design, and then there's Mr. Parsonson and Mr. Greenaway, the, all the witnesses that we're going to be to, here today. Um, so it's 10 to 1, so um, we'll, we'll come back at, at, let's just say, quarter to 2, 55 minutes. Is that sufficient for you to get lunch? Okay, Thank great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Adam. We were adjourned until then.
Is that working? Yes. Yes. Great. Kia ora koutou. Um, my name is Hugh Nicholson. So I'm the urban designer for the applicant. Um, now I'm just going to see if I can get a... Um, I'll just do a, um, a, just a, a summary of my evidence and then I'll run through some graphic attachments for us to um, discuss a bit further. Um, so Mr McIndoe and I agree that the site is a suitable location for urban growth and development due to its proximity to Central Nelson and the improved transport connections provided to Waters Bluff and Bayview Road through the structure plan. Mr McIndoe and I also agree that the design approach embodied in PPC 28 of locating more intensive development on the valley floor, closer to the city centre, and limiting densities on the hill slopes and ridge lines to reduce visual impact and adverse effects is appropriate. Both Mr McIndoe and myself consider that with planned, the planned connections to Waters Bluff and Bayview Road, the urban development of PPC 28 area, as shown in the structure plan, to be refined, will achieve a well-functioning urban environment and give effect to the NPSUD policy one from an urban design perspective. The existing urban form of Nelson consists of a linear strip of intensive urban development along the coastline between the Tasman Bay and the foothills of the Richmond Range. There are ribbons of urban development in some of the adjacent valley floors and clusters of low, lower density housing on the hills often enclosed by bush. In my opinion, the urban form proposed by PPC 28 complements the existing urban form of Nelson and would create a new neighbourhood centred in the, in the Kaka Valley with lower density development along the Malvern Hills. The structure plan has been refined with a green framework that includes open space zoning, <coughs> neighbourhood reserves and revegetation overlays. This green framework encloses and shapes the proposed urban development and will provide ecological, health and recreational benefits for future residents and the wider public. Mr Milne and myself, in conjunction with the applicant's wider team, have prepared an indicative master plan of the proposed development, which can also be viewed on a Google Earth model. The indicative master plan outlines one possible development scenario based on the planning provisions in PPC 28. The indicative master plan has helped to refine the proposed structure plan and planning provisions and demonstrates that the planning provisions enable good urban design outcomes. I consider that the planning framework in PPC 28 and the NRMP is suitably robust and comprehensive to both enable and require good urban design outcomes. I note that Mr McIndoe agrees with me subject to further refinement of the structure plan. I agree, and I've just um, outlined some potential changes to the structure plan, um, really just um, based on some discussion since the, the master plan has been developed. I agree with Mr McIndoe that the proposed suburban commercial centre <coughs> would be better located at the intersection of the primary road and a secondary road leading up the Kaka Valley to encourage more passing traffic and to improve commercial viability. Um, there is on the, there, that is shown on the indicative master plan and, um, and suggests that's, that change is made to the structure plan also. As part of the development of the indicative master plan, additional areas on the Malvern Hills have been identified as unsuitable for building due to the geotechnical constraints. As Mr Milne mentioned, these additional areas will be included in the residential green overlay on the structure plan, providing a more comprehensive green layer. I agree with Mr McIndoe that the new indicative road along the Karka stream could be amended to more precisely indicate the location of the secondary road adjacent to the proposed neighbourhood and Esplanade reserves in order to provide better public access and positive septet outcomes. And note these alignments are demonstrated in the indicative master plan. In terms of the alignment of the lower Kaka stream, I note that the rationale for realigning the lower Kaka stream has been questioned by some council experts. If the ecological considerations of realignment or retention of the stream in its current location are equal, I consider there are urban amenity related benefits arising from the relocation of the stream. I agree with Mr McIndoe that the urban amenity related benefits include improved sunlight access and a better aspect for houses resulting from locating the dwellings further away from the, from the hills with an outlook over the stream to the west. 
While I acknowledge the potential benefits of retaining a natural feature within an urban development, I consider that retaining the stream in its current location <coughs> could potentially create a degree of severance between communities on either side of the stream, depending on the number and location of bridges and the treatment of the riparian corridor. In my opinion, the relocation of the stream would retain access to the natural feature while reducing the degree of potential severance by locating the stream at the base of the hill slopes and reducing the length of the potential barrier. In terms of shading, some submitters have questioned the suitability of the Kaka Valley for residential development, considering it to be cold, shady, cold and damp. Mr Mackendo, in his urban design review of submissions, reviewed the sunlight access for the higher density residential areas and concluded that they would have reasonable access to sunlight. I agree with his conclusions. I've overlaid the shading diagrams for midwinter on the indicative master plan in order to review the potential shading effects. Any potential residential sections which would be completely shaded and receive less than three hours of sunlight at midwinter have been removed from the master plan. I note that most sections receive significantly more hours of sunlight at midwinter. In my opinion, the residential areas shown on the indicative master plan would have a reasonable access to sunlight. And then I'm just going to um, um, talk through some of the graphic attachments, if that's okay. Sure. Um, so this um, image is the indicative master plan, and look, I'd stress that um, you know we've done our best to to work out how the provisions of the of the in RMP and the PPC 28 would be applied. But obviously, everything here will be subject to a resource consent, you know, for subdivision and or you know, comprehensive development, and would, you know, not necessarily appear exactly like this. I'd also note there are possibly some infrastructure constraints that came to light. You know, we can't be sure exactly how they'll pan out. This is, we think, a feasible scenario, but it may not be what turns out exactly. <coughs> Just on um, that, that's completely understood. Well, I mean, we completely understand a, a master plan is an idea, um, <clears throat> and the structure plan is a step on from that, and then the resource consent process is a step on from that. So it's very useful to have this, though, I have to say. Yeah. <coughs> so um, if I just... Um, so this is the kind of... The, this area on the, on the base of the valley floor, we envisage is likely to be a comprehensive um, um, housing um, development area. Um, so... Look, I've drawn something of, you know, an appropriate kind of density there, but I'm aware Mr Lyle behind me keeps looking at me and rolling his eyes and saying, you know, why don't you do something imaginative and exciting? And I say, well, that's the next stage of, you know, that's, that, that hopefully will happen. So that is obviously the highest density down here. And then we see some more higher density on these very lower slopes here and further up the valley and, and around here. Um, and... And equally, um, we see a, you know, a little bit more density sort of creeping in you know, on, the, on the hill slope, the lower hill slopes on this side of the ridge to the north. Um, the um, commercial centre is now kind of located down, down here on two sides of the road. It doesn't show up very well, sorry, on this particular image, but um, yeah, on two sides of the road with the neighbourhood reserve on the third side. Um, Look, again, this is likely to change, but I guess what we're reflecting is, you know, the sensible suggestions by Mr McIndoe that it's at the intersection of the two roads and that also it has a positive aspect to the west or the north in order to make for attractive shop fronts, you know, for you know, tables and chairs outside. Um, the neighbourhood reserve here um, has a, you know, a road running along, right along that frontage there, the positive, and the... Oh, Um, and this, and this, the road further up here is, is adjacent to the Esplanade Reserve, providing positive, you know, public access and septed outcomes. Um, we've shown some sections through here, coming off the end of Pierce's Way, I think. So a little road, you know. Um, um, up from Waters Bluff, getting access, you know, there's a little cul-de-sac there. So, um, and, um, and then obviously the connection through to Waters Bluff here and along to Bayview Road up here. So this slide is just my kind of abstraction of where the green, you know, the revegetation would be, 
I mean, I think that you know a really positive part of this proposal is the extent to which we're seeing a really strong green framework, you know, and, um, and as well as um, housing development. Um, this um, and oh, sorry, using the wrong button. This you know the rural area with the, with the rural uh, with the overlays, rural and residential overlays with the revegetation required and the open space zoning. I don't think it's possible for me to drive the Google Earth app from here. Um, we had a little bit of a talk about it, but I don't have enough controls here to, to run that. So what I've done is just taken a few screenshots to try and give you, you know, some of the one or two important views from my perspective. We can certainly arrange for you to view it at another time. So this is a view from the west, looking down on the on the valley, um, and really I put it in just to, so you could see it in the context of Nelson, and you can see the strip of urban development along the along the coast the coastline. Um, and on the escarpment of the Malvern Hills, you know, is, is, there's quite a lot of development there already. Um, and you can see the valley developments up the Maitahi Ma, Ma, and um, up the Brook Valleys, you know, um, just little ribbons of development running up. And, and to my mind, this is potentially another extension of that kind of ribbon development heading up in the valley floors. I just want to point out on there where the current Bayview development is, that's been mentioned a couple of times. Ah, oh, yeah, that is this set of earthworks over here. So that's extending the, the development along the escarpment. You know, you can see this is all developed on the hillsides here, and it's extending it along through this area here. And potentially, you know, the, the connection to Bayview Road is just in, in here, run, then running along the ridge. <coughs> yeah. Um, and I think this view also demonstrates the significance of the Kaka Hill um, uh, as a you know a landscape feature um, in the in the in the background over here. So I included this view really just to emphasise the importance of the botanical hill kind of um, uh, botanical reserve. Um, you know, strip of landscape around the around the foreground, and Karka Hill in the background, and then this south east facing slope of the Malvern Hills. And I think you can see the you know the strength of those um, um, features, you know, particularly with vegetation on them, and um, and how the development kind of you know works in and around that, respecting those um, um, beneficially. And this final view is from the north, and really it kind of gives you a view of this development along the Malvern Hills Escarpment, you know, the extension of it, you know, along the ridge top. And I think the important thing to note there is the sections we're showing along the ridge top, those green um, sections, are in the order of you know 1,500 square metres, 20% of you know, with 20% revegetation, notionally shown, um, and 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 that we're achieving. Um, um, ecological connections through those those um, the overlay across the ridge and into the um, towards the the um, Kaka Valley. And I think that's probably I've got some you know images of shading if you want to have a look. But um, um, well, I'm open to your direction. Happy to answer questions. Thank you. And, we, and the shading diagrams we've got, which were attached to your rebuttal, I think. Was. Yes. Um, Mr. Mark Brown, do you have questions? Or just end up with you? Good afternoon, Mr. Nicholson. Um, just that last one about the ecological corridors going across. I, I know that from my reading of all this information, there was some comment by a, a submitter or perhaps a council expert that in the past has been a desire for those ecological corridors across there. And I guess my reading of it, when you look at the uh, vegetation overlay, is they go up the, up the valley, but you're saying they go across the ridge as well. Can, can you just perhaps show how that's going to happen? Is that from that vegetation overlay plan? I have, look, I'm, and I apologise because this plan is a little bit out of date. Um, on the, um, these areas, on particularly on this um, yeah. uh, western slope, um, the, the overlay have expanded, you know, the, due to the geotechnical advice. And on the indicative master plan, we've started to indicate a link here, you know, just so across that the ridge, right across the ridge, and a second link here across the ridge. Um, so um, 
Look, it's it's you know that that's we think that's beneficial. Um, I can show you in the master plan as well. I think you can probably start to see them just in here and across here. Um, so that's we've 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 included those at the stage on the on the indicative master plan and um, and that's a discussion as to whether they get included on the structure plan as well, to a greater extent than they're already shown. There is a short gap at the yes, moment. Well, yeah, I guess that's that's perhaps my point is if if you think they're a good idea, how how are they going to be ensured that they occur? Because as you've said, the master plan's indicative, hmm. so it's just that next step. Is that a question for Mr. Lyle? I think that's probably a question for Mr. Lyle. But My you, advice. You're saying there should be at least two. Are you saying there should be? I you think, think? You, I think there are experts who are a better place to give yeah. you that advice. Some sure. ecological experts. It's more of an that. ecological um, question. I think so. Okay. Yes. Um, and the extent to what extent you know there a gap? You know how large a gap is is would be advisable from an ecological point of view. I am aware that some ecologists talk about you know cluster you know um, what do they call them? Um, it would be clusters, you know, like little you know, pockets, and birds can fly from one to the next yeah, yeah. rather than a continuous strip. So they may, the ecologist may advise us that actually what we're showing on the structure plan is adequate. Yeah. Um, my second question is about shading. Um, and I did, um, in terms of, I'm fairly interested in this, um, I guess just from my own sort of work, work experience and, and with colleagues, but um, it seems to me that there's been a sort of increasing emphasis over the last few years to do with healthy homes and sustainability, um, the importance of getting sunlight in homes. Would you agree with that as a general comment? Yes, I would. Yeah. So um, I note that um, in, your, in the um, witness statement, you talked about five hours in the, in the winter in the low-lying kaka, sorry, the, yeah, the low-lying residential area in the valley. Mm -hmm. Um, and then in your rebuttal evidence, you talked about um, that some lots on the indicative master plan that get less than three hours sunlight have been removed. So the three hours of sunlight, is that a guideline? Where does that come from as, in your view, to be the minimum desirable hours of sunlight? Um. I would have to check back to find the um, relevant guideline. That's my professional opinion, mm -hmm. yeah. that a house with less than that is kind of yeah. in the middle of winter. Remembering that midwinter is the worst day yes, yes. and no, it gets I, more. I, I do time. understand yeah. that, that it's the yeah. worst time. Yeah. But I mean, um, I, I was interested myself because some of the earlier reporting by um, Mr Milne, I think, referred to UN7 and referred to other, you know, health, other, other guidelines and there's no, it's all high level. It's all high-level guidance, so I'm particularly interested in where that three hours came from. If that's just your professional opinion based on a whole lot of considerations, that's fine. But if there, are, if there is some other more definitive guidance or some reference, I'd be interested in, in seeing that. I'm happy to look for, for you know, the standards, but that at, the, at this stage, that's my professional that, Yeah, that's advice. your professional yeah. view, yeah. given that that's yeah. middle of winter and that's the yeah. worst, worst scenario. And I do note that I, I think that the sunlight is more important in the areas where there is higher density, as yeah. more people are affected. Yes. So I would perhaps expect a higher standard, yes. you know, in those kind of areas. Whereas, you know, if you're living in a, on a, you know, a relatively generous section on a, you know, a, 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 on a slope with a southerly aspect, it's, you know, I would accept a lesser um, degree of sunlight yep. access. Okay. So on this, you said that you've removed sections less than three hours in the master plan. Is yes. there any mechanism in the in the proposed structure plan to ensure that that happens? Because, as you say, it's indicative. The final design might come up with some lots that have less than. Do you see a need to redo that analysis as part of the resource consenting, and should we have that control within the? It is an option to add a control into the plan change. The, the, the Nelson said, you know, the NRMP has a very extensive set of controls yeah. on, you know, urban design controls on you know, Appendix 14 on um, on the layout of subdivisions and things. Yeah. Um, I don't think it specifically mentions access to sunlight, although mm -hmm. that's, I'm sure it could be included. If you wanted greater certainty, then it would perhaps be better to include something in the... 
in the, you know, just on it, Mr. Martin, that might be something you might want to have a conversation with Mr. Lyle about, because again, it comes down to what the planning provisions are, and if they are to be excluded, and and that's that's your case to us, then they either need to be rezoned something else, or there needs to be some other mechanism by which they won't be built on. It could be simply larger lots and an overlay or something, but. I think the question is really, is there a mechanism to achieve what you are suggesting to us is appropriate? Yeah. It's a Mr Lyle question, really. Right, and so and, um, my last question is, um, is actually a, can, a question to perhaps you and Mr Milne, if that's okay, seeing that he's sitting with you, and it's just sort of, I've just come to me hearing your presentation, but what I'm interested in is the... Um, Esplanade Reserve, or the planted strip up the base of Kaka Valley, and its interface or possible use for stormwater management. Um, as you will, you will know that the stormwater management aspects of this project are probably um, um, concerned to, to, to a number of people, and I guess there's a bit of contention about whether the, um, there's enough work done to work to see whether these devices perhaps can be placed. And my question to you is, with that, from a landscape urban design point of view, the importance of that Esplanade Reserve, minimum 40 metres wide, preserving that as being densely planted natural vegetation, and would, that be, would it be an adverse effect, for example, for a detention dam to be placed within that reserve, which might be uh, an embankment with no trees and perhaps limited vegetation due to the structural requirements for a detention dam? Um, from an urban design perspective, I would be um, respond positively to co-locating them and creating um, you know, a, a facility that has, is, has multiple values. It has ecological values and um, you know, stormwater retention values. I think there's a question as to, you know, is, is the land within the 40 metre strip or, you know, outside it? But I would certainly be positive about co-locating them and ensuring that they meet as many uses, you know, recreational, ecological and um, stormwater as possible. And, <coughs> excuse me. And if I can just add and, and probably reiterate uh, Mr Nicholson's um, answer, um, I would agree with that as well. Um, and I also believe in Schedule X9, there's some pretty good design principles there mm. that, um, I was going to say, govern or certainly lead the design of the co-location. Could we perhaps just look at those particular principles in X9? Just while we're doing that, Ms Sweetman, is Mr Mackendo here? <laughs> Might have to shout. He is not, sir, okay, thank you, but right. he is listening in. Oh, that's fine, because if there are any, can he hear us? He can hear you, and I'm just emailing him right, oh, right at the moment right. as well. So we might just be right. It was really just the same, the same with Mr Gu, and we could kind of question, we might have questions for him as well. Yes. Thank you. <coughs> X9. X9? Yes, so X, X9. Certainly number two, X9. Eight and number nine as well, I think. Probably give some good guidance number two, around. Yeah, sorry, number two. And what was the other one? Uh, sorry, number two, eight and nine. Two, eight and nine. As a complete suite, uh, they work together well, but those three uh, be specific to your question. So is your support for co-location, um, can you just explain the reason why you support that co-location? So I mean I guess perhaps being devil's advocate and we haven't talked to, I haven't, we haven't talked to the ecology experts but I would have thought that there's a potential problem if you've got a Esplanade Reserve which has values for access, walking trails, and then a green belt for ecology, um, that there might be some. So you're talking from a landscape and a urban design point of view. Can you perhaps just explain why you think co-locating is, is desirable? 
uh, often I see a lot of um, you know, stormwater facilities that have other values as well as stormwater. So they have ecological values with them and they have um, recreational values. Um, and, and we think that putting them together that they, you know, you, the, the, you get more values rather than less. If you separate them out, um, you, you, I mean, you still get the values, I guess, but you have an opportunity to amplify the, the values um, adjacent. I think the risk is, of course, that it's not replacement. We're not replacing the Esplanade Reserve or suggesting replacing it with a stormwater facility. We're suggesting co-locating it with it in order that the, they, they both benefit from the, from the, from the adjacency. Yes, so co-locating, what does that exactly mean? Uh, to nec Next to? To site next to, not to site, not as well as, not, not, I mean, not, not to replace not, it. A, not actually within? No. Not within, no, no. I mean, if you expanded the Esplanade Reserve, I mean, the land tenure doesn't necessarily matter, I don't think. I'd have to talk to the council, sorry, as to whether or not they want to have the same land tenure over the whole thing, but I'm not envisaging the stormwater facilities to replace the ex Esplanade Reserve. No, that's clear, thanks. Okay, yeah, thank you. Just um, expanding a little bit on that green strip, and from an urban design perspective, I guess, and there's ecological questions there as well, but there seems to be general agreement of a 40 metre um, minimum across both sides of the stream, and there have been some suggestions that there should be a minimum of 20 metres on, on each side of the stream, but there seems to be a resistance to doing that, I appreciate that it may not be possible in some places just because of the um, because of the topography, I guess, beside the stream. But um, is there anything in your master plan here or in urban design which would cause a problem with having 20 metres on both sides of the stream? Um, look, I, I think the 20 metres on you know is a, is a good guideline. Um, in my experience, you know, when you come on site and you start, you go into a valley and it narrows up, and the, you know the, the the banks change their angle and things. You might end up, you know, having a, you know, you might uh, changing that to suit the circumstances. I we're not at that level. My plan is not at that level of detail, and you possibly need to talk to the ecologists to get a clearer, you know, um, 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 guideline. But that would just be my experience. Um, you know, it's a it's a it's a great principle to start out with when you actually come into this kind of site. It doesn't necessarily work out exactly as you'd envisaged. Um, I don't know, Tony, if you'd add to that. No, look, once again, concur and very much context driven. Yeah. yeah, having driven up the valley, I don't recollect anywhere where there was a particular narrow, gorgy section that perhaps would have prohibited that. Yeah, the, the probably is around about where the Karka Valley is written on the plan. Um, through that section there, um, you get quite steep topography uh, on, the, on the true left bank. Um, there's some indentations just below or um, south of the Karka Valley as it's written there. Um, and I think it's those locations there where there needs to be give and take on site in terms of that, that with either side. So if it was something like a, a minimum of 20 metres where feasible, is that...? Um, Look, I, from, a, from a landscape point of view, um, I probably don't have too many issues with that. I think it's more driven by uh, an ecological response as well. Mm. Good. Yeah. <clears throat> um, Mr Nicholson, um, and again, if Mr McIndoe was just listening in, again, I, the question I was going to put to Mr McIndoe, but I'll, I'll ask you a question first, was, was really... Uh, According to the joint witness statement and other things, there was virtually no disagreement between you, and I was just really going to confirm that with him. Um, and I think the only thing um, left for me to ask you is, in reading a number of the submissions and statements that have come from submitters, including from Save the Mai Tai, talk about this proposal that goes ahead as urban sprawl. And I wonder, from an urban design perspective, whether you can tell us what you understand urban sprawl is, and would this create urban sprawl? I mean, urban sprawl always has a sort of a pejorative connotation, doesn't it? But um, is, it, is it urban sprawl? And, I, and I'm really looking at the comments you've made about well-functioning urban environments in terms of the national policy statement and what that sets out in objective one and policy one. But any advice that you can offer us on that? 
This is an urban extension. It's clearly, you know, there, there is a, it's an increase in the urban area of Nelson. Um, I think urban sprawl is generally used as a term to indicate um, um, urban expansion on the periphery of cities, and it's often what we call, you know, radial cities, circular cities like Christchurch, which kind of sprawl out in all directions. And you, you kind of, so when you kind of just build, keep building on the outskirts and keep going beyond, that's kind of, you know, referred to as urban sprawl. Um, I don't think that meets this is urban sprawl in a sense. In fact, it's surprisingly close to the central city, um, you know, and 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 clearly. Um, I, based on your discussions with the transport experts, you know, it looks to me as though it would reduce, you know, additional houses here would have a lesser footprint than houses, you know, on the other side of Richmond or, you know, so in that sense, I think it's a positive location. Doesn't mean it's, you know, yeah. Um, Thank you. So just by natural extension then, um, and again, I know you're not a planner, and this will be for Mr Lyle, but you've raised the issue of the National Policy Statement on Urban Development, and again, a number of the submitters have said this will not contribute to a well-functioning urban environment. Again, do you want to make a comment from an urban design perspective, what you understand a well-functioning urban environment to mean within the, that policy context? Uh, Yes, look, it's, it's um, Mr. Mackendo and I reviewed policy one of the national policy statement on urban development, and um, and as far as an urban designer can comment on those matters, um, we felt that this um, development, well, I should speak for myself, I felt this development met those policy matters largely. So in terms of, you know, the um, the need for, and and the, the, the range of housing types, the, um, well, I think um, um, the, um, Hemi's talk to the to the um, um, Maori being able to express their cultural tradi traditions, you know, a variety of sites suitable for different you know uses, good accessibility between housing, jobs, community services, natural spaces, and open spaces, um, and the opportunity for public and active transport. It's there. Um, um, I can't really say much about the market, but um, and um, and I think it would support reductions in, in greenhouse um, gas emissions simply because of the you know the active transport, the the closeness to um, to the central city. Right. Thank you. That's clear to me. Ms. Sweetman, was, is, 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 does Mr. McIndoe want to comment now? I mean, again, if it's too difficult in this form, we've got the response to the 42A team, and he can come back later then. But is there anything that he wants to? Do you know? Can, can he, can he, can he, he can't really speak to us, can he? No, no. he can hear you. Right. Um, I, I have just emailed him. He sent me a state, an email on the 7th of July after the receipt of the rebuttal evidence um, from Mr Nicholson, which does respond to that. So I have just emailed him asking if he's happy for me to read it out to you and make it available to the panel as well. Right. How long is it? I mean, cause it was... Oh, it's three short points. Why don't you read that out and then we can get Mr Nicholson to respond to it. It would be useful. So. Sure. And then we'll file it with, with, the, um, with the administrator. Certainly. Yeah. It says, point one, I have reviewed Hugh Nicholson's urban design rebuttal evidence. Hugh agrees with the points made and issues raised in my urban design memo and the applicant has done all that is requested in the field of urban design. So, from an urban design perspective, good news. Point two, in particular, indicative master plan has been provided and I consider it to be very helpful. I would be saying that there might be a few tweaks to detail before this would be implemented, but it does demonstrate a suitable development structure and form for the site, and it provides helpful evidence on the suitability of the site for the proposed type of development. Point three, Ruff and Milne have also produced updated and corrected Kaka stream cross sections, which are now also very helpful. As with the indicative master plan, some fine detail might be worded on when taking this through a consent process with reference to the land development manual, but it now demonstrates what's from my urban design perspective a sound outcome. Mr McIndoe and I then had a subsequent email exchange which was just me noting that the structure plan does not reflect the master plan in terms of the location of the secondary road vis-a-vis -vis the commercial area and that that structure plan would need to be updated right, right. to reflect that. 
Mr. Master, now I know that's unusual to just have that read out, but I mean, basically what's, what it's saying there is no contention, there remains no contention between the two and designers as far as I, I can tell. So I, I don't think we need to take that any further. Thank you for that. No, any further questions for Mr. Nicholson? No. Just before I finish, I had one further point about sure. um, health outcomes associated with this. Um, and I note that there are a number of submitters from the Save the Might I have talked about the public health benefits that might be lost if the May Maitahi Valley is, you know, is developed. Um, and, is f and, and one in particular, and I think it's Ms. Ms. Clark Grill talks, you know, raises a number of um, studies and principles of public health and development, which I, I broadly agree with. I mean, I think you know, very well laid out. I think our difference in opinion here is that um, um, the, 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 the general perception seems to be that by seeing urban development that reduces you know, the access to, to, to natural and open spaces. So if you can see development up this valley, it's, you know, it diminishes the experience in the, in the um, you know, Maitahi um, Valley. And I, um, my response to that would be is that we're very good at locking up nature in a kind of, you know, in a park or somewhere and saying, oh, don't go in there and ruin it. You know, it's, nature does its own thing. And I believe that we need to live sustainably with nature and amongst it, and that this development enables, you know, um, people to have better access. You know, it has a comprehensive framework of natural areas with better access, both for the future residents, but also for the public of, of Nelson. Um, so I guess it's a philosophically, it's a slightly okay. different approach to how you provide that people access to, to, to open spaces, you know, in order to achieve those health benefits. And thank you. And that's some of the things I think we'll pick up with Mr. Greenaway in terms of recreational and, and clearly some questions we'll put to submitters. Um, right. Thank you. Just before we move on, now this might be a naive question. Um, it might go to Ms. Um, Dale, um, Ms. Sweetman, in terms of, are we, before I make a fool of myself, um, so we've got a proposed plan change here with a number of zonings, with a structure plan. I'm assuming the zoning, if it's approved, the zoning will get put into the district plan as a zone. Is that correct? So, Because the, the reason I'm asking this question is because, right, because the boundaries of the zones are not yet settled, I don't think, and certainly in relation to that commercial zone. Um, and I was just thinking, I, I don't, I must, I must have, I, just, I don't think I've seen a specific zoning map. Uh, the zoning map was. Um, I'm sure it's there. I just, it's just in the bundle, graphics bundle, uh, and it is settled except for the suburban, which needs to be updated. Right. So, just just to make it clear, if this plan change is, if we're recommending it be approved, there would need to be a specific zoning map which locks in the zone boundaries, and the structure plan will sit. Yeah. And that's over that. Right. Plan okay. Ten in the graphics bundle, up Say that again. Sorry. Plan ten. Plan ten. In the graphics bundle. And up to, yeah. No, that's good. No, that's fine. I'll, I'll reckon. Oh, there we go. Great. Thank you. Um, and now that you have hand up three, you'll see how it works, um, which is an example of, um, is that in the green or not? Stoke Valley. Stoke Valley. Which is right. No, I've, I've got it. I've got it. Right. Thank, thank you, Mr. Nicholson. Um, Mr. Marson, I'm just wondering, um, we just had a discussion over the, the break, and wonder whether you should call Mr. Greenaway first, because I think we've got more questions for Mr. Parsonson, and it would probably be quite good we could finish with Mr. Parsonson, and it would give us a bit more, well, it means Mr. Greenaway doesn't have to sit through. Yeah, I but, thought, uh, Mr. Greenaway was the most Yeah, exactly, yeah. Pleased to be a segue. Welcome. Uh, ahi hai mari ai, uh, katoa. Uh, uh, Greenway toko uh, So I presented some evidence on uh, recreation and open space and uh, also the joint witness statement um, on the same with uh, Mr. Petherum. Um, I could skip through my uh, executive summary just to remind you of my key oops, uh, points. Um, 
So my evidence considers the degree to which the proposed plan change will achieve the necessary provisions for recreation and open space within the plan change area, and what effects it may have on recreation values in the Maitahi, uh, Maitahi Valley. I've reviewed uh, the joint statement, um, as I said, so, and I focus on three areas of concerns raised in submissions. The first is that the proposal will result in a loss of green space in the valley. I find that it will increase the amount of green space provided and that the open space provisions of the proposal are appropriate considering the local terrain and the connections with existing areas of public open space. Now, the concern that the proposal will result in conflict with existing recreation opportunities and values in the valley. I find that the local increase in population will lead to increased use of local recreation resources, but that this would also result from general population growth in Nelson. There will be the need to harden uh, some local recreation aspects, assets to cope with this increased demand. Uh, there is also the potential for adverse effects via increased conflict between vehicles and runners, walkers and cyclists within the Valley Road Corridor. Uh, Mr Petherham and, Petherham and I uh, agree in our joint witness statement that we defer to the traffic experts for their more fulsome assessment, but note that there is um, ample scope in the Valley Road Corridor for various solutions to this issue. Um, and that effects on water quality in the uh, Maitahi River will, be adversely affect, will adversely affect swimming in the river. Uh, in my evidence, I refer to survey work that I previously completed for the Nelson City Council, which identifies existing concerns about water quality in that river. I defer um, to the assessment of Mr. Chufferand, who addresses methods to maintain and improve water quality and habitat, habitat in the Kark Stream and, the, and in the river. I've made several recommendations about clarifying and expanding on the proposed connections with existing public space and the proposed structure plan. Uh, these include additional pathway on the northern side of the Bayview Ridge linking Bayview Road with the Sir Stanley Whitehead Path, alternative treatment to access to Denny's Hole, um, and we've got a, the interface plan attached to the joint witness statement as a result of that. And these recommendations have been agreed with other experts and the applicant they now appear in the revised structure plan. Uh, considering, for example, proposal, oh, look, I won't go through each of the um, policy references, but uh, I find that the proposal adequately meets the expectations of the NRMP for recreation and open space. Thank you for that. And um, Mr Petherum, I'm assuming, is it? Great, thank you for being here. Um, I'll just check the questions. Stephanie, do you have questions of Mr Greener? Um, I just had okay. one quite specific question around this um, consideration of active transport, um, use of shared paths and cycleways. And I can't quite find where it is, but somewhere I think I've seen a reference to um, 2.5 metres as being the recommended minimum width for pathways. And I just wondered how that aligns with, and I, I think um, Mr Clark also refers to it in his transport evidence, how that aligns with Ost Roads and New Zealand, I think New Zealand uses, um, NZ Waka Kotahi use the Ost Roads standards, um, so how that minimum pathway width, um, particularly if you have commuters and recreation um, cyclists and walkers um, using the same paths. Yeah. Are, are you very familiar with the Ost Roads standard in terms of the graphics they use for establishing path width and volume? Of, of, of traffic on them? I have seen those, but yes. others of my colleagues probably haven't. Yeah, it's, it's a sliding scale um, for, for preferred path width based on um, the level of patronage and the type of use on it. So 2.5 mm, metres is the minimum um, for a shared path, and that is predicated on a certain level of use. Um, and I can't remember the, the exact figures, but it's you know, hundreds of users per, per, per day or per hour. And the standard um, then recommends higher, uh, wider widths uh, based on increased activity. So if you apply that standard, um, you will end up with you know, greater widths based on your predicted patronage. So I would assume that that would be an assessment matter that would be you know, tested at the time that those were proposed to go through and say, well, what would really suit in terms of what the, the, the patronage levels are? Um, and certainly whenever I've worked on a shared path wider is always better, but um, often it comes down to what the terrain allows. So um, the two exercises last year, for one for Waka Kotahi, um, from no longer to Petoni, um, as a commuter route that was a five metre width, which was is you know amazing um, and horrifically expensive. Um, and on the other side of the, the, the harbour for Hutt City Council, um, we had to do 2.5 to 3 metres through there, and that was based on the terrain. Lower patronage on the Eastbourne side, 
but um, a adequate for use, for, for, for that use based on the constraints. So you would always go for more if you could, yeah. And presumably, Mr. Petherham, that would be something that would be taken into account later in a consenting process looking at the potential use of oh, those yes, that's pathways. That's correct. Thanks. <coughs> I think only one question from me, which really is applicable to both of you, and, and it's really what you've covered in your statement, um, where you've clearly looked at submissions, and you say you, you know, you've addressed that the proposal will result in a loss of green space, and you say, I'll find it will increase the amount of green space and, and increase the recreational opportunities for other people. And I'm just wondering, in your experience, why, what do you, I mean, and, and this might be common, why do you think a number of, a, a vast range of submitters have all raised concerns about this will impact on green space, this will impact or reduce recreational activity, when in fact you are saying directly the opposite? Yeah, I, I'm a bit confused as to why that is the outcome. I think, so in terms of the submissions, um, I do wonder if people don't understand where Karaka Valley is and that it is private land and it has no access that they've um, heard save the Mai Tai and thought something's happening in the Mai Tai Valley um, and haven't checked what the effect is uh, because clearly it is opening up um, you know, a large area of, of currently inaccessible land to access. And if you think of the extension to the Sir Stanley Whitehead path, for example, through to Bayview, that's quite a significant asset in itself. Um, and then the additional scope from the um, centre of New Zealand, you know, heading around in that direction, um, another large area of increased um, recreational opportunity, the pathways through Kaka Valley up to the, to the um, top of that valley and then through to Bayview, you know, another significant asset. You could imagine, you know, running and, and um, walking opportunities through there. Uh, just the easy access through uh, the, the, the flats in terms of around the back of Denny's Hole and um, th these are all, um, looking at that master plan, mm -hmm. um, most likely to be very attractive walking spaces, yeah. very green, um, you know, the potential for, for good revegetation through there. Um, I, I think, you know, in your site visit, if you've been up through Kaka Valley and that up the top where there's all the um, sycamore weeds, um, you can imagine progressively replacing that with um, tall vegetation again. Um, you know, you are creating quite an attractive setting, and that is all zero access at the moment, so there is no opportunity for recreation in that space. And then if you look at any diminution, diminution of um, you know, recreation opportunity, opportunities in the valley, um, there is no loss of opportunity, there is no um, removal of, um, of, of an asset or an access way. Um, there is increased use, and that is the, the critical thing. Um, and um, as, as, as we have in the joint witness statement and my evidence, the, the need to harden some of those assets to cope with increased use. Right, right. Um, and, and I mean, that's happening now with you know, access to the Mai Tai Hub for cycling. There was just an item in the paper in the last two days about funding for you know, path widening behind Black Hole, isn't it? Black Hole? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is Black Hole. Um, which is currently a very narrow piece of you know, yeah, concrete, yeah, yeah. and that's, that's clearly um, inappropriate at the moment, um, and having that widened is, is hardening that asset. It is, it is making it able to cope more with, with increased use. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Mr Petham, any agreement or disagreement from you? Is that, is that, do you have the same understanding as Mr Greenaway? Uh, Commissioner, no, I have a similar understanding to, as to uh, Mr Greenaway. Mm. Thank you very much. Mm. Anything further for Mr Greenaway? Thank you very much. Thank you.
Welcome. Um, yeah. Tēnā koutou, Commissioners, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present my evidence. Um, I've, you've received, I think, a copy of a summary statement that I've provided. Uh, and if you are okay with this, I'll start at paragraph four, the first three paragraphs, so just sort of introductory summarising um, okay. the basis of my Before evidence. Before you just do, Mr Ridley, have you got a copy of this at the moment? I just there should be one spare available. There's about the five spares. We just... That's right, carry on, and Mr. Ridley, I'm sure, can catch up. Yeah, there's no, nothing new in here that no. he hasn't <laughs> read before. Oh, yeah. Yep, thank you. So, um, yeah, starting at paragraph four, um, while my position on these matters, which we've been covered in my uh, primary statement and rebuttal statement, uh, remains significantly apart from that of Mr. Ridley and submitters, uh, we have engaged on a constructive and amicable basis and have sought to resolve matters to the extent possible. And just going off um, script slightly, I'd, I'd add that indeed we agree on the fundamental principles of erosion and sediment control and the potential effects that can occur if not appropriately implemented. Summary of evidence. Then, as I see it, the key point of difference between Mr. Ridley and me is that Mr. Ridley considers that potential sediment yields, that being discharges, that may arise from the development of the PPC 28 uh, area need to be estimated in more detail at this time so as to adequately inform the assessment of the plan change. While this applies to the entire PPC 28 area, it has particular focus on the proposed development within the Kaka Valley, uh, which drains to the Maitahi, my, Mahitahi River and at Dean's Hole swimming, swimming Hole. Sorry. I do not share that opinion for the following reasons. If the plan change is approved, earthworks will be necessary to create roads and services, and that would include stormwater treatment facilities, other access, geotechnical stabilisation, realigning the Kaka stream, and regrading the land for development. Earthworks will trigger the need for resource consents as restricted discretionary activities under the existing provisions of the NRMP. The matters of discretion that apply to that activity are broad and engage relevant policies and other related provisions where those are contained in the NRMP schedules. PPC 28 includes additional relevant policies and Schedule X12 that explicitly require the adoption of the best practice erosion and sediment control principles and measures consistent with the Nielsen Tasman guideline. Uh, and including adaptive management. Policies impose a requirement to adopt water sensitive design and achieve freshwater outcomes, including consistency with the NPS for Freshwater 2020. Um, and the outcomes sought by Schedule 12 are explicit and it states, and you've read that before. Mm. But I think I will read it because it, it's, it's quite fundamental to part of my assessment. To ensure that development within the structure plan area appropriately minimises adverse sediment effects and is consistent with the relevant ecology, water quality and recreation provisions of the NRMP and the um, NPS. The following principles shall be, adopted, shall be adopted during the design, consenting and implementation of earthworks. These principles are complementary to and shall be adopted in conjunction with the matters of control and discretion listed in the relevant rules of the plan. As a result, at paragraph 9, I am satisfied that the potential sediment-related effects can be appropriately minimised through the design and consenting process that will be necessary to authorise earthworks within the PPC 28 area. While my conclusions have not been dependent on more recent refinements to the proposal, I also note the updated structure plan and indicative master plan. These illustrate the likely limitations on earthworks' extents based on site constraints and consequential amendments to the proposed zones. I anticipate that the consenting and implementation of earthworks will be progressive and I support a staged approach. It is also relevant that the PPC 28 area within the Kaka Valley is predominantly owned by CCKV with a small area owned by BNL, integrated with the, which is integrated with the balance of its holdings across the Bayview Ridge. It is apparent that subdivision, including completion of earthworks, roads, services and lots, in my opinion, will need to be given effect before significant fragmentation of ownership occurs. This allows a high level of consent and control across the PPC 28 area. And, and while, um, just going off um, script again, while I uh, anticipate that the, the current applicants would be the parties that would develop this area, um, I'm familiar with other plan changes I've been aware of in the last few years where um, ownership of those land holdings do change before development occurs, but the, but, but the land holdings themselves are retained in a single entity. 
The Nielsen Tasman Guideline is a recently promulgated document that represents current industry best practice refined for Nielsen City and the Tasman region. The principles and methods it promotes are well proven. Combined with the existing and proposed NRMP provisions, it provides a rigorous design and regulatory framework for managing earthworks. In my experience, there is no single approach to the consideration of sediment-related development effects and greenfields plan changes. And I've described two recent examples in my primary statement of plan change in which I held a decision-making role. Both those were for development areas of a similar scale to that proposed for the Kaka Valley on hilly land and discharging to sensitive receiving environments. Neither included sediment yield modelling. Both relied on the future consenting of earthworks under the existing plan provisions. In my opinion, the management and minimisation of potential sediment-related effects can be appropriately managed through future consenting processes under the NRMP, incorporating the existing and proposed provisions. No greater level of certainty would be achieved by undertaking indicative estimates and modelling of sediment yield at this time, and it is not necessary to inform the plan change process, in my opinion. I agree with Mr Ridley and Ms McCabe for Save the Mai Tai Inc that the NRMP would be strengthened if provisions explicitly required best practice ESC measures for permitted activity earthworks. But in my opinion this is a city and district wide matter that which I anticipate can be addressed through the upcoming plan change required to give effect to the NPS and I understand this must be notified in 2024. Given that the permitted activity scale or individual lot earthworks within the PPC 28 area are unlikely to occur for several years if the plan change was approved. I do not consider it necessary or appropriate to amend the PA rules and standards through this plan change process. Um, now I'm happy to answer any questions. I've also got some response to um, some points raised in Ms Jepp's submissions which I have read and I can do that now, I can do that after questions. Do you want to do that now? Is that in relation to the, the lie decision? Is that what you're... Correct. Right, yeah, yes. why, don't you, why don't you present that now, talk to that now and then, then we can round up the whole thing in questions. Yeah. Okay, so um, Ms Jeff has identified that Lee decision, which is also known as the um, Okura Holdings Limited decision. It's the um, appeal against the uh, decision of the unitary plan um, that where the council did not accept um, residential development density around the south side of Okura Estuary. Um, and I, um, I acted on behalf of uh, Auckland Council in that appeal. Yeah. Um, and. It's, it's certainly correct that there was a lot of detailed sediment yield modelling and um, hydrodynamic modelling and, and understanding the potential effects of, of development as proposed. Um, and that's, that was, I guess, a, not a continuation of um, the approach taken for many, many years of litigation for development around that area and proposed development around that area. Um, and I do, I do recall... Um, that um, <coughs> Head Environment, Chief Environment Court Judge Newhawk at one point said, no more modelling please, let's just get on with what we've got. And that's how the, uh, the hearing proceeded. And so my role was, was to, in that one was to respond to the proposal which included modelling and various other provisions. And so, um, so Ms Jepp certainly referenced <coughs> my participation in that plan change process. Um, but I was responding to the context of that appeal and, and what was supporting that appeal. And certainly in my engagement with the court on that process, um, it, was, it was clear from my responses that I didn't think that, that sediment was a determinative factor in the outcome of that plan change. But when we think that was 2017, so that was you know, less than a year perhaps after the release of the decisions version of the, well, the, the, the adopted version of the unitary plan, um, since then, um, we continue to see the, um, I suppose, the investigated and, and researched or monitored performance of best practice erosion and sediment control on various projects, including the Pūhoi Motorway Project and um, adaptive management monitoring that my own company is doing in developments around Auckland. We've got a continuing to understand the level of performance that, that best practice controls achieve. Um, in 2020, there was the two plan changes I've re referenced in my evidence, where there was no modelling undertaken. They were the earthworks were entirely reliant on, on the other chapters of the entry plan, which manage earthworks. Um, and so, it, as an evolutionary process, I get to where, where I am in this proposal today. 
which is consistent with our understanding of best practice and what we can achieve from those um, principles and measures on site. It's consistent with the approach that was taken in those two Auckland plan change processes in 2020. And, and so in that combination of knowledge um, to propose an existing provisions and the Nielsen guideline, the water sensitive design, that's where I've now landed in terms of what, what the appropriate stage of detailed assessment needs to occur at, which is, in my opinion, at the resource consent stage. And I think the mechanisms are there to achieve a, a better outcome then and a better level of understanding then than what could be achieved now, which would be speculative and, and, and un unnecessary at this time. Right. Thank you, Mr. Parsonson. No. Mark Brown, then start at that end. Good afternoon, Mr. Parsonson. I've just got a few questions um, relating to, to start off with, relating to your statement you've just read out. So in your paragraph eight in the italics, to ensure that development appropriately minimises adverse sediment. So appropriately minimises, what, what would you consider is the uh, the way that uh, you would judge whether it was appropriate. Appropriate. What would be appropriate minimisation in this situation? Well, it's going to be appropriate to its receiving environment. Yep. And that will be based on the detailed analysis of a or the, the, sorry, the detailed development of a proposal through these provisions, which require um, water sensitive design, require best practice ESC, require the consideration or adoption of staging, um, adaptive management, those concepts. Right. And then the consent process then is, uh, is assessing the proposal on that basis and the, the appropriateness will be then su uh, also supported or determined by ecological assessments um, that will feed into those resource consent applications. Okay, thanks for that. In paragraph 13 you talked about um, recent examples of plan changes and development. Has that development gone ahead, those ones you referred to? Um, they give examples of the two things I just mentioned, actually. One of them has changed hands at two, maybe three times in that time period. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I'm, as far as I'm aware, there's no significant development commenced on one of them. Um, on plan change 40, it's absolutely underway. There's the, the site's um, opened up and there's machinery running around right now. Yeah. Yes. Perhaps my overall question is, um, as part of your professional work, you do sort of follow up. You're often engaged to monitor the earthworks and see how they perform. So that's part of, you know, you're talking about how you've moved on and that's part of it, isn't it? To, to see how things perform and you're, you're learning about that. Yep, so um, um, the, my, my own company has done a lot of monitoring and, and managing automated um, inlet outlet monitoring of ponds and in response to rainfall trigger event monitoring um, for developments around um, that area north of Silverdale, the Milldale and Millwater mm. developments, those areas mm. for a number of years now. Um, so we've got, and, and we prepare reports on those, we've got quite a significant amount of data on the performance of those sites. Um, in my primary evidence, I quoted some information generated by the Northern Gateway Alliance in terms of the Pūhu project, yeah. which gave us a lot yeah. of confidence that the estimates of sediment yield that were derived through USLE and Gleams modelling for that consent process were conservative and the, the actual numbers are lower. Um, and, have and have you done monitoring like that in the Nelson area? Well, not to that extent. But no, no, I haven't done monitoring like that in the no. Nelson area. You just, I did actually have a question on that. Uh, Primary, the primary evidence in the Puhoi to walk with motorway. So, I mean, I'm familiar with USLE um, sediment yield calculations, I've done them myself, and that assumes a certain rainfall. So I guess my question on that is, do you know in that analysis whether the rainfall that actually fell, um, fell in that area over that period was, you know, similar to, to what was used in the modelling? Yeah, Mr. Ridley is probably even more familiar with the <laughs> background of that information than I was, but um, I'm, not, I'm not exactly sure what the answer to that question is. That modelling was done on a range of rainfall. Of, um, the USC was, the assessment, for, the overall assessment for that project was done on a number of potential rainfall values. 
but um, I'm, I'd have to go back and look at the data to see what the actual information that's been generated by that project team was based on in terms of rainfall. I know there, have, there were some significant rainfall events in the period of time that that information was derived, but I just couldn't give you the exact numbers, sorry. So um, is it true that, that um, generally you, you design and implement your sediment control measures to deal with a certain um, size of storm, size of rainfall, and, and that if you have a rainfall considerably larger than that, then there could be um, significant sediment discharges that bypass those devices? Well, if we talk about an, a sediment retention pond, which is the sort of the, the best performing device that we try and get most of our runoff into on a given site, if we can, um, we, we need to understand how they function, and that, that can be a, an obvious point of um, un, well, ambiguity, I guess, in terms of sometimes understanding, not, not yourself, but generally how people understand how they function. And so, so the assumed performance of those things or the measured performance is an average, and that can be an average through a storm event or an average between a series of storm events. So, it, it, the, so in some storm events, there might not be any runoff because the water goes in the pond and doesn't even fill up to the first decant outlet. Um, in other storm events, it might just in, engage one decant and it's operating at high efficiency. But if you have a larger pond with three decants and a spillway, then as the water keeps rising, if the water's coming into the pond faster than the water can go out through the decants and it engages second and a third decant, then progressive, so, so your flow through rate's faster, your residence time's shorter, so progressively your efficiency will reduce because the water's moving through faster. And then if it goes over the spillway, obviously that'll reduce again. But then as it comes back down, it's increasing. So it's an average performance. And so, um, so, so when we base our assessments and when, when we've been monitoring the performance of sites or responding to trigger events, um, we're looking at how that's functioned over the course of a storm or series of storms. And that's where that confidence comes from. You so this, uh, for this particular site, down in the Kaka Valley and constructing the roads, probably the, the road up through the, to the ridge, that's probably the most risky part, right? Mm. So um, given you know, the local concern about Deming's Hole, which is just down there, and also just looking at that road, you wouldn't be able to get a sediment pond, you'd have to have a sediment pond at the bottom. So would you envisage that it would be likely that as part of that road you'd be collecting all the dirty runoff, running it right to the bottom to a pond? I mean, I know it's early days, but that's the sort of thing that, that I guess I have, I think, reflects perhaps some concerns about not, not knowing the detail now, that if you had um, non-pond devices for a lot of that road and you had a really big event, you know, how would they perform? Mm. Yeah, so, I mean, certainly when you go to the site and you say, oh, if I was going to just sketch up a site for development that nobody would be worried about, you wouldn't connect a stream at a swimming hole. That, I mean, but the site is what it is. Yeah. And, and so while this is, you know, all something that would be worked through in detailed design and consenting, um, firstly, responding to your direct question, there's, there's, there's ways and means of constructing a road up a hill like that that you can adopt. And one would be, um, you know, progressive cutting and stabilising as you go with a series of sediment control devices installed as you go up, so you're minimising your exposed ground as you go. And it's always a balance between getting your cut, there's periods when you've got cut and fill occurring, but you try and minimise that, you get instant stabilisation on the, on the cut and fill areas, um, so you're cutting down that potential erosion. Um, you, you may well decide to have some sort of devices at the bottom of the hill and progressively rock line your, your inside flow paths. So you've got a whole suite of things going on in combination to minimise your exposed ground, to capture sediment and minimise your risk. Um, and so, you know, th these are not, um, they're challenging but nonetheless proven techniques that are not that unusual in a whole raft of projects, whether it's putting a motorway through the tiger country of, in the back of Puhoi, or building a wind farm or, or, or putting a track into a rural residential subdivision, it's, it's techniques that are well proven. Okay, thanks for that. Now, this, um, in your evidence in chief, you talked about quite an important part of it was that there was a significant rock component in relatively shallow, superficial soil. And we heard evidence um, from the geotech engineer earlier today that perhaps a low 
a low proportion of clay in the soil. So that all goes into what you've been considering, is that right? So if there's, my understanding, if there is uh, not a lot of clay, that does really help with doing your sediment control. Would that be right? Uh, you absolutely, I agree, sir. Um, and I, I've been reliant on, on Mr Foley's um, information in that regard, particularly. Um, but yes, the clays are the, are the proportion of the runoff that are the hardest to capture and, and detain, and there's, there's ways around enhancing that capture as well, using um, flocculation of the sediment ponds. Uh, but as you get into silt and sand fraction, and obviously rock, um, it, the, the, the material tends to fall out of suspension more quickly when it moves along through overland flow, and it's a lot hard, easier to capture in a sediment control device. So the clays are the hardest ones to capture, even though you can do a reasonable job of it with the right techniques. So one of Mr, one of Mr. Ridley's perhaps main points is that, um, talking about staging, I think, or well, perhaps it has been talked about. So you don't see any need to have any provision for staging in the, in the plan, in the um, structure plan. You're saying that's sort of good practice, and as you've just said to us, if you're doing a, a road like that, you would do that staging anyway. I, I think you're going to have to show that you're adopting a methodology that appropriately minimises that risk and minimises sediment discharge or sediment yield while you're doing it. Uh, and certainly when you're looking at putting a road up, uh, up a hill and around a ridge like that in difficult country, well, challenging anyway, um, that's the kind of approach you're going to have to, to have rather than just running everything to the bottom of the hill. Um, and, and so, based on, on the provisions that are proposed, which reinforce those best practice concepts and those fundamental concepts, um, I, I'm personally confident that would have to be reflected through a resource consent process and, and an erosion and sediment control plan that would be approved. So one thing that's come through is that there is a requirement to do adaptive management. Can you just explain to us the benefits of adaptive management and, and how that's important um, with sediment control? Yes, I can. And I'll just, if I could pause for a second, I'm just finding my schedule. Yep, thank you. So, yeah, um, as, as we've discussed, uh, uh, the, these key principles are, are included in Schedule X12, and, and that schedule will be engaged through the consent process. Um, and, and as you identified, so seven, uh, X12-7, seven, implement adaptive management plan methodology and, and plan uh, that incorporates measures to monitor. So adaptive management in this context, or adaptive monitoring it's sometimes called, and, and erosion and sediment control practice, is, is an additional suite of monitoring um, and responses that you would do over and above your day-to-day -day requirements to monitor and maintain your devices in accordance with your ESC plan and, and, and consent. So one, one thing I emphasise always when I'm, I'm talking to people about adaptive management or running training or whatever is this doesn't surpass or supplant your day-to-day -day management. And if you get to your day-to-day -day management right, 95% uh, of the time everything's going to be fine because what we typically find is if something doesn't quite look right, uh, it's because there's something's not quite right on the site in accordance with the approved plan. So that's a, that's a monitoring thing. But adaptive management, is, and, and we, you know, I was involved in drafting the template for the Auckland Council adaptive management plans, is, and, and Mr. I know Mr Ridley is very familiar with these as well, is, is an additional suite of um, um, actions and measures that you undertake to give you a greater ability to identify, confirm or otherwise whether the, the, the effects that are occurring during earthworks are within the anticipated range and envelope effects that you've considered when you consented the project. And so it might include some additional baseline monitoring before you commence the works, upstream and downstream of your work site, for example, if you can. Um, it, will, it might include and often includes um, sampling, going out and doing water quality sampling um, in response to rainfall trigger events, which might be, a, and those rainfall trigger events are normally a, an event that makes the controls work hard, you know, the ones that really make the controls work pretty hard and there's a lot of runoff coming into them. 
Um, it could be some additional, it, it often requires an erosion sediment control specialist to go out and do pre-rainfall inspections of the, of the site of the devices prior to forecast high events. Uh, and a follow-up. If you've got a rain, rain, bigger rain event coming, you'd go out and check specifically. Yes. So the often in Auckland it'll be 15 mils in an hour or 25 mils in 24 hours. And so if one of those is predicted, then then the ESC specialist will go out and, and, and walk the site with the site crew and just get that extra level of expertise observation. Um, and then you'll be doing your, your sampling, your monitoring. You might, in some cases, have automated samplers in the inlets and outlets of ponds or in the upstream and downstream and streams, and we've certainly got those going on in the Auckland region. Um, um, the Manawatu, the Tarawa Manawatu Road Project, replacing the, the, replacing the Manawatu Gorge Project, um, you know, we've refined it a bit further, so we've got some quite direct requirements for um, after certain events or certain observed things on site, an ecologist goes downstream and inspects, inspects downstream to identify whether there's any visual cues to um, effects that weren't anticipated. And then there's a suite of responses uh, if those effects look like they've been exceeded, and, and, and some of the responses might be closing up some of the earthworks areas, for example. Okay, thanks for that. And my final question um, relates to your item 15 and your handout today. This question about, I guess, is, is there sufficient, um, are there sufficient controls in the NRMP for permitted activities once you come to this individual site um, development, which I'm aware of from my knowledge of, of the, of the um, erosion and sediment control, certainly in Auckland, which can be considerable source of sediment, would you agree with that? So you might get all your roads in and then developing the houses, if that's not done carefully, that can be a, a considerable source of sediment? Yeah, I would agree with that. And, and certainly, um, you know, in my, my years, I, I remember doing a paper at a conference on this in 1999 or something, <laughs> a long time ago. Um, but Auckland Council, for example, has had a really good program in the last couple of years where they've sort of had hit squads going out and focusing on these small site developments and, and issuing advice and then fines, and, and, and it, it's very energy intensive. But, but the reality is um, at some point the council determines what a permitted activity threshold will be for earthworks, whether it's often on an aerial basis or sometimes volume. Um, those, the, the important thing in my mind is that, that the standards of permitted activities are enforceable and, and explicit, and so in the Auckland region, um, in the unitary plan, um, a permanent activity is only permitted if it implements a GDO5 standard of ESC measure, right? Um, I, I think the NRMP could be strengthened to be more explicit about what permitted activity earthworks um, must adopt, but I don't think this plan changes the mechanism to do that. Do you think it... I guess, yeah, I have a slight concern when you say that the, when the national policy statement, uh, you know, notified the, the planning for that's notified 2004 and when that happens it'll all be good. You say you don't, your, your view is that you don't think the permitted activity criteria for sediment control need to be strengthened now. You think they're sufficient if well, not, not assuming that there, there might be some development before the that the NPS is promulgated? Well, um, I, I think the council, from my experience with council compliance activities, I, I, because the Nielsen Tasman guideline is now in place, the Earth Erosion Sea Control guideline, I think the council is on fairly strong grounds to go out and expect permitted activity earthworks to implement a standard as reflected in that guideline. Um, even, even though the rules um, aren't as explicit as I think they should be. But I don't think, because it would be a, a district-wide change to the plan and, and this process hasn't sought district-wide comment on such a change, I don't think this is the right mechanism for it. What about some sort of overlay or precinct that was just for this area? You don't, you don't think it was, it's justified? Um, again, I'm, I'm somewhat uh, um, I'm somewhat dependent on Mr. Lyle's advice in terms of the function of the plan, um, but I, I have no problem with permitted activity threshold earthworks anywhere, including this this plan change area, being being required to implement 
best practice of urgency control. I have no problem with that at all, whatever that mechanism is. Um, I'm just not convinced that this plan change right now is the right process to do that. But if you saw differently, I, I wouldn't object to the principle of that having to occur, because I think it should occur everywhere. So okay, there, thanks. That's all I have. There are two, two things about that. The 1.2 metre trigger uh, in the plan uh, for earthworks, and potentially you could have um, a discretion to impose a consent notice uh, for some form of um, controls when titles are issued at the subdivision stage to comply with guidelines. So that would be a mechanism that is appropriate to this plan change but doesn't attempt to alter the rules generally uh, for the region, which I think would be inappropriate in this context. Yeah, I'd, I'd be very comfortable with something like that. Um, there's absolutely no reason why all permitted earthworks shouldn't implement best practice for agency and control. Um, would it be appropriate if I just added to that, just briefly? Sure. I mean, um, so at least um, drawing on the experience with Bayview, um, the building sites are formed as a part of the subdivision process. So, yes, it's it's possible that with architectural design there could be additional earthworks, but principally the bulk earthworks are done at the time of subdivision. So I can't rule it out, but the experience on the on the Bayview side on the on to the north, which is the same applicant as that the building sites are principally formed, the bulk earthworks are done at the time of subdivision, and it's and it's controlled already by a resource consent process, not permitted activities, so arduous resource consent process that we've gone through already. So that's a, that's a function of the topography on that side, and what you're saying is the topography in the sensitive areas that we're now talking about are similar. Correct. Yeah, I just think the same approach would apply, is that the bulk earthworks would be done at the time of subdivision through the consent process to create a building platform. Yes, I mean, just to make that clear, so that, that's the argument, isn't it? So in terms of the subdivision, you need to show that there's a complying building platform and what that no, might need to be consented at the same time, is that what you're saying? Yes, the, right. the, okay. the, the subdivision applications include a comprehensive earthworks plan including formation, the, the, the specific building sites right, that have right. been designed. And they get formed as a part of the subdivision. And when the, when the, when the 224 happens and people take ownership, they've got, a, they've got a platform that's been formed at the time of subdivision. They're not building, right. a, they're not building buying a hillside without a, without a building site. That's common practice, I think. Richie um, should confirm, I think. Right. The platforms are done, 3604 but they're all flat, all we've done that all for the whole project. Right. Thank it's you. Not, it's helpful. not to say there won't be at, um, well, earthworks through because of the, the house design. Exactly. But predominantly it's done. So just um, going through with that, perhaps with, with Richie, um, so you would you envisage that the subdivision would be done to that detail where you do work out in the steeper areas? where you do say, well, this is the place for the building platform, and then you're, are you pre-selling those lots, or would you then sell them with the, with the um, building platform there? We sell. we sell them all with the building platform there. So we go and complete the roading, complete the sections with a geotech approved building site, whether it's perfectly flat or a one in four or a one in 10, depends what the geotech say to us, but we try and get as flat as possible. So you would envision that that would happen over most of this this area that we're talking about? Well, yes, that's what we've talked about on the ridgeline. It's the only way to do it up there. The cheapest time to do it, too. Yeah. Cheaper for us to do it, for sure. Yeah, and then individuals to do it later on. Ms. Ray. I had a question around... Bayview as well, which is perhaps to the broader issue of the level of detail that might or might not be needed in this in, the, in our process. But I, I was just wondering whether there is um, learnings or examples from that Bayview subdivision that might inform whether or there there is or isn't. And I guess in your your proposition is that there isn't a need for more information at at this stage. 
Yeah, so my, I have a different, obviously, expertise than Mr Parsonson, but um, as a planner, um, the processes uh, um, involve a very high level of design. So you've got a, you've got a um, detailed geotechnical report, um, you've got a um, detailed erosion sediment control plan, um, we've had ecological assessments, landscape assessments, um, um, detailed earthworks plans, which include cross-section, long sections, and those, those sorts of things. Um, staging, um, where um, the sediment control devices are going to be, all, all shown on, to scale on, you know, detailed plans. Um, and then you pass through a um, comprehensive consent process where everything gets tested. Um, it's taken four to seven months for each of those earthworks consents. Um, there's no shortcuts. Um, the council have full control over that process where they look at everything with a very um, careful eye. They have specialists involved to review um, in all respects. So um, obviously we're adding in the assessment criteria, um, taking in um, Michael's and, and Graham's advice in terms of what could be improved, um, but that's already very comprehensive processes. And have there been any um, sedimentation issues through that process on that subdivision? Um, probably, it's probably something that uh, Richard should answer, but essentially I think the bulk earthworks have, have been three years or so already, is that correct? Yes, we've been three years so far. Uh, we've had two minor infringement notices at the same time the council uh, gave themselves a ticket for high rainfall, so we have had two, but they were minor. Yeah, and, and, and also we did get a discharge consent um, for the outfall if we did get a huge peak event that we couldn't control. We haven't had to use that, but we got that two and a half years ago. So the, that's, an, that's an important component. So in Nelson, we have to get a discharge consent for discharging sediment from erosion sediment control devices in events where those devices can't cope with the rainfall event. I think it's one in 20, is that? Is it one in 20, Mark? Is that correct? It's one in 20? It's one in 20 for the ones we do in the Nelson. Yep. So we've, um, essentially the events that you can't actually control all of the sediment on, the other discharge consents that are obtained um, and, in, and in cases where we've had high rainfall events exceeding the capacity of the, of the um, attenuation devices that meet the engineering standards, um, there is sediment occasionally. Um, there's no way of controlling it in practice and that's when the enfor enforcement officers um, either get a phone call from a member of the public, um, give Richard a call, you know, how's it going? Um, what are you doing to, um, you know, sort it out, doing everything they can, and so the other sort of instances where that happens. If I could just add to that, um, w when we're doing an erosion and sediment control design or, or assessing um, sediment yield through some form of modelling, uh, and, we're, and we're adopting uh, or we're assuming a particular sediment control retention efficiency, it's an average efficiency, so it does take account of the range of likely efficiencies you're going to get with different rainfall events. So it does really incorporate what Mr Lyle's talking about. It's just that Nelson City has a particular way of consenting that. And have you looked, I guess this is one for Mr Parsonson, have you looked at the relative um, sedimentation input into um, Denny's Hole as the obvious Know, swimming location. You said in an ideal world you wouldn't be discharging into a into a swimming popular swimming hole. But I mean, there's an awful lot of sedimentation comes down the Mai Tai in a big flood event. Have you looked at the comparative amounts that might come down the Mai Tai and might come in from this um, yeah, from the earthworks in the subdivision? Yes, I've referenced um, some um, reports in my primary statement, um, and I've had discussions with with with. Dr. Robertson, um, not not just in terms of the the river, but the the haven as well, um, and it's it's certainly very apparent that some quite significant sediment loads come down the Mai Tai River. Um, the water quality coming down the Kaka can be pretty bad at times, um, and yet Denny's Hole right now is a cherished swimming site that people 
considered to be a healthy environment to swim in and enjoy a great amenity. So it's, it, the river is flushing that sediment through now and, and, and certainly the intention um, based on my analysis and what I would expect um, best practice erosion and sediment control to achieve would be to not compromise that function um, in any way during the development phases so that so that the, the sediment would be sediment yield would be minimized from the development area the riv river would continue to be able to move sediment that is received there downstream and and also obviously um, the of the the stream has to be realigned and the earthworks occur to form that stream in the summer months where there's very little flow down that through the Kaka catchment. It would be offline away from the, the current stream. It could be stabilised um, before any, any use of that corridor. Um, so we've got the opportunity of space um, to, for that work to occur away from the current stream in a dry environment. Just following on from this line of uh, discussion, which I think is quite useful, given the, the concern of many submitters and probably everyone involved in the project that um, Denny's Hole is really important, Mr. Parkinson, would it, uh, Mr. Parsonson, would it be your view that, given the significant loads of sediment that come down the Matahi River already, that if there was a significant effect or significant event during construction of the road that resulted in an undesirable amount of sediment getting into into Denny's hole that that would not stay there and ruin Denny's hole but that would then be flushed out subsequently by a larger storm due to the rainfall from the larger river system um, well my simple answer is yes, I, I would expect that to occur. Um, I would certainly also not want to equate a significant rainfall event with a significant dis sediment discharge from the site. Um, it would, you, you, would, you would be intending to manage the site so that you didn't get a significant sediment discharge in a big rainfall event. But if there was something like that occurred, my, I would anticipate that that river function would continue to move that material downstream as it does now. Yes, I mean, the main point of my question is that, I mean, I've, it's certainly been a concern of mine, um, perhaps reflecting on what we've heard in the submitters, that um, if something fails on the site during construction and there's a whole lot of sediment gets in a Denny's hole, and that's it for Denny's hole. But what you're saying is, well, no, it might affect it for some time, but that will be flushed out by the wider river system. Yes, I agree, sir. And, and also at the peak of the storm or at the elevated flows of the storm is when the Mai Tai and the Kaka may be flowing high, um, those are not times when people would be safely swimming there anyway. Yeah, yeah I guess it's more, you know, the, 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 it would recover within yes. a reasonable time. I agree with yeah. you. Yep. I'm asking you. <laughs> I'm asking you, you think it would recover within a reasonable I, time? I, yeah. I, I would anticipate the river would continue to flush the sediment through so that the hole remained in valued amenity. Stephanie? Just a couple of questions um, around the activity status. Do you think that, do you think that Mr. Parsons, sorry, Mr. Parsons, thank you, um, do you think that the RD status and the broad matters of discretion are sufficient to, on their own, are sufficient to enable a, an appropriate level of scrutiny of the effects? Um, having been involved in um, either supporting or, or actually obtaining the resource consents through Nelson City for Earthworks, um, in effect, yes. Um, Nelson City Council is quite rigorous in how it assesses um, that scale of earthworks activity. Um, but I think they're strengthened by the additional provisions and, and schedule, particularly strengthened by the schedule. Um, so that, that if there was any sort of perceived broadness there that might might be a gap, it's, it's certainly closed out by having to reference through that schedule as well. Yeah, because I mean the RDS status, you know, implies in a, a level of acceptability of those effects, and so I think the broader question is, and you've already answered it, you know, does the currently proposed OBS and poles 
um, ensure a greater level of scrutiny to achieve an, a, a better outcome, I guess, than the existing provisions? Yeah, I think the, the RD status um, specifies what effects are of particular interest to that activity rather than some any acceptability. I think it recognises that they can be managed if it's done right. Um, but it doesn't order to imply that, that it will be granted if the effects are exceeding what's acceptable. Um, but I, I certainly support the additional provisions to strengthen that use. Okay, thank you. I said we'd just spend more time with you than uh, Mr Greenaway. Um, only, uh, there's only a couple of others left for me, because I think they've been answered, and I'm going to ask you the question, then I'll probably ask Mr Ridley the same question. Um, and it really goes to um, your, your clear statements, but I'll, I'll just read you in terms of the summaries that you had up, um, where you say, make sure I've got it in front of me, this is in four, while my position on these matters remains significantly apart from Mr Ridley and some others, we, you and Mr Ridley, have engaged on a constructive and amicable basis and have sought to resolve matters, and you, you haven't. Um, and so there is a, a, as I see it, a clear divide in your opinions. Is it your view that that difference of opinion is based on just different philosophical approaches to how settlement control is run? Or is there some other technical basis that you think Mr Ridley is relying on? What, essentially, why is there such a difference? And your view, and mm. I'll put the same question to Mr. Yeah, Ridley. Yeah, I don't, I don't know whether I'd say philosophical or not, because you know our, our fundamental philosophy around erosion and sediment control principles and best practice and that is the same. Um, my experience in the last ten years with the evolution or the ongoing evolution of best practice, the updating of various guidelines like GDO5 in 2016 in Auckland and the Nelson Tasman guideline recently, uh, our monitoring and understanding of how these best practice things work and, and reassuring us that our estimates of effects are um, often conservative. And, and my experience with recent plan changes which um, have created precincts for zones and particular elements of urbanisation and been reliant on existing provisions for other activities like earthworks, if those, if those provisions are sufficiently new, the second generation like the entry plan. Based on my experience, I, 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 I don't... And while there's no bespoke one-stop shop for doing a plan change, I don't, in this case, think that that level of detailed analysis, modelling, staging is necessary at this stage because we can, I, have confidence that those things can and will be addressed through the resource consent process. And so it would be, to do it now would be speculative, and even though it might assist in some level of confidence if you turn the dials down to a point where you were happy with, when you get the resource consent process, the design would have changed a bit, the numbers will be different, you'll do it all again and you'll come up with the same answer. So I don't think it's necessary at this time. I'll, I'll come to Mr Ridley in a moment. So in your opinion, when would it be appropriate to require sediment yield modelling and to show the location and extent of earthworks? Or is it never necessary? Well, well I'm, I'm drifting towards it not being necessary for plan changes, in my personal view. For plan changes, right. Yes. But it's absolutely okay. appropriate for many resource consents. Yes, right. um, you know, not, not the little <coughs> simple consents that it's completely unnecessary because we know the best practice is good enough, you bang yourself fence in or whatever. But, you know, when you come to a resource consent process, which is I'm proposing would be the case here, for a significant development or land holding, um, um, it's a horses by horses, the level of detail you, you go to, and, and you know, as Mr Ridley knows, with, with the Puhoi motorway extension, um, it was not only um, USLE modelling but Gleams modelling, and there was an amazing swathe of information available um, for that resource consent, because the resource consent was telling us exactly how the project's going to be delivered, and even within, even that, it had some flexibility in terms of final design, but it was a, it was a, it was a conservative assessment. Right. So, and I think this has come through clearly in your evidence. You're really saying that, <coughs> using Mr. Marson's 
terms the plan machinery, i.e. the current provisions, which you're quite right, when you, you direct us to the provisions, there is a very long list of matters of discretion, including things like the area to be cleared at any one time, and I understand Mr Ridley is talking about should there be requirements that you only open a certain amount, a la um, <coughs> the uh, Akura decision. Um, so that's your basic proposition, isn't it? Is that given your technical level, or the technical evidence we've got, given the nature of the site, and I suppose that's another question, you know, that the, the plan machinery is sufficient to address potential adverse effects at a resource consent stage. That's the basic proposition. That is, actually, and it, thank you, sir. It is my proposition, and I, I noted um, in, in Ms Jeb's submission yeah, that, exactly. that no doubt you'll come to um, later in the hearing um, at, at 2.8, where Ms Jeb says that the courts have held that the description of actual potential effects is useful in considering whether a plan change is appropriate. After all, one should be assured that the rules are detailed enough to <coughs> properly control the activities and their adverse effects, in my opinion, as they are. Right. And I was yeah, looking and, for a quote. Oh, sorry, and Mr Lyle's just sort of put to my attention to reinforce the fact that there are additional assessment criteria um, and a stormwater management plan needs to be updated which has water sensitive design and there's, um, there's various other principles such as X9 and, and cultural impact assessment. So there's a whole bunch of things happening at once. And that's what we'll need to come to with Mr Lyle because, I mean, I'll, I'll confess right now, I'm still unclear on what all those linkages are and, and I, I'm not sure whether Ms Sweeten still has that same view that was coming to at the rebuttal stage, but we'll pick that up later. Um, that's more the, um, more the point. Um, and I suppose that goes to my final question to you is that, is it your view that, well, is this a really challenging site or is this a, a, a site that, that you would normally expect to see the types of provisions that you're suggesting. I how challenging. I think you say it's not not particularly challenging. I don't, well, it, no, I, I think it would be more accurate for me to say that it's a, it's a challenging site right. in some ways, um, but it's not um, a unique site. And right. so um, I'm familiar with many sites of similar challenges with proven techniques to manage those challenges. Right. Thank you, Mr. Ridley. Can I just put the, that, that same question to you? I mean, I, I think your view is, um, or is it still your view that you still think there should be this additional sediment modelling and, and greater specificity of where the youth works will be, given Mr. Mr. Parsonson's responses? Or what's your view? Uh, yeah, thank you, sir. Um, my original position still remains. So um, I agree with what Mr Parsonson's referring to with respect to best practice, and I don't think we're in disagreement in terms of what best practice is. Um, I have a slight disagreement in terms of the level of, of advancement that we've made in the last 10 years. I think we've actually probably stagnated in the last 10 years a little bit. Um, chemical treatment is probably the latest big advancement we've had, and that's been in place for probably 20 years now. Mm -hmm. So I think, but I understand what best practice is, and I think I'm in agreement with that. The fundamental issue for myself is that um, without understanding sediment yields from earthworks areas, um, we don't actually know if earthworks should even occur or not in some areas. Um, and it is a challenging site in terms of flooding, um, slopes, soils, um, receiving environment values, those things all make it a challenging site. And it's just come back to that fundamental practice. Even if you put in best practice options, which obviously will happen um, through resource consent processes, through implementation, there will be parts of that site that probably shouldn't be earthworked. Um, and I strongly believe that the plan change is the place to identify where they are. And the only way you can do that, I believe, or one of the key ways you can do that is through some form of sediment modelling. I'm not necessarily saying that's a Gleams model, or, uh, you know, or something with six figures after it in terms of the, the cost of undertaking that, but we need to understand, as a minimum, the risk associated with those earthworks and is that risk acceptable or is it not acceptable and that, that gets built into the plan change process. And coming so. to that view, what, what advice can you give us? Where, where are those areas that you think should not be earthworked? Well, well, typically erosion sediment control 101, as you double your slope angle, you triple your sediment uh, generation. So the steep areas and the floodplain areas are the two areas which will be the highest risk locations. Um, I also have some question marks, it's probably more confusion than question marks around the, um, I think it's the open space zoning up through the Carcass stream, um, particularly listening to some of the questions this morning around the stormwater attenuation 
provisions and devices which are to be constructed in that zone and the amount of earthworks that that will require as well. So I, I have some questions in my mind which I need to get my head around. So, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, so is the major difference between you and Mr Parsonson the, the extent to which this is a challenging site? Well, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to get to the stage of what the fundamental difference between you two are, and, and it seems to you as a, a huge goal. And it doesn't seem to be narrowed at all. So what all I'm trying to do is understand you have a particular view, Mr Parsonson has a particular view. Mr Parsonson it's not really a philosophical one. You both agree on best practice and what that is. Well, I, I think maybe we're saying the same thing, but, <laughs> but, but Mr Parsonson's taking a, a, a view where the existing plan, plan, plan provisions are adequate to address it. What I'm saying is even if we implement best practice, if we do earthworks to the extent that is required to implement this, and we've just heard how um, we're going to do bulk earthworks on all those residential zones to achieve flat platforms, so we can't hide behind the fact that all that residential area has to be bulk earthworked. Um, there's going to be fix. Best practice won't stop sediment discharges, and we've also just heard evidence of that, that that does happen, and in fact you get a consent to do it, which I need to have a look at as well. But um, So there is effects. The only way you can stop that or minimise that effect is through not doing earthworks in those areas, or having more stringent um, staging limitations on your earthworks. This is probably leaning over into the planning realm, so you tell me if this is not really your area of expertise, because the, the current plan requires a restrictive discretionary activity, as I understand it. There are all those matters of discretion. There are the additional provisions that the applicant is suggesting that goes into the schedule. Let's forget about what the linkages are, but, but what they're, so they're doing. And when I look at that list, um, it appears to me, I'm not an expert in it, to be very comprehensive. So is it, is it that you don't think the, re the consenting process would be robust enough to resist you know, an application where they don't come in and it simply says, you know, the processing officer, the adverse effects of this are going to be significant and turn it down, as opposed to you know, in, a, in a section 32 plan change process, to look at the provision to say the, mach the plan machinery sets up the right provisions to enable an assessment of the earthworks. I probably should pass that to, to a planning expert, to, to Ms Sweetman, but um, I'll, I'll offer an opinion because right, well, I, I, yeah, I do that anyway. <laughs> um, you can rely on the consent process to a degree, but when we've got a, a the, looking at the schedule items, for example, that are, are suggested, um, I'm not in disagreement with what some of those items are saying. I think we could tweak the words, and I'm sure Mr Passes and I could sit down and agree on some words around that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's more... Um, the weight that those, that's, those scheduled provisions are given, they're not matters of discretion. Um, the guideline, as an example, isn't even mentioned in the NRMP, so we can have the intent of implementing the guideline, but there's nothing there that actually um, enforces that provision. Mm -hmm. So that's, that concerns me, from a technical point of view, how those things come through. Um, I think we can probably move, move forward in that process somehow, but the biggest fundamental issue for me is just that I think we need to know up front now right. where the earthworks are going to occur, of those earthworks that are to occur, what earthworks are appropriate and what aren't. I just think that's a fundamental principle for plan changes. Um, I was involved with the Okura with the Lee decision as well. Um, I was working for Okura Land Holdings at the time. Um, you can't go to a plan change process, I don't think, without, we haven't even got a plan showing us where the earthworks are. I, I'm, completely guessing so where, where the earthworks are going to occur. It's just, at the moment it's just guesswork and I'm sorry it's that's just... No, 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 it's fine, I see, so that's your position. I just, just go back to the um, Long Bay decision which you effectively essentially referenced through your decision. I know that you were involved in that and of course that was, that was in an, a highly insensitive environment, i.e. potentially discharging into a marine reserve. Are we dealing with the same the same level of sensitivity here in terms of a sensitive environment? I know it's weird coming down to the, the Tahi River, but is it the same? Um, in terms of the receiving environment, I'll, I'll leave that for the ecologist to comment on the, right. the sensitivity of the receiving environment. Um, the Okura decision, um, I think the land holding was 130 hectares, of which 80 hectares from memory was going to be earthworked. Um, here we've got, I think it's, am I right, saying 257 hectares? I'm not, I've got no idea on the, the oh, area sorry. of earthworks, but. Oh. 
So much greater area of earthworks here, contour similar um, soils. I can't really comment on the difference between the soils and um, ecological values or sensitivity of the receiving environment. That's right. a question for an ecologist. Yeah. Thank you. Your position remains clear. Before I go back to Mr Parsons, are there any follow-ups or questions from Mr Ridley? No. Mr Parsons, and I mean, do you want to respond to to any of that? I, I, I don't think the issues have been narrowed in the sense, Mr. If I'm understanding Mr. Ridley correctly, he's still simply saying I think it's the it's the argument that's been put up in the 42A in the addendum is that there is still insufficient information for us to be able to determine in Section 32 terms that yeah. the provisions, the combination, are the most appropriate. Yeah, thank you. Um, the the earthworks um, within the Kaka Valley are circa about 100 hectares from my, and that's the basis of my assessment. Um, based on the revised zoning and revised structure plan that is approximately that, um, which is very similar to the, you know, the other two plan changes at Walkworth that I, I mentioned, both of which discharged down into the Maharangi River and Maharangi Harbour. Um, it is, it is, it's, it's not my position to to say that development should just happen everywhere because a city needs to get more developable land, obviously. There's a whole lot of constraints that come into play in terms of determining where development should occur. Um, it, certainly, it is my recollection that the Okura decision um, did, didn't find that sediment would be a, a determinative factor, and, and Mr Ridley obviously points out that there was a lot of modelling done there. Um, and you've identified some specifics about the receiving environment. Um, I can't speculate what my view on that would have been if there'd been no modelling done, but I, I certainly, um, I've, I certainly have confidence, and certainly the Okura land wasn't, in, wasn't like that, but I certainly have confidence that there, there can be techniques Im implemented that appropriately minimise sediment discharges. Uh, so from, and so I, I don't support um, going through that process twice. Right, right. Thank you. Um, anything further from Mr Parsons? Yes, I've just... <laughs> so Mr Parsons, and you're probably aware of the... Um, there's quite a few perhaps best termed unresolved issues to do with stormwater management, and one of those in my mind is that um, they're going to need to be detention devices for flood management. And I think the position of some of the applicants' experts is that they might, they, they might be online. My understanding is they would be on the carcass stream. Now, I guess just from Mr Ridley's comments that, you know, maybe some things shouldn't be done um, and trying to get some handle on that. There would be earthworks, probably consents required if you're going to be putting um, detention dams across a stream. Um, is that something that you've thought about in terms of erosion and sediment control for this site? Um, in a conceptual sense, yes, but not in detail. Um, my understanding is most of the devices would be offline, but. Um, other witnesses can speak to the actual proposal, this, the, the concept at this stage. Um, but it's, it's not, um, I'm certainly very familiar with a lot of projects that have put um, new structures or, or diversions in streams of a similar scale to the Kaka stream. Um, and there's, there's different ways of doing it. Um, and if you were wanting to um, retain the, essentially the same flow path as the stream pre and post works, then you would have to put in a fairly substantial diversion temporarily uh, um, so that the flows can go around your work site um, with, with appropriate capacity and, and in the Auckland region that would be at least to carry a 20 year flow and make provision um, for if there was a higher flow to pass through your site without causing um, significant downstream damage. Um, if you were going to relocate your stream as Mr, Mr. Lyle's spoke about before, the downstream extent of the Kaka stream which is proposed to be realigned, then you build your new alignment first in the dry, fully established 
get the plants growing, get in early and do that so that you've got a beautiful stream channel ready to receive water and then you just put the water in it and then you've got a dry site to work in. Thank, thanks for that. I guess um, probably refining what I was, was asking, you wouldn't see any problem with online detention dams per se in terms of sediment control and again do you think that could be dealt with at a resource consent stage shouldn't have any bearing now on deciding whether those should be offline or online? Uh, correct. Um, projects um, put big things in streams quite a lot, particularly big motorway projects for example, um, where they have to put in divisions to carry flows for quite some period of time while they're building a big structure. Apologies, I just have a quick question for Mr Ridley, it's something that's bugging me. Your view in terms of the level of uh, sufficiency of information that you think is required at this point, would that view change if the status for the activity was a discretionary consent? Because the discretionary um, guarantees a greater level of scrutiny obviously than an RD. Um. Need a bit of thinking around that. I, I, I don't think so. Um, whether it's discretionary or not, still require to understand fundamentally what the extent of earthworks is, um, and if there are areas of earthworks that effectively, I, you know, shouldn't shouldn't occur, should or shouldn't occur. Okay. Thank you. Um, we were just, just having a discussion, I think because Mr Parsons and I think you're, you're staying tomorrow, aren't you, because we've got other experts where there are some uh, sort of crossover, we might have questions. Mr Ridley, I understand that you can't be, is that right? That's right. So yes. if we have further questions, we might need to put them to you in writing if, if we, we have any questions. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Pardon, Ms. Sweeban? <laughs> um, Chair, he will be back next Thursday to answer right, so, any oh, questions. Right, so we can, right, thank you, yes. Yes. So we can we can cover those off then if we need to. So um, thank you. Oh, I, I, I do have one for Mr. Ridley. Uh, Mr. Ridley, so you're you're saying that um, for this particular site there might be areas that you don't do earthworks at all. Um, can you give us some examples of plan change or areas that where this has been the case, where you've actually said it's, the the conclusion has been all well, this is just too hard to do the earthworks and we won't do them here. Um, I'll use Akura as an example, seeing that's what we've been re referring to. 130 hectares, um, from memory, 80 hectares of earthworks, um, so 50 odd hectares, which wasn't earthwork, not purely because of um, sediment yields, but part of that reason would have been through sediment yields. And even within the 80 hectares that um, we were going to um, earthwork in that case, that was subject, or would have been subject to specific provisions around open area limitations. Mr Marston, I think one of the, the questions we'll have for some of the other technical witnesses, I, I, I honestly, it's pretty late in the day, I can't remember. I mean, in terms of the um, Nelson Tasman uh, Land Development Manual and the extent, I mean, which is updated, the extent to which it addressed some of these as well, Mr Mills might be covering it, but we'll, we'll deal with that tomorrow. Um, it's quarter to four, we could take a break. Are there any other witnesses you want to call? I've got Mr, uh, just noticed that, and, and everyone might be over it, um, but we've got Mr Harley who's coming tomorrow, who's, is he here and would he want to speak today? Yeah, he's here, but we could fit him in. Um, and then it might be sensible to break. Um, what do you think? Um, uh, we could start Gary. We could start Gary Clark as well, transportation, that's not a particular composition. No? This Mark Georgeson is here as well. Mark Georgeson's here, so you can get him up as with Gary Clark after the break. After the break. And I, um, what I think we'll do, we'll take, we'll take a break for have a cup of tea and we'll come back and I'll just have a quick discussion with the panel, but I, but, um, I think if we were going to deal with anyone, I think Mr Harley or, or, or Mr Clark in terms of transportation okay. would be, because well, the, the, the rest of them sort of fit into a, into a more of a pattern, I think. So we'll, 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 come, we'll come back at... Um, just after four or four o'clock and see where we're at. <coughs>
Thank you. We'll reconvene. Mr. Marson, what we've decided, we think we'll just hear from Mr. Harley because we realised um, with transport that wasn't scheduled tomorrow. Mr. James is not here, and I'm not sure he wants to be here. I'm, I'm not sure if the council transport person is here. Um, but, I, but, uh, but I think it's still better that we should just hear from Mr. Harley today and then we'll finish and we'll deal with the transport person tomorrow. So, All apologies. right, so um, just before we do that, can I just um, get Mr. Nicholson to answer the question from Mr. Mar Commissioner Mark Brown about sunlight? Sure. <clears throat> Hello. Um, thank you, sir. Look, oh, you had me worried and worried where my three hours came from. So I've just quickly checked. It comes from the Auckland Design Manual. Um, it's a guideline for mixed use developments, and they recommend that 70% um, of living rooms and, um, and uh, windows you know, get, get um, more than three hours minimum sunlight at, at midwinter. They say two hours may be acceptable in some circumstances. But anyway, I didn't make it up entirely. <laughs> So welcome, Mr. Harley. Um, thank you. We, um, we actually got your statement last night, and we've all read it. Um, so I'm happy for you to summarise it or, or to point out the highlights or however you want to present it to us. <clears throat> I'm under the impression that you are not strongly in favour of uh, preserving my works at the woolshed. So I won't. We have no position on anything at this stage. We're hearing, we're hearing, we're hearing evidence. I think we did make on the heritage issue, which you can cover off. We did, we did put the proposition to, to Mr. Mr. Um, Marson whether there was jurisdiction sure. to do what the council is suggesting we do, um, and clearly we've got evidence tomorrow from Mr. Miller about the value of the wall sh of the, the the shed, and the council's expert has has her view. I wasn't going to address that at all, and in terms of the written submission um, that I've made, I was really going to concentrate on on two points. Um, the first is the issue of the level of assumed intensification in Nelson Tasman's um, planning documents. I have been unable to source where the asserted 60 and now increased to 65% mm -hmm. level comes from. I've sought an explanation from Ms Barton of Nelson City and have not had a re response to it. I believe that the number is probably backworked in order to get to an acceptable level of new buildings over the 30 year period. But it doesn't really matter whether it's 60% or 65%, what does matter is that for years there has been a sustained lack of residential section supply within Nelson, and particularly within Nelson City, and there is now a substantial accumulated deficit. If the projected population growth numbers are about right or nearly right, that deficit just continues to compound. If the 60% level isn't achieved over that period, mm -hmm. the problem gets worse. Mm -hmm. My proposition is simply that Nelson City has failed to facilitate the release of residential sections into a deep market. And the consequences of that are uh, We've disenfranchised people from being able to buy houses within Nelson City, mm -hmm. let alone at affordable prices. We've priced young people out of the market, and I think that has a serious economic and social cost to all of us. So the first part of what I've tried to argue is that Nelson City needs to take a much more active approach to bringing uh, residential land or land that's suitable for residential development to fruition mm. to increase the depth of the market. The second part of what I wanted to address really is a reflection of the exchange that we've just heard between um, I think it's Mr Ridley and Mr Parkinson. Parsonson. Parsonson. 
Um, I, I have come at this in a slightly different way um, in the material I prepared from paragraphs 19 to 26 of um, the material I, 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 I've prepared. <coughs> I regard the uh, approach of Mr Ridley as um, really a cart before the horse in terms of at least my own approach to decision making uh, for Bayview. I'm one of three directors. Uh, I live in Wellington and most of the <coughs> involvement I have uh, is directly with Richie Pollock, mostly by telephone, but I see him frequently and I'm a frequent visitor to the site. Um, in terms of the plan change area that we continue to own, when we get there, assuming the plan change is approved, we would select an area, a subset of the area, that makes commercial sense to us, and we would start what I would describe as a preliminary appraisal of its characteristics. But it needs to be understood that we have already made, or had made for us, decisions about large areas of the land that we own that we accept are not capable of practical mm -hmm. uh, development. So we've excluded it for geotechnical uh, views, um, engineering, access, all kinds of reasons all informed to us by our experts. And uh, n none of us uh, as directors have any expertise in geotechnical or civil engineering or anything of those standards. We just take the best advice that we can and we spend a prodigious amount of money uh, on these experts and we think we've got a pretty fine team uh, advising us and we take the advice. When it comes to the issues uh, that I look at as the director of, of, uh, of our company, in, in order of priority, my first um, and greatest fear is uh, health and safety concerns. We know from the work we're carrying out now that we've got a large and inherently dangerous site. We've got huge machines and dozens of them running all over the place and it takes a very, very sophisticated site management project to make sure that everybody who comes onto that site leaves it in a fit and healthy condition. It's not that we've been lucky, but we have had no major health and safety incidents in the three years we've been going, and we intend to maintain a pristine record in that regard. In my book, Fear Number Two, is the management of uh, stormwater, sediment and runoff. It's an embarrassment to receive an infringement notice. Water comes out of the sky, it's clean. It lands on the ground, it ought to run over the ground or through the ground and it ought to be clean. It ought to go into rivers, clean, and out the other end, clean. It's a basic standard in terms of how I think about what our obligations are in terms of conducting business. And the third thing I'm concerned about is whether we might run out of money. <laughs> and I'm worried about that when I see the prodigious costs that are being incurred. But that leads me to some of the exchange with Mr Ridley. We've already excluded a large area of land from consideration and when we've chosen the sub-area that I've referred to, we would start a preliminary appraisal of it, and our friend uh, Mr Foley and his team would be expected to carry out a, an intensive geotechnical investigation of the area, which would involve drilling or test pits or both. And then through the team in uh, Tonkin and Taylor, but there are a large number of other specialists who work in a cross-discipline way, 
they would appraise that area for its suitability for potential development. And if it gets past that gate, then we would commence civil design. It's a lengthy, intensive and expensive process and part of it is to deal with um, management of stormwater, sediment and all of the myriad of issues that have been talked about. In the note that I've prepared, I, I, I've said that I regard the approach that's being advocated by Mr Ridley as really requiring us to make guesses or alternatively to commence an intensive investigation work set right across the entire site now when we won't be ready to consider whether we can develop this land for years. We've got more than enough on our plate at the other end of town and it'll take us quite a while to chew through um, our current work program. My guess is that we would be in a position to start doing the initial appraisal somewhere around 2027, 2028, assuming that we have um, a robust uh, residential section market continuing in Nelson, and I don't know whether we will or we won't, and I don't lose sleep about it because it's so far away okay. and we've got more than enough to keep us busy uh, and worried about in the, in the meantime. What's important about the exchange is we don't question at all the need when we prepare uh, our, resident, our, our resource consent applications that they are of the highest class. We do not wish to have them the subject of intensive uh, interrogation from Nelson City and its own advisors. We expect to have produced excellent work ourselves that will meet a robust uh, focus, uh, inquiry and rigorous testing. It's not how it works, but that's what we seek to achieve. If we could get our resource consent applications ticked off by Nelson City because they are excellent within a month, we'd be delighted. And you'll see some pigs fly behind me uh, if that were ever to, to be achieved. We take it really seriously and we spend whatever time and money is necessary to ensure that we are satisfied when we sign the applications that they are top quality. The idea of having to do this twice really fills me with horror and might just shift my order of priorities um, running out of money up to the top um, rather than being the third. I, I hope that that explains from a business perspective what I think is a very important practicality in terms of how the Resource Management Act actually works. I am proud of the existence of the resource management framework. It's never caused me to have any particular difficulty conceptually with its framework and how it's intended to work. The assessment of environmental effects process mandates a self-audit uh, on the person who's making the application where you have the onus of carrying the burden to show that you have thoroughly assessed your um, impacts <coughs> and that's what we endeavour to do. That's all I wanted to say. Thank I you uh, for that. Um, I just, do you have questions for Mr. Question? I've got a couple of, just a couple of questions for you. Um, <coughs> Again, I'm just reflecting on a lot of the submissions from um, other residents who talk about. It's not. I'm, I'm really going to this, your, your question about the, the lack of sections in Nelson and, and then this affordability issue, and we're getting a lot of um, submissions and statements coming through to say we accept that Nelson's short of sections, but we don't need to do it here. Um, and I 
and the questions I'll have for them, because I'm not from here, where would it be? I mean, do they mean Stoke? Do they mean down in Tasman? So what's, what's your view of that? So, so your view is that you will, provide, you will be providing sections close to the city, which is, I think you said. Is that part of the driving force for this proposal? I've chosen to focus particularly on the Nelson City urban area, mm. partly because that's where this land yeah. is, yeah, right. and partly because in Nelson City's own planning documents, it surveys of um, aspiring purchasers, the overwhelming preference is to buy within Nelson City subject to being able to afford to and all of the problems with shortage. Uh, this is the largest area of land by far within uh, that precinct. I suspect it's the largest area of land within the whole of Nelson City. Uh, that might not be right in relation to the Marsden Valley, I'm not sure. Do you know, Andrew? It's not as big as Marsden. Right. But Marsden is, um, to my, my way of thinking, um, a fair distance away. This is, if you keep within the speed limit, about six minutes yeah. driving time to Ralph N. Way and about seven minutes to Bayview Road. Have, I know we're going to hear one of the submitters is, I, I, I don't recall the man's name, but he's from Bailey's Real Estate. Have, have you done any market analysis or market research in terms of the development who are the likely, you know, what is the target market here that have you been looking at? Um, the person you're referring to is Douglas McKee. Douglas, that sounds right. Um, with Bailey's, and the other person who um, has given a, another, a statement about the state of the market, market is um, Tony Healy. Um, okay. I have used um, and had access to the Bailey's um, statistics. Um, they weren't good enough to show me their um, list of buyers, um, but that's probably not surprising. Um, but we do know um, that a number of people on that list uh, would wish to buy um, from us. And when I say us, I include CCKV in that because I know that there are people on that list who have particular ambitions to be in particular areas. Yeah. Some, some of them are friends, I, I know who they are. And the final question I do have for you, and it does go to that heritage building, can you, I mean, again, there's a lot of, con well, there is contention between the two experts. Can you just explain again what, what work, what the state of that building was back in the 1970s and then the work that you've done? And do you think, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to make this cutesy, to be frank. I mean, no, no, no. But, but it will, I mean, there is serious contention between the experts about the age, the stage, what's, what's valuable, when it was done, what actually are the values. And you're someone who is clearly understands that building and you've even done some work on it. Yes, well, um, uh, in 1970, 71, my parents were building a new house um, on the Tahunanui hillside uh, on uh, an area of land of, uh, of about two hectares. Mm -hmm. It had uh, extensive gardens and my mother and father wanted all of the garden beds rebuilt and I was sent on a mission to the Maitai Farm um, wool shed to extract all the sheep manure from underneath the building mm -hmm. and it was impossible to do that by going underneath it. Uh, I had to pull up all the, you know, those slats um, in the floor and the at the time, my memory is there were three different farm managers and they thought, um, this probably overstates what they thought, but I was a bit of a godsend because I gave them an excuse to do what they wanted to do inside that building. So they helped me um, do what I was there for, which was to pull the floor up and demolish some walls and clean a whole lot of junk out um, of the pens and then um, 
to restore the um, the building to the way they they wanted it restored. Um, my mm. father owned um, a building company uh, here, so I had access to a large supply of uh, demolition and other timber <coughs> and all of the stuff. Yeah. So I helped myself to it, and um, the people in the building company helped cut all the timber, and I took trailer loads of it, and we, well, I just helped them do what they wanted to do in it. Um, it was a dump then. I'd be, I'd be too scared to go on it now. I don't think it's a pristine um, piece of New Zealand's history. But if, if you did think that preserving my work was, um, was worthy, well, Thank you for I that. wouldn't say no. Anyhow. Sorry, I'm laughing because I was <laughs> when we got there. You, you, you were laughing? I was too scared to venture in when we got there. The rest of the commissioners were a lot braver than I, I have to say. I think you're a, I think you're a I've very... I've got four children, so I, I stayed outside. I think you're a very wise woman. Any follow-up questions? Thank you very much for your statement. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Mr. Marsden. I think that point will we'll adjourn for the for the evening, um, afternoon and evening, and we'll start again tomorrow at nine o'clock with uh, Mr. Miller and Ms. Young by Zoom. Thank you, thank you everybody.